quantitative description as distinguished from the qualitative differences. Now, modern philosophy, as it emerged in, since the 16th, 17th century, is, as I said before, anti-socialistic in this older sense of the word. Man, the, the individual, not a member of society, not even as a potential member of society, is primary. Society is simply derivative from beings who are not as such social beings. It's a fundamental phenomenon, therefore, is freedom, not obligation. All obligation is derivative from free acts of previously non-obliged individuals. That's the meaning of the strict, the strict meaning of the doctrine of the social contract. Therefore, the fundamental moral phenomenon does not have the character of duties, but of rights. The rights of men, in the strict sense, are a modern notion. We must here make a distinction, as I have made it on former occasion, between various waves of this modern thinking. The first wave is represented most clearly by Hobbes and by Locke. And this Hobbes-Lockean version, of which I have to say only a few words, is the origin of political economy. The second wave embodies political economy, but it does not create it. Now, what is characteristic? The fundamental phenomenon is self-preservation. The preservation of life and limb. To understand this, one must contrast it with the Thomistic doctrine. According to Thomas, there are three kinds of natural inclinations. The first is directed towards self-preservation, the second is directed towards social life, and the third is directed towards cognition. Self-preservation is the lowest, and a cognition the highest. Now what men like Hobbes and Locke did is, as it were, to disregard the two higher, or to deny that they are natural inclination, and concentrate only on the primary self-preservation. The reason for that was what one can call a, quote, realism. They wanted to have a doctrine which was not in any way utopian or visionary, but solid, low but solid, is, I think, a beautiful formulation due to Winston Churchill to this doctrine. Low but solid. Not trust such fanciful things as inclination towards society, and uh, the, a natural desire for cognition, but self-preservation. That we take cover when someone points a gun at us, that's the real stuff. And of the same kind, of course, also food, which is also necessary for self-preservation. And food is almost the same thing already as property, as will appear when Mr. Cropsey will take over. This kind of doctrine is, of course, also characterized by an immense simplification. If you have three fundamentally different natural inclinations, that gives a complicated doctrine. But if there is only one, great simplification. Therefore, it was possible to present the doctrine in quasi-mathematical form, as Hobbes did openly and Locke in a slightly concealed manner. Now, self-preservation, while being the basic phenomenon, is not the complete phenomenon as far as the human will is concerned, because man, as we all know, is not satisfied with self-preservation alone. He also wants to be happy. And we have to consider the relation between self-preservation and happiness in order to begin a possible understanding of Marx. The view which Hobbes and... By the way, you can find a chair, I believe. So you don't have to stand there. <laughs> now, Hobbes and Locke admit, of course, that man desires happiness and that he is not satisfied with self-preservation. But they say, in our language, happiness is entirely subjective. Someone finds his happiness in eating a special kind of cooked apples and another in uh, reading novels, others perhaps even in writing novels and so on. It's infinitely subjective and not, nothing can be built on that. Self-preservation is the same in all men. Therefore, it is objective. Therefore, something can be built on that. Happiness cannot be the end of civil society. 
because of its sub subjectivity. Civil society can only guarantee the conditions of happiness, because, because without life you cannot be happy. In other words, to introduce a formula uh, used in the Declaration of Independence, civil society makes possible the pursuit of happiness, but not happiness. That is the affair of the individuals. From this uh, follows a point which, which Marx was very much concerned, a split between the public life and the private life, between the citizen or subject on the one hand and the private individual. The citizen is concerned with self-preservation. The whole apparatus of the state is nothing but a big apparatus for self-preservation. As you can see even today, if you consider the importance of police officers. But now it is important. While the self-preservation is the basic thing, uh, uh, which has an objective character, yet what we desire, uh, what we desire is happiness, because we, we want self-preservation, but no one is satisfied with mere self-preservation. So the higher is private. The public is a basic, but not very exciting. One, in the language of Locke, for example, one would have to say there is a difference between self-preservation, bare self-preservation, and comfortable self-preservation. The bare self-preservation is guaranteed by the government. Comfortable self-preservation, that is everybody's own business. Now, you see here in German, the distinction between state and society. The state takes care of self-preservation by, guarantee, by guaranteeing the security of each. But the real life of man, the interesting life of man, concerns not bare self-preservation, but the comfortable self-preservation, which can even consist, for example, in, in going to theaters. Yeah? Some people need that for their happiness, but that is not in, uh, for the state. So when state, the formula of Max Weber, is characterized by the monopoly of compulsion, and that has, according to the original notion, the function of guaranteeing self-preservation. Society is a sphere of freedom, where everyone tries to do, and does to some extent, what he wants. The freedom, but naturally, freedom in and through competition. And one of the great objections of Marx against the earlier doctrines is that they did not succeed in bridging the gulf between state and society, and therefore the only solution, in his opinion, is to abolish the state in the end. But it stems from this basic principle we see already in the first wave. Now we could turn to the second wave, which is much closer to Marx, and about which I have to speak at much greater length. Now, I would like first to say a very general word about Rousseau. I think it is time that this be said again. When we look at these great antagonists around 1789, <coughs> after Rousseau's death, but still he was still very much alive because there was a French Revolution going on, and then Burke and Rousseau. I, for one, cannot help feeling that Burke is a much better helper for practical politics than Rousseau is. But on the other hand, one must also say, and especially today, where we all are so very conservative, that however impossible Rousseau's doctrine may be, he was a much broader thinker than, than Burke. Rousseau began to think at a place where Burke stopped thinking. It will be that it's not meant to say that Rousseau's doctrine is true, but it is a, a very profound and uh, um, seminal doctrine. Now, Rousseau began his career with a prize essay on the sciences and arts, uh, his so-called first discourse, in which he attacked the sciences and also the arts in the name of virtue. Within the political meaning of this uh, writing is this. It is an attack on modern political science, on the political science of Hobbes and Locke, in the name of the ancients. One Carissi formula is this, the ancients talk 
in the political writings all the time of virtue. The moderns talk all the time of trade and money. You see how strong the economic element was at the very beginning in modern political thought. And Rousseau takes in this respect the side of the ancients. Furthermore, in the first wave of modern political philosophy, enlightenment played an absolutely decisive role. One can state this precisely as follows. Self-preservation is the principle. And self-preservation means also, practically speaking, fear of death. What Hobbes says, or presupposes, is that fear of death is the greatest power in human life. And that is by no means necessarily so, as no one knew better than Hobbes, because many people fear punishments after death more than death. So Hobbes' doctrine presupposes, in order to become operative, that the fear of punishment after death ceases to be important. And this will cease to be important only by means of enlightenment, by the fact that people learn either that there is no punishment after death in any serious sense. So the enlightenment is absolutely essential for the first wave of modernity. And Rousseau begins his career with an attack on that enlightenment. We must keep this in mind. We must see what this means. There is a connection between Rousseau's attack on the enlightenment and his appeal to virtue. Because this teaching of men like Hobbes and Locke degrades virtue to a means for self-preservation. It makes virtue instrumental or utilitarian. Why? What is goodness? Goodness is a habit by virtue of which you have a greater chance to survive. That is not what these men understand by virtue, and Rousseau reacted correspondingly. So, in this respect, Rousseau is simply a protest of... Uh, well, Rousseau begins with a protest of moral common sense against this uh, 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 subversive doctrine. Yet, Rousseau does not simply reject Hobbes or simply return to Aristotle. He never does that. He transforms Hobbes on the Hobbesian basis. And that is important to understand, and I will proceed step by step. I have to read to you a passage from Hobbes to show you. <laughs> Hobbes had taught regarding virtue. Virtue is identical with peaceableness. Self-preservation is possible only in peace. As you know, either from your own experience or from many historical books, including TV. So that habit which enables men to live in peace is peaceableness, which consists of various parts. Now, one part is especially interesting in our present connection. Hobbes revises in chapter 15. The question, who is a better man, has no place in the condition of mere nature, where, as has been shown before, all men are equal. The inequality that now is has been introduced by the laws civil. All inequality, in other words, is legal or conventional. I know that Aristotle, in the first book of his politics, for a foundation of his doctrine, makes men by nature some more worthy to command, meaning the wiser sort, such as he thought himself to be for his philosophy, others to serve, meaning souls that had strong bodies, but were not philosophers as he as if master and servant were not introduced by consent of men, but by difference of wit, which is not only against reason, but also against experience. For there are very few so foolish that had not rather govern themselves than be governed by others. Nor will the wise in their own conceit contend by force with them who to distrust their own wisdom do they always or often or almost at any time get the victory? If nature therefore have made men equal, that equality is to be acknowledged. 
Or if nature have made men unequal, Hobbes reminds himself for one moment of his own wit, you see, and yet because men think themselves equal, will not enter into conditions of peace, but upon equal terms, such equality must be admitted. In other words, Hobbes does not really say all men are equal. We don't know whether they are equal or not, but we have to act on the principles that are equal. And therefore, for the ninth law of nature, law of nature means here a moral law, I put this, that every man acknowledge another for his equal by nature. The breach of this precept is pride. No, pride, by regarding oneself as superior. With a view to natural equality, men ought to treat everyone else as his equal by nature. Yet, as Hobbes admits, civil society is a state of inequality. You at least have the inequality of the governors and the governed, or also the rich and the poor. Furthermore, the right of self-preservation, which, from which Hobbes starts, implies the right of everyone to be the judge of the means of self-preservation that follows uh, under certain conditions. Yeah? You have the right to self-preservation. You have the right to the means of self-preservation. Otherwise, the right would be no better. But then, who is going to judge of what are and are not good means? Either the wisest men, well, that is bad for you or for us, because the wisest men may not think that we are so much worth preserving as we do. Therefore, everyone must be the judge as to what are means for self-preservation. And now, that is according to Hobbes, the natural law. And now look at society. At Hobbes' society, who judges of the right means of self-preservation in Hobbes' society? The story is that may very well be a king, a born man. And how does the king judge of the means to my self-preservation? By making laws. Because laws are public judgments on means of self-preservation. As you can easily see, when you look at certain individuals who steal yeah, or rob, they try to get means for their comfortable or maybe simple self-preservation, and the law judges differently, and the law decides the matter. So in civil society, this fundamental natural right of equal judgment regarding the means of self-preservation is rejected. Civil society is essentially a state of inequality in Hobbes' teaching. But on the other hand, morality implies or, it, or consists in recognition of the natural right of man, which includes the right to be the judge of the means, civil society is immoral because the basic moral phenomenon is the right to self-preservation, which includes, according to Hobbes, the right to be the judge of the means. Civil society takes his way. But, as Rousseau says from the very beginning, morality is the one thing needful. It's the only consideration which ultimately counts. Peace, mere peace, is a lesser good than justice. And justice consists in the recognition of the rights of each, including naturally myself, to be the judge. Therefore, justice, consisting in the recognition of the right of each to be the judge, consists in recognition of freedom, because all freedom is concentrated in that right effectively to judge of the means to self-preservation. This is then the starting point of Rousseau's criticism of Locke, which became crucial, as we will see. Now, we have to turn now uh, to the precise procedure of Rousseau, how he tries to refute the Hobbian doctrine on the Hobbian basis. The Hobbian basis to be the self-preservation and the right of everyone to be the judge as to the means of self-preservation. Now, Hobbes had taught that to understand the thing, means to understand its genesis. 
and hopes accordingly, understands the commonwealth or the state by understanding its genesis. There he acts consistently. But Hobbes doesn't apply this demand, this general methodological demand, as we can say, to the more fundamental phenomenon, to man himself. Hobbes takes man for granted. He takes for granted that man has an essence, that he is a rational element. And yet Hobbes has no longer a right to do so because his doctrine doesn't allow for essences in any sense. More specifically, reason, allegedly the characteristic of man, is not possible without language. And language is, as we all know, a social phenomenon. So man's rationality presupposes his sociality. And yet Hobbes taught all the time that man is by nature a pre-social man, a manifest contradiction. Because if man is pre-rational, it follows from Hobbes' premises that man is pre-rational by nature. It becomes necessary for Hobbes to understand the genesis of man's essence the genesis of reason, and he never did that. And that is what Rousseau does. For Rousseau, the study of man becomes the study of the history of man, of man's, the study of man's, of quote, man, unquote, becoming man. This process of man's becoming man is a theme of Rousseau's second discourse, the discourse on the origin of inequality. And I'll say only one word about that. This process of man becoming from a kind of orangutan, a man, is presented not as a teleological process, as the orangutan was meant to develop into man, but as a strictly mechanical process. This, uh, is slightly, this being slightly different from, uh, different from orangutans, we are compelled by external accidental causation, by floods or by uh, ice or uh, by <coughs> spring heat, I don't know, to come down from trees, as I say today, and then to the command. It's no, not a theological process. That is of the utmost importance for Marx. Now, this history of man, which takes, in a way, the place of the philosophic study of man, shows also and particularly that inequality, inequality is not natural, as Aristotle had taught and as Hobbes had almost admitted, but that inequality has come into being by virtue of certain accidents. The early original man, this almost orangutan, were equal. Now, but if inequality has come into being by certain accidents, a practical conclusion is obvious. It can be abolished again. Inequality, in other words, is only a historical fact, not a natural fact. Differently stated. Man does not have a stable nature to speak of. There are such things as, which are stable, for example, that we have five senses and have a digestive system and so but that's terribly uninteresting politically, you know. But in all politically interesting respects, man doesn't have a nature. Man is infinitely malleable. Or rather, as Rousseau himself put it, he is infinitely perfectible because he does not have an essence to speak of. You see how terribly, uh, impractically important this seemingly theoretical question regarding <coughs> essences, for instance, are. Oh. As um, Rousseau says, all philosophers prior to him have painted civilized man. Man as he has been hitherto Man, as we know him from history, 
but they claimed to paint naturally. All previous study of men was uh, not scientific, as it would be called today. Man's experience of man is no guide to the nature of man, because what we experience are always men molded by customs, molded by traditions, molded by accidents. And therefore, no inference is possible as to what men can do from, uh, of, uh, as to the possibilities of man, from what man actually has. No arguments against political improvement based on experience is valid, because experience only says it was possible hitherto. No inference from present day men or from history as to what man can be, despite the fact that all societies or all civilized societies have hitherto been unequal. A strictly egalitarian society is possible. We get then this fundamental scheme. There was equality at the beginning, when men had not yet developed the truly human factors. And then the whole historical process, to use a Marxian expression, is inequality, always, everywhere. But at the end, again, Equality. I mention another point in which Rousseau differs from Hobbes and Locke and prepares the Marxian view of the problem. Hobbes and Locke had conceived of the state of nature as inconvenient, to use the understatement of Locke, inconvenient for man in the state of nature which meant that the men living in the state of nature were dissatisfied with their situation. If this is so, the state of nature points to civil society as such. Men, and therefore men in the state of nature, project civil society in their minds before they establish it. But that is an absurd suggestion, because these fellows didn't have any reason. How could they make a, any project, uh, to say nothing of a project of a sensible civil society? In other words, Hobbes and Locke are guilty of a crypto theology. Man in the, uh, a Rousseau economy teaches that men in the state of nature are satisfied with the state of nature. Perfectly satisfied. Or to use his simple statement, the state of nature is good. That does not mean necessarily mean more than men living in it cannot but be satisfied with it. But that's not the only reason. It is also objectively good because of the state of equality. Now, no Rousseau, in other words, takes a great step in that famous liberation from teleology, which is characteristic of modern times. A teleological view presupposes a number of stages leading from the germ to the completed thing. And the stages are all imperfect <coughs> compared to the perfect stage. Now, in, in Rousseau we find a, a very important exponent of the view of the equality of the stages, as we may roughly it. One simple and important example, childhood. Childhood, that childhood is a stage as high as adulthood, which is denied by all the earlier thinkers, of course, and perhaps also denied by common sense. But it follows from the, from the consistent rejection of theology. Each state, each stage, is as meaningful and self-contained as any other. We must keep this in mind so for the understanding of the Marxist doctrine. Another point which I have to mention here, the just or rational society, as Rousseau understands it, effectively recognizes natural equality, or rather the equal right of each to be the judge of the means of his self-preservation. Therefore, Rousseau can say that in that 
just or rational society, everyone remains as free and equal as he is by nature. In the decisive respect and the making of laws, of public judgments as to the means of self-preservation, he is equal to everyone else. Now let us look at the mechanism of that. The judgment on the means of self-preservation is the laws. The Rousseau demands that everyone subject to a law must have a say in the making of the law. Everyone must be a member of the legislative body. That is to say of the sovereign. For Rousseau, the legislative body and sovereign are identical and to be distinguished from the government, which uh, we may say is the executive and the judicial part. In civil society, everyone must be subject to the general will. The general will is not opposed simply to the private will, particularly. The general will is my own will modified. My own will survives necessarily in the general will. Otherwise, the general will could not bind me. If I am subject to the private will of another man, then I'm a slave. But if I am subject, but I, if I am subject to the general will, which is the generalization of my private will, I am subject only to myself. I'm a free man. But the free society is essentially an egalitarian society. But more than that, this solution that everyone be subject only to the general will, which is a modification of his own will, and not to the subject of any other man, this requires that everyone and everything be subject to the private will. It requires, in Rousseau's formula, the total alienation of each associate with all his rights to the whole community, unquote. Here you have the word alienation, which plays such a great role, but in Rousseau the accent is different. The whole, uh, the total alienation of every individual is necessary if there is to be decency, if there is to be a just and rational society. Or as Rousseau also put it, if you want to have freedom and equality, Every individual must become totally denaturalized, totally collectivized. These things will come up with characteristic modifications in Marx. Rousseau's argument, by the way, is not so difficult to understand. He says, if there are any limitations to the power of the community, then these excluded areas can become the locus for private power, for private government, as it was then called by certain liberals in our age. Yeah? And if you want to prevent the non-legal or um, uh, the translegal dependence of individuals on other individuals, this area must be susceptible of being brought under social control. That's all Rousseau means. But the principle is, of course, that there is no sphere which can be excluded from social control. The total collectivization of each is a condition for the freedom of each. The formula is identical for Marx and, and uh, Rousseau. The concrete meaning differs. Total collectivization, we repeat, is the indispensable condition of the freedom of each in society. You had the freedom of each in originally in isolation, you know, in the state of nature. But that is not interesting. The interesting point is freedom in society. Now, Rousseau goes on to say that this alienation of the natural self, that he transforms himself completely into a citizen, into a member of the soul, 
and ceases in a sense to be a natural being. This alienation is the acquisition of morality. This man is the state of nature who was concerned with his self-preservation and uh, made his own judgments and so, that was not a moral being. Man becomes a moral being only by becoming a citizen. And that is to say by divesting himself or radically of his natural freedom. The rational society demands self-alienation. I come back to this part of his argument. From this it follows that all society, however just, is bondage. That Rousseau says with all clarity at the beginning of the social contract. Man is born free, but everywhere he, we find him in chains. How did this happen? I do not know. What can make this change legitimate? I believe I can answer this question. He, 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 oh, that's the meaning of the book. He will answer the question of how the transition from freedom to bondage can be legitimate. He's concerned with the distinction between legitimate and illegitimate bondage, but bondage it is in both cases. Therefore, society as society cannot give the true solution of the human problem. The true solution of the human problem cannot be a social solution. Rousseau found it in a form of living which he described as a solitary dreamer who lives at the fringes of society but is not really a, a truly a member of society. A man communing with nature. We can say a man of religiosity as distinguished from an adherent of any positive religion. You can also say the artist, because this little thing in Rousseau has grown in the meantime to tremendous proportion. The decisive moral formulation is this, that what covers civil society is morality. And this morality is called by Rousseau by such words as virtue or duty. Rational moral, but there is something else, and that is what Rousseau calls goodness, and uh, which means a kind of instinctive goodness, compassion. This is at home, beyond society, among these indiv radical individualists who live at its fringes and, and fundamentally precarious. Existence, as well from Rousseau's point of view, they are the salt of the earth. Why is this necessary? If society is bondage, then it is fundamentally not a happy state. But society is a home of morality. Virgin duty at its home in society. <coughs> morality is then divorced from happiness. If you want to have happiness, you have to leave society, and that's to say you have to cease to be a responsible citizen. Happiness belongs to the state of nature, morality belongs to civil society. That is a simple formula for that. Now, this, this antinomy between the individual and society, not every individual, but some individuals, like Rousseau, is absolutely crucial for the understanding of what happened afterward, and especially what happened in Marx. And I will show it by reflecting for one moment on one special reason why this antinomy is necessary. And that has to do with the problem of property. Rousseau makes it clear, even in the social contract, more emphatically in the discourse on the origin of an inequality, that civil society is necessarily more advantageous to the haves than to the have-nots, because the protection of the means of self-preservation is, of course, how shall I say, richer, more fruitful in the case of the rich than in the case of the poor. 
I mean, the famous stories of Anatole France about the law which forbids the rich and poor equally to sleep under bridges and to beg in the streets. You know, that is obviously the idea. And Rousseau has this clearly in mind. The have-nots lose the natural right of appropriating land which they need for self-preservation. They can no longer take this land away from those who have enough land and to spare as a crime, it says, you know. Yeah? The social contract is therefore, as Rousseau puts it in that extreme statement which he never attracted, in the discourse on, on the origin of inequality, the social contract is a fraud perpetrated by the rich against the poor. There is only one step here to the formula of Babeuf in the French Revolution. Babeuf. Property is theft, legalized theft, but nevertheless theft. Now, you see here, well, here one can get the simplest formulation of what Marx is doing. What happened after Rousseau, what, especially in German idealistic philosophy, to which I will turn soon, was to say, to throw this away. There is a perfect social solution, a perfect political solution to the human problem, and that is a rational state the state of Kant, of Hegel, whatever it may be. Then there are other people who were certain that no state could solve the human problem. And they were such people like Toro, individualists, anarchists, whatever you call them, yeah? whatever they may be called. This, in other words, they minimize uh, this element, the globe. Rousseau originates both the anarchism and the statism because, in this sense, he was much more comprehensive than any of the followers. Now, Marx, of course, you see, follows the German idealists as a social solution, but with one great difference. Society, not the state. Not the state. That is a point where, and why society, and not this, why does society, a communist society, give a supply solution to the human problem? because of the necessary implications of property. It's much more refined in Marx, but that is still the German element. But Rousseau's position is, of course, different from the Marxist position, because Rousseau doesn't tire of teaching that society as such, with or without state, is essentially imperfect. And there is the necessity of something transcending society, or at the fringes of society, you might call it, which really gives society its true value. This is what I would like to say about Rousseau, and then I would like to turn to German idealism, as far as it is absolutely indispensable to discuss it in this connection. But there may be an opportunity to see whether there are some things which I need of clarification at the present moment. But I ask you to keep in mind this absolutely crucial point, the Rousseauan doctrine of the necessity of the total alienation of each individual to society for the sake of the freedom and the equality of each. And that is absolutely preserved in Marx in a, in a new element, as I should say. And also, of course, the other point, the fact that in Rousseau, this is regarded as bondage if an inevitable bondage. More, you can put it this way. From Rousseau's point of view, it is a morally inevitable bondage. But he questions the ultimacy of morality, of what he calls virtue and duty. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Fogner? Why does he write a political piece and not a, not a uh, poem in favor of creativity? Both, uh, because uh, Rousseau uh, saw that there is one root, one root, out of which there grow two things with equal necessity, and both are in a necessary tension to one another. 
And also makes another reflection going beyond Hobbes and Locke, which shows this rule more, more clearly. I mean, it says, self-preservation presupposes that life is attractive. Yeah? Life is pleasant, or however you call it. There must therefore be an experience of that fundamental pleasantness of life, or as also was, of the sweetness of living as living. Yeah. What as someone in Homer mentioned when he spoke of seeing the sun, yeah? the light of the sun. Is that true so called the sentiment of existence? The sentiment of existence is the basic human experience and it is fundamentally radically pleasant. And that is at the bottom of the desire for self preservation. Now, you desire then to preserve yourself and then you have to do something about it. You have to work, you have to work and quite sure other things. Yeah? But then something terrible happens. And being engaged in the acts conducive to self-preservation, you do no longer sense the sweetness of mere being. This is therefore the preserve of those who do not work, fight, govern, etc. These are these idlers like Rousseau. Yeah, that is the scheme. So it follows from Boston. And one can understand the later development of European thought where, uh, up to so called existentialism today. Uh, by starting, as you see how rich Rousseau's whole project is, the great change came in the moment in which the sentiment of existence was found to be, or the belief to be, not a pleasant and sweet, but terrible. Yeah, this is, uh, the, uh, and the, I think the most, the clearest expression of this change is still Nietzsche. And uh, that is, of course, very important now in, uh, in extensions. But that I mentioned only in passing. So for Rousseau, that for both was very nice to say. And the paradoxical fact is, that the best guide for those who govern and who are governed are not governors, but the idlers at the outside. I mean, is this a notion plays in practice a very great role, you know? There are sometimes people who are regarded or regard themselves as a the conscience of society, you know? As a conscience, and they are, by this very reason, somehow marginal. Yeah? Something of this kind was... So the teacher of legislators, as it's distinguished from the legislator, is not a political man. Yeah, that is... Uh, it is much more the sensitive poet than the man of the market. Something of this Rousseau had in mind. There is a connection between that and classical thought. Only for Rousseau, this man is no longer the philosopher. That is at least obscured. And therefore, it is convenient to say rather the artist than the philosopher. Well, then I will go on as far as I can come today. Will you remind me of the time for us? Yeah. Now, we have to make now a transition to Hegel, because Hegel is the immediate starting point of Marx. But it is impossible to do so without speaking of Kant, because Kant affected a radical change in philosophy as a whole on which Hegel builds. And we can understand Kant for our purposes best by considering a fundamental difficulty in Rousseau. And this is the contradiction between his moralism, his discovery or rediscovery that the one thing needful is morality, and that morality cannot be understood as mercenary as Hobbes and Locke had understood it. Mercenary and utilitarian are the same. This is contradicted by Rousseau's opposition between virtue and duty on the one hand and goodness on the other. What I mean is this, this contradiction I spoke here. Here's a world of bondage and morality. And here's a world of true freedom which is not strictly speaking a world of morality an anarchistic but noble world. That is the point. 
Now the thing is that there is only a, the clearest solution would seem to be, as I indicated before, to forget about it. And that is what Kant tried to do. One must abandon Rousseau's reservation against society. Why? Precisely because that reservation has no moral basis. Society and morality are coextensive. What is the reason for Rousseau's error? Answer, the obscurity of the status of morality in Rousseau's doctrine. It is not in no way clear in Rousseau whether morality is ultimately in the service of self-preservation or whether it is not connected with the spirituality of man's soul. The latter view is presented most forcefully in the profession of faith of the Savoyard Vicar in the Emir. I mean, one, that is a very difficult question where Rousseau really stood. This contradiction, uh, to st state it simply, between a materialist account for morality and a spiritualist account for morality is the most obvious difficulty in Rousseau. That is the starting point of Kant. Kant tries to get out of this difficulty of an either materialistic or spiritualistic base of morality. Yet, in spite of this profound difference between Kant and Rousseau, Kant agrees with Rousseau regarding the content of morality. Morality is chiefly and primarily the recognition of the rights of men, of men's equality. Men are equal because they are equal in the decisive respect, in respect to the possibility of morality. Every man is as capable as everyone else to be happy. Which is not guided by morality, yet morally relevant, is a necessary process. It is not, it is a necessary process, it does not depend on the human will decisively. Now, I try now to explain the Kantian position as simply as I can. From Kant's point of view, Rousseau is confused regarding the principles or the status of morality. And this is due to the fact, to, to a, an error which Rousseau shares with all preceding philosophers. Namely, that morality can have a basis in theoretical philosophy. Call it metaphysics, call it physics, it doesn't make any difference. That morality can have a basis in knowledge of nature, in particular, in knowledge of the nature of man. As long as you assume that morality must have a theoretical basis, a basis in the knowledge of nature, you are confronted with an alternative of a materialist or a spiritualist basis of morality. Both positions, materialism as well as spiritualism, are wrong, Kant asserts, as theoretical assertions. Both are dogmatic, and Rousseau succeeded as little as any other previous philosopher from liberating himself from that dogmatism. Kant has stated his position clearly by two references to earlier things. He has said of David Hume, that Hume awakened him from the dogmatic slumber. Hume's skepticism awakened him from that dogmatic slumber. But of Rousseau, Kant said, Rousseau has brought me into the right shape. In other words, the influence of Rousseau is deeper and more comprehensive than the influence of Hume. To Rousseau, he owes the positive direction. To Hume, he owes the negation. Another statement of Kant regarding Rousseau is this. Rousseau proceeds synthetically, he Kant says. Namely, he proceeds by starting from natural man to civilized man. 
And therefore, the Rousseau investigation has the character of a scientific, physical investigation. It implies the absolutization of scientific knowledge, which is perfectly true because Rousseau's account of the genesis of civilization in the second, in the discourse on the origin of inequality has methodically the character of any cosmogony of uh, either of Kant Laplace or of Descartes uh, or other formulations. The alternative would be equally dogmatic, namely what Rousseau did in his profession of faith, a spiritualistic metaphysics, which uh, a spiritualist metaphysics that is equally impossible as Hume had shown. Now, Hume questioned the rational character of the principle of causality. This alone implies the rejection of speculative metaphysics. But it also endangers science, which stands and falls with the principle of rationality as a rational, of causality as a rational principle. Hume has shown to Kant's satisfaction that the principle of causality is not rational, not demonstrable like a mathematical theory nor, on the other hand, a legitimate generalization from experience. Experience could never supply the universality of the principle of causality because experience can only say, hitherto, this and this was the case, but not always. To justify the principle of causality, there is needed a radical revision of the traditional concept of reason and understanding. This revision will entail the supremacy of practical reason or of morality. In other words, whereas according to the traditional notion of reason, theoretical reason is higher than practical reason, the new concept of reason, which Kant will develop in fighting back against Hume, will necessarily imply the primacy of practical reason. I will explain that. The radical revision of the concept of reason or understanding consists, in the dis according to Kant, in the discovery of the spontaneity of understanding. The understanding is not as it was for Plato and Aristotle and for the tradition, generally speaking, a receptive faculty, the perception with the mind's eye of, quote, essences, unquote. But the understanding is productive, not receptive. In one formula of Kant, the understanding does not receive passively the, the laws of nature the Newtonian law say. But the understanding prescribes nature its laws. The fundamental principles of physics are projects of the human mind. They are not the essential characters of nature in itself. Reason and understanding is productive. That is, that means the essence of man is productivity. You see how crucial that was for Marx. I mean, man is not only a being which produces things in order to lift from them. That would be purely external, and that was never denied. But the essence of man, the, the, the core of man, is productivity. The essence of man is productivity and not contemplation. That is the fundamental change. Yet, the understanding, as understanding, is productive only on the basis of sense perception and in connection with it. You cannot have a physics merely on the basis of this fundamental project of a nature. You need also experiments in order to give, uh, to acquire specific laws and so on. I need to fall back on sense perception. Now, this, what we get 
by virtue of the cooperation of the human understanding, I do not go into certain nicely, but it is present. That which we get, we get by virtue of the cooperation of the human understanding and sense perception is the phenomenal world. The world as it necessarily appears to us as human beings, not the world as it is in itself. And Kant uses some more over uh, expressions here, but I have to introduce them for a moment. It's a phenomenal world, the world of which we know, regardless of uh, whether it's in science or present scientific knowledge. It's a phenomenal world. And the true world, he calls the no human world. The world as it would be for a pure news, for a pure mind, if we could imagine that. I mean, we, we know it is a possibility, but we cannot say anything beyond that, that it is a possibility. So the understanding as understanding is productive only on the basis of sense perception. It is productive only in connection with a receptivity. Receptivity being the opposite, productivity. Therefore, the understanding points to a higher faculty, if I may use this somewhat inappropriate expression, which is called by Kant reason. Reason. Reason, in contradistinction with understanding, is free and not merely spontaneous, spontaneous being lower than freedom, but only as practical reason, not as theoretical reason. As theoretical reason is always in need of sense perception. Practical reason and only practical reason is self-sufficient. Practical reason alone can constitute a kind of word the word of morality. So, uh, practical reason, and in practical reason alone, we transcend the merely phenomenon. Now, uh, I will try to show you now in a few words why this is so terribly important for things with which every one of us is concerned, whether he cares for philosophy or not. Why is practical reason necessarily free from sense perception, from sensuality, from anything given? And hence, why is practical reason necessarily purely rational? Morality must be independent of any preceding end or purpose. Whereas all earlier moral philosophers had started from the ends. The Kant denies that the ends or purposes can be the beginning of morality. Because according to Kant, ends or purposes can be known only empirically, or at least not without the help of experience. The end of morality, happiness, was supposed to be the natural end the end toward which man is by nature inclined. One assumes there is, according to Kant, that the natural ends are good. And surely that was the tacit premise of all classical philosophy, that the natural ends are good. How else could you say, by following the natural inclinations as distinguished from their perversions, you act well, if you do not assume that the natural inclinations are good. This in its turn presupposes, of course, that nature is good. But is this not a dogmatic assumption? Must it not be established first that nature is good before we are invited to follow our natural inclination? If the ground of morality is a natural end, the moral law is given to man or imposed on man by God or by nature as indeed everyone who had spoken of a moral law had said. But Kant says, before we bow to a law which God or nature imposes, we must know first 
says God, all nature is good. We cannot assume that. Hence, the moral law cannot be conceived of as in any way imposed by either nature or God. The moral law must be understood as self-imposed, as self-given. Morality requires the emancipation of the will from the tutelage of God or nature. The freedom of man must be understood in an infinitely more radical way than it was ever understood before. And this teaching of Kant, describable influence uh, later on, on many people never heard the name of Kant. A law, Kant says, which precedes the will, the human will, is accepted on the basis of the expectation of rewards or punishments. It is therefore ex uh, accepted in a mercenary intention. At least it is accepted on the basis of a pre-existing need. Hence these pre-Kantian thinkers started from the desire for happiness. But happiness is something radically different from duty. The moral law cannot originate in man's needs or be relative to such needs. It must originate in man's freedom, in man's sovereignty. The moral law cannot be based on anything preceding it. The understanding of the phenomenal world, of the world we know, either scientifically or uh, pre-scientifically, does not give us any help towards the understanding of morality. But how can there be a moral law? Where do we get the content? Strictly speaking, there is no content. The moral law, the, or ethics as Kant calls it, is necessarily formal ethics. The content is engendered entirely by the form. And the formula of, of uh, Kant uh, for that is the famous categoric imperative. Act in such a way that the maxim of your actions can become a universal law. I will speak of this um, a little bit later. Now, I will first say, how can a formal law supply the content? Here Kant simply follows Rousseau, or, or modifies Kant's notion of morality is modeled on Rousseau's notion of silly law of right. According to the Rousseau, right or law, which is legitimate, comes into being through the generalization of particular wills, and thus makes, pos makes it possible that through subjection to the law, man acquires his freedom. Now, what does he mean by that? You enter the legislative assembly with a firm decision not to pay any taxes. That's your particular will. But you can't say, get, get up and say, I don't, wa don't, I don't want to pay any taxes. You have to say, there ought to be a law that no one has to pay any taxes. Then you come to your senses and see who will take care of the roads and bridges if everyone would think as I do. And then you say, there ought to be taxes. In other words, by thinking of your selfish wish in the terms of a law, in terms of a universalized wish, the wish of everyone, you change your wish. You transform yourself from a natural, selfish being into a citizen. Kant radicalizes this thought, but it is exactly this thought. Morality consists in the universalization of maxims. In other words, Kant is not concerned so much with an individual thing, a proposition, I don't want to pay any taxes but with the mass, with a moral principle on which you act habitually. For example, some people act on, I have the maxim, 
uh, that uh, anything which is inconvenient should be avoided. Yeah? I mean, that is not something which they do at this moment, but they cut us their whole life. And there are other maxims of that kind. Or the one should cut any corner. It's also such a maxim which can determine our life. Now, what Kant says is this. I have to look at the maxim implied in any proposition I make to myself and then see whether it is that I can still agree to that proposition if I make it a universal law for everyone. Yeah. Hey, you know, I don't wish to give money to a poor family. Yeah. My wish. And I make it a maxim for my life. I deliver it. And then I say, from now, I, I consider now whether it is possible to uh, imagine a world in which everyone is a crook if he helps a poor man. Well, assuming, of course, that there are poor men around. Otherwise, it would make sense. And then I see, that is at least what Kant says, that, that, that I didn't wish, that I didn't mean. And the, uh, it's only the universalized maxim is the only test of morality. Only by this universalization of maxims does it become possible that man acquires his inherent or internal or moral freedom through subjection to a law which he has imposed upon himself. He never becomes subject to a um, a heteronomous law, to a law imposed on him by other beings, by nature, for example. External freedom, of which Kant also speaks, is defined independently of any specific purpose. <clears throat> Morality is defined independently of any purpose. In the case of right, of civil law, all members of a particular society impose a law on all members of that society. In the case of morality, the individual imposes a law valid for mankind of which mankind is a member, and thus transcending not only his individual self-love, that is done to some extent by the citizen, but he transcends also the collective self-love of a particular society. This moral law, as Kant understands it, is the beginning of moral orientation. It has no support outside of itself. It cannot be deduced from the nature of man or anything else. And it has the character of an unconditioned command. No reasons are given why you should be decent. You should be decent, period. It is, as Kant says, therefore, the only fact of pure reason in every other phenomenon, every other fact, pure reason, even while entering, is mixed with something else. He alone is reason pure. It is the only absolute fact, the beginning of any possible understanding. Now, what is, does this practically mean? It's a crucial implication, and which is much more radical in Kant than in Rousseau. There is no possibility of any objection based on experience to any moral demands. Because the moral demands are, uh, have a much higher dignity, a much higher rationality than any empirical observation can possibly have. Possibility, for example, uh, it's a just society, it's a rational society. It is, is it, Plato also would have said, yes, but as a rational society is possible only under certain conditions. And if these conditions are not fulfilled, it cannot become active. It's absolutely rejected, Becker. For Kant, it is perfectly sufficient regarding the just or rational society to show that it does not contain a contradiction in terms. 
uh, for Bell and Aristotle, it would be enough. That would merely show that you don't contradict yourself in your proposal. But it might still be impossible and incompatible with the nature of things, with the nature of man. That is impossible for Kant. You can see the daring which was made possible already by Rousseau's notion of the infinite perfectibility of man and the impossibility of drawing any conclusion regarding the future from past history, from what we know of civilized men, is infinitely increased. I can't. A reference to the nature of man has no bearing on the fundamental, uh, fundamentals of moral politics. I wonder whether I should go beyond that. Let me see, perhaps there are certain points which are surely in need of clarification. Perhaps I can devote the rest of this meeting to that. Mr. Cole? Just one point about the remark concerning Kant's proposal that Kant's statement that Kant the essence of man is productivity yeah. and not contemplation. Yeah. Is this uh, peculiar to Kant and couldn't it be said the same as Hobbes and Locke? For Hobbes and Locke, every productivity is based on receptivity in every respect. And not only in knowledge, but in of course, it needs a fantasy of self-perception, but it be more right. What is the basis? Uh, look, uh, um, Why do you separate productivity from receptivity? Why is that so important? Yeah. You see, I mean, I mean, I would use it in order to make clear the radical uh, difference between Kant and the whole tradition. Uh, I mean, in, in uh, by Plato and Aristotle, the essence of man is condemnation. Man was born to behold yeah? the, the universe, the ideas, whatever you call it. Yeah? Yeah, well, here by productivity, don't you simply mean um, moral productivity, the products of practical reason, and not productivity of, of material things? Yeah. This is not, I mean, the man is has to be productive in order to live or live reasonably well. That was always admitted. I mean, houses do not come into being uh, without human production. You know, that's fair. But the highest activities of man, those which are uh, most truly human, were considered uh, uh, prior, uh, prior to that as non productive. But Contemplation. In Kant, that is impossible because the object of contemplation would be the thing in itself. Nature or being as truly is. That's inaccessible. So that contemplation can only have a relative ordinance. Our, the highest thinking of man, cognition, is production. Or that you learn the day in every age. Logic and positivistic course, what is science except organizing with yeah, sense data, you know, making projects, making models, something. Uh, so that's productive activity. And regarding morality, yeah, morality means to do the right thing. But to, you, according to Kant, you cannot do the right thing if you do not know that the right thing is imposed by you on yourself. It is your own legislation, a productive act. You said this becomes very important to Marx. Because Marx, cons Marx is, so to say, is prepared by Kant in the following way. Marx attempt to con understand the higher life of man in the light of economic productivity presupposes a universal philosophy of man, in which man as man was understood as productive, even in the highest, certainly in the highest activities. It take a parallel. Art, what we now call art with a capital A, was understood as an imitation of nature. 
in meditation of nature. Uh, today that's very generally rejected and the words are not productive, it's too weak for this people. It is a clear activity. You can also, I mean, I have no objection if you want to introduce, and you can say, come, lay the foundation for the understanding of man essentially creative and not imitative. Okay. Although Kant doesn't use that word, but it, it uh, is uh, uh, permissible to say that. And that is a very radical change. Now, in the case of Hobbes, and of course it is in a way prepared by Hobbes and by Bacon, never forgets the simple fact that the motto, the critique of pure reason, is taken from Bacon. So Kant knew something about this prehistory. But still, there is a great difference of, uh, there is a difference not only of degree, but of kind between uh, this earlier man and uh, Kant, because, I mean, you only have to read the, the classic passage in Hobbes about our making, how infinitely crude they are compared with Kant. Yeah? And to say nothing of the fact that the moral principles are, of course, in, in Hobbes absolutely imposed upon man by his natural instincts, so and in no way self-imposed. In this aspect, Hobbes is very old-fashioned. Hobbes says the principles uh, of morality uh, are to be found by experience. We look how people behave, and then we see, for example, that fathers, believe it or not, lock their money away from their own children. What does this mean? Uh, well, that they have a great distrust of their fellows, and that you analyze more deeply, then you have the nature of man, the unchangeable nature of man. Man is a selfish being. Uh, cannot be changed. It can't can deny the radical selfishness of man uh, by the simple device that is how men actually behave as far as we can see in most cases, if not always. But that doesn't mean that he cannot be unselfish. The fact that the moral law tells me to be unselfish, I use now this simple formulation, yeah, proves the possibility of selfishness. Thou canst because thou oughtst, if that is possible. That is the Kant's formula. And there are no ob objection uh, on the basis of theoretical knowledge of the phenomenal world is possible. Because that tells us only the outside and, and uh, I, um, the outside in addition, something, uh, a, a mere human construct. It doesn't give us a core of the matter. Yes. I'm not quite clear about Kant's idea of the moral law, divested of any content. Kant's idea of the moral law, divested of any content. The objective or objective test of his being moral or wrong. The test, yeah. Take a simple case of immorality, yeah? Very simple case. A man who embezzles money yeah? because he needs it. Or he, as Kant wisely says, he believes to need it, because that is never such a, a such an absolute a priori certainty as the moral law itself could take. Now, what does he do? What, what should he do according to Kant? He should say, uh, wholly regardless of the positive law which forbids it, huh? he should say, is this comp my present intention to embezzle money compatible with a universal law commanding everyone to embezzle money when he believes he needs money. And then I see I didn't mean that. I only want to make a little exception for me on this particular occasion. That is for Kant the root of immorality, to regard yourself, your present immoral action, as a little, uh, as a little exception which dies normally. That is what. But it is, of course, more than that. Kant also says a means, by the category imperative, take on responsibility. You don't, are not like a little, be not like a little child yeah, who, who simply obeys, but take on responsibility. Regard yourself as a founder or creator of a world 
of which you would wish to be a member. If you look at your action in this perspective, then and only then do you have a sufficiently broad perspective for a judge. I mean, that is not Kant's entirely the word, but I try to explain it. In the perspective of the founder, transcend selfishness. If you are a founder of a commonwealth and not merely, merely just a member yeah, who might wish to exploit the commonwealth, the founder is interested in the existence and of, in the happiness of his foundation. Yeah? By this you transcend selfishness. But on the other hand, you must also view yourself as a member, meaning the world which you will found must be bearable to human beings as such. Uh, of, and you are an example of that. You see, the, the combination of the perspective of the founder and of the member gives you the broadest moral perspective. That is what he also means. It is, of course, a great question whether uh, formal ethics as Kant meant it is possible. Yeah? Whether you really get beyond a certain notion of human nobility when it takes in the present day form, there are a number of cultures, as people say. And the contents of these moralities differ considerably in, in many points. Yeah? Monogamy, polygamy, and, and, uh, and many, many others. Now, but all these cultures share one thing. They are a notion of noble things, noble actions, noble human beings, and despicable actions. Yeah? You know, and, and these respective members of the different cultures understand one another in this particular thing. But that is only something formal in itself, be, because the content is given in each case by the different cultures. Now, Kant, of course, claims that by understanding this principle of nobility, you get one and only one content. You know? One can also state it as follows. Morality, according to the ordinary understanding, consists in doing the right thing in the right spirit. I mean, if you do the right thing, for example, abstaining from murder, merely out of fear of the police, you don't do it right spirit. And what Kant says, as it were, is this. The right spirit alone is sufficient, because the right spirit necessarily engenders the right thing. And in the same way for all, at all times. And here is a difficulty. Okay, that would lead us to find out how Kant tried to believe that uh, he, he couldn't do it without introducing as a matter of course that every being which universalizes a maxim is concerned with happiness. And therefore no moral law which is incompatible with human happiness can be a moral law. As the difficulty is that the Zen Kant had uh, depreciated happiness as a hopelessly subjective concept. You know, that is one of the more detailed difficulties into which I cannot go now. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I think so, but still I feel that he can explain this only in the context of the society. Morality, in the context of the society, would understand that happiness is the result of the various cultures, and what Kant actually explains is their sense of all this, and that they can't be universal. Yeah, but when you say a culture, then there is, of course, a danger that the self-preservation of this culture as a collective ego becomes a part of it. In other words, you are in danger of replacing simple egoism by collective egoism. And the only society of which we have to think according to Kant is all mankind. That is, uh, that is uh, crucial for his notion. I do not know, uh, can, uh, can you restate your question? No, I was saying that when he says that his moral law has no content, I was, what, what you said, at least to me, flows from society. He explains this moral law in the context of the outside. That's very nice. I mean, a man is in a, 
also a man is a social being and, and practically all his actions affect directly or indirectly other beings, that's quite true. But that doesn't mean, of course, that the peculiar moral content of this particular society or culture necessarily enters a man's moral principles. Do you see that? Yeah, but must have relevance at some stage to society. Yeah, but Kant would, would, no, no, Kant would question that. Kant, I mean, uh, Kant would say, you have to obey the law yeah, of, of the man. That, I will speak of that later, that, that you have to do. But that does not mean that you are in your moral horizon limited by the law of the land. A Kant would not uh, admit that, that you have to embrace the values of your society. He would say it is a very immoral principle. You know? uh, that is as immoral as to say you have to accept the uh, opinions of your father and grandfather regardless of what they were. Yeah. I mean, if these principles of your society prove to be compatible with the moral law, all right. But if not, no. But there is one and only one moral law, and there is one and only one notion of the just society. That is the same in Kant as in the earlier thinkers. Only in, according to Kant, these notions of the just society must not be derived from any preceding end or purpose. Now, the practical meaning is clear, uh, and, and the consequences are familiar to all of you. For Kant, there is only one natural right, and that he calls the right to freedom. I mean, so to external freedom. Regardless of what the purpose is, that is what we understand by liberalism. You know, if you say, say self-preservation is the end, there is the possibility to say self-preservation is better taken care of by a wise, benevolent despot than by a republican society. Could be. Yeah. But if you say the only natural right is the right of freedom, regardless of what the purpose is, that's clear, republican or you know, perhaps even democratic consequences follow from that. that. And that is the tacit premise of present-day uh, liberalism, as it still exists. It's, that doesn't make it a true principle. But uh, still, it only shows that these seemingly abstruse reflections of Kant had to have a very definite and powerful practical political meaning. What we understand by freedom today, by we, we I mean those who do not have their roots in something older than modern thought, is the Kantian notion. Freedom which is not a freedom for. Yeah? Freedom itself is the highest good. Politically, external freedom. Morally, moral freedom. And uh, that is, therefore, that is what. Whenever you have a preceding end or purpose, that's what Kant says, you admit a principle limiting freedom. Is it time? Yeah, then I have, I'm sorry, perhaps we can be, I have to leave. Thank you. With a few points I made last time regarding Rousseau because they are especially necessary for the understanding of Marx. The first point is that according to Rousseau, no conclusion can be drawn from man as empirically known or as historically known to what man can be or what man should be. Rousseau must therefore develop a special method for finding out what man could be. And that cannot be the observation of empirical man. Very generally speaking, he must find a way towards a natural man. Towards a natural man. And the main point is that man is characterized by infinite malleability or by infinite perfectibility. 
This given the case, society of free and equal men is possible. The fact that no such society ever existed cannot be held against that. The second point. In order to get a society of free and equal men, it is necessary that each man, each member of the society, alienates all his powers to the community so that there be freedom in society. But this alienation of the individual to the society means, of course, also the other way around, that society is bondage. A society is possible only as civil society, as a state. This is somehow connected with the fact that civil society is based on private property, and a certain element of injustice inevitably enters a civil society on that score. There is therefore an inevitable antinomy between the happiness of the individual and his being a member of society. If this shows itself according to Marx as for, uh, to, uh, to so as follows. Whenever man lives in society, and this does not yet have to be civil society, vanity develops, amour propre, as Rousseau calls it, competition with others, and a competition which poisons the mind. Therefore, happiness is possible only in withdrawal from society or in solitude. In other words, for this reason, there is a limitation not to human perfection, but to the perfection of society. In all society, as long as man lives in society, you cannot get rid of this poisoning element, which Rousseau calls amour propre, uh, vanity, uh, you can say pride, competitiveness. But this ceiling can be overcome uh, in the case of the few men who can live outside of society. Now, if we disregard this problem of competitiveness and are more proper, we have the clear limit of society in the fact that society is devoted primarily to the protection of property. Therefore, it would seem that you can overcome the difficulty or here we are. I mean, which I say in this formula. Here is a circle of civil society, and here is a free individual on the fringes of society in a way outside of society. He is happy. He is truly a human being. They are somewhere how alienated. And this alienation is a price they pay for freedom. They become completely citizens, they cease to be individuals. Now, the simple solution from if Marx looked at this thing was to abolish property. To abolish property, to abolish the state, and therefore, in this way, to have no longer a need of withdrawal from fundamentally imperfect society. Rousseau's reply to that, if he had known of the Marxist solution, would have been you can never solve the human problem by a solution, however perfect, of the social problem. And that this point is reasonably well taken, is shown empirically by a protest against Marx, which arose long after Marx, and with which you are all familiar. The antipode of Marx on the common uh, sense level today is Freud. And Freud's statement in Discontent of Civilization, or in Civilization, I was called, uh, this is simply a restatement of Rousseau's point of view. Civilization is as such a thing which leads to misery. And therefore, the solution of the problem of happiness cannot be found by any social means. And, uh, well, if we take it in the crudest form, we would need, in addition to communism, also psychoanalysis, because uh, the people would not be satisfied by a, even by a perfectly just society that would still remain the so-called personal problem. On another level, the same, of course, is done by existentialism. There are existentialists who are Marxists, as you know, in France especially, but they are distinguished from the Marxists by the fact that they are aware 
that the solution of the social problem is not a solution of the human problem. There is still, perhaps the human problem is essentially insoluble, but then it is important to face that fact that one can say simply is a thesis of this kind of existentialism. Now, I turn then to Kant, who radicalizes the Rousseauan position profoundly, and Kant, just as his other successors, get rid of that satellite of the, who accompanies uh, the society and simply try to find uh, a solution to the human problem in a properly constructed society. Kant said what men should be cannot be deduced, determined in any way by man's nature. A man's end can be determined only by man's becoming free from the tutelage of nature and of God. If he applies this to resource problem, it is not true that man cannot become free from a vanity in society. The mere fact that man, the moral law demands from man the freedom from vanity proves the possibility of it. Man can be free from vanity because he ought to be free of it, free from it. The end of man must be determined by disregarding all ends which either nature or God impose upon one. And that of, means also, of course, self-preservation as an end. Pure reason alone determines the end of man and therefore the structure of the just society. For the question of whether a certain social project is possible or not, you do not have to go into the question of whether it is compatible with the nature of men. You have only to see whether it is compatible with reason. And this means also the possibility is determined by the absence of self-contradiction, not a study of the nature of men. Freedom. Freedom in the sense in which it is now understood. Not a freedom for a certain ends. But freedom is an end in itself. Morality means the exercise of such freedom. Self-legislation, self-determination. And this freedom consists in the fact that you conceive of yourself both as ruler and as ruled in a universal society. That is the meaning of the categoric imperative. The political counterpart of this universal society is a society of minds, is, would be a League of Nations in Kant's teaching, a universal human society. But there is here a great complication, which is characteristic of Kant's teaching, to which I must turn now. And this is due to the fact that in Kant's doctrine, the Rousseauan distinction between the individual and society reasserts itself. In this way, social progress, progress towards a just society, is not necessarily moral progress. The progress, the outer, the social, the institutional, is radically distinguished from the inner, from the moral. I will explain that. Morality, as Kant understands it, is primarily the recognition of the rights of man. Such recognition is possible in two entirely different ways. In a calculating spirit, or sincerely, or to use the Kantian terms, in the spirit of legality, or in the spirit of morality. From the legal point of view, there is really nothing, strictly speaking, sacred. Only calculation prevails. Kant states the problem in this way. The usual view was that a perfect society, a just society, requires a complete regeneration of men. Or to exaggerate, it requires that men become angels. To which Kant replies, that's nonsense. The perfect, the just society is possible among in a nation of devils, provided that devils have sense. By sense, he means, provided they are shrewd calculators. 
superfity just society can be established without any moral regeneration. But let me go a step back. Kant makes it possible by his moral teaching to regard the rights of men as sacred. Because morality, as he conceives of it, is not utilitarian, but irreducible, he does not try to deduce the rights of man from the right of self-preservation, which is something which is hardly distinguishable from what one could ascribe to the brutes. It is this way. It is a sacred duty of each to bring about the recognition of the sacred rights of men even of those men who are not moral, even of those who are prompted only by calculation. The just or rational society, the society based on the recognition of the rights of men, is necessary and possible both for immoral men and for moral men, for a nation of angels as well as for a nation of devils i.e. mere good calculators. That means the state is in one sense morally neutral. It is not directed toward the virtue or toward the development of men's faculties or even towards outward decency as such or public welfare. It has, the state has no function but to guarantee external freedom, freedom of movement. Yet this external state, this night watchman state, as it was called later on, is required by morality. And therefore, this seemingly immoral, but in fact unmoral state, is of the utmost moral relevance. The state as state is concerned only with legality, meaning that everyone in fact respects the rights of everyone else and fundamentally the natural rights of each. The reasoning is this. The law, law, compulsion, coercion, is unable to produce morality. But, on the other hand, it must not interfere with the moral freedom of each. A compulsory morality would not be morality. The foundation of right, therefore, is freedom, external freedom, which is needed by everyone regardless of what his purpose is, regardless of whether his purpose is moral or immoral, you cannot pursue your purpose if you are not free to pursue it. And therefore this freedom is wholly independent of any purpose or end you may pursue. Only for the sake of that freedom which every man manifestly needs, whatever his purpose may be, can the freedom of anyone be abridged? In other words, a certain abridgment is necessary, but this abridgment is justified only to the extent to which it is needed for guaranteeing the maximum of freedom to each. This is really a classic formulation of the liberal position. As the state guarantees the security of that freedom to each under equal laws. The crucial point, which I must repeat is that only through Kant, do Kant's revolution, do the rights of men, which played such a great role already prior to Kant, become sacred because they are derivative from a non utilitarian morality. Now, we are here confronted with the following predicament. We are obliged as moral beings to act morally, and that means to recognize indeed the rights of men. For example, never to treat a man as a slave, that would be a simple example. But this recognition of the rights of men is necessarily incomplete if we live under laws which prevent such recognition. On the other hand, we are under a moral obligation to obey the law of the land. And revolution is strictly immoral, according to Kant. The reason is extremely simple. No revolution without pre preceding conspiracy. And no conspiracy without lying. And lying is absolutely immoral. 
How can we get out of that, according to Kant? We are morally obliged to hold for the establishment of the just society, but we cannot take this crucial conspiratorial step. We, are there, we must therefore see whether this hope is altogether fantastic or whether it has some basis in fact, in the is. We must, in other words, look at history with philosophic eyes. We must approach history with the a priori premise of a possible teleology of nature. Teleology of nature, that was the old Aristotelian doctrine which still lingered on in various ways, but which was fundamentally exploded by the development of modern mechanistic physics. So from Kant's point of view, who accepts Newton, the teleology of nature is theoretically unfounded. It is not, it cannot be a theoretically true teaching. Yet, in a way, the teleology of nature must be restored because it is necessary to establish a link between the is, the mere factual is, and the ought of the moral law. And the philosophy of history in Kantian sense is only the culmination of this natural teleology. Morality guarantees the moral necessity of a just society. The moral necessity meaning that it is your, our duty to strive toward it. Morality also guarantees the physical possibility of the just society because the principle is thou canst what thou oughtst. If that is intelligible, it's a literal translation of what Kant says to Kant and to Solst. Historical proofs to the contrary possess no validity, validity whatsoever for the conclusion from never hitherto to never in the future is not valid. Yet there exists some historical proof of progress towards a just society, which supports our hope. The weak traces of progress which we observe tip the scale in favor of probability of the emergence of the just society as distinguished from the mere possibility. And therefore these weak traces of progress are very important. The realization of the just society is beyond the power of any one individual, say of a mighty prince. It is even beyond the power of the collective effort of mankind. Therefore we need some support apart from the moral law or the categoric imperative. The natural or unintended or mechanical must act as if it intended the just society. Now when I'm through with this exposition, you will see why this is relevant for Marx, but for the time being you must be a bit patient. I say now one point, philosophy of history. Kant was the first philosopher of the first rank who dealt with philosophy as, of history as such. Now, philosophy of history is necessary because we need some theoretical, not merely moral support for morality in its political implications. The fact that we know what a just society is and that it is possible is not enough we must have some greater support for our hope because we cannot act towards it, acting being conspiratorial and therefore immoral. Now within his systematic writings, Kant has sketched the principles of his philosophy of history only in the critique of judgment and even there only in the appendix. The philosophy of history has in Kant a lower status than the natural theology, teleology in general. Why? Let us look at the substance of Kant's philosophy of history. Philosophy of history postulates a teleology, a directedness of the historical process, and more fundamentally, a teleology of nature, a directedness of nature, which shows how the historical process apparently a meaningless web spun chiefly by crimes and follies, 
can be understood as a meaningful process. Because if the word teleology is in any way embarrassing to you, say meaningful, because it's exactly the same thing. It shows the wise and moral meaning of those follies and crimes we find at the surface of history. It shows the necessity of those follies and crimes. Now, the necessity, not mechanically, as this fellow had an Oedipus complex and therefore had to murder his mother, or whatever they do when they have an Oedipus complex, but that this action was meaningful with a view to its end. Yeah? That's the point. Moral actions, good or evil, are actions of human individuals which cannot be subject to natural necessity because they are and teleological or mechanical. They are free acts. Philosophy of history must therefore bridge the gulf between moral freedom and mechanical necessity. An inkling of how this is possible is supplied by statistics regarding suicides, crimes, etc., which show that these free actions of men have a strange regularity. These actions are free and hence unpredictable actions of individuals. Yet we find regularities and hence predictability when we turn from the individuals to aggregates, as Kant puts it. The actions of human aggregates are subject to natural laws. Hence history is an account of the action of aggregates, as distinguished from individuals, may lead to the discovery of laws of non-moral necessities controlling the sequence of those actions. And this necessity may even be in a way a teleological necessity. The sequence may be shown to lead to an end, the end being the just society. Now, how is this sequence, this progress, to be conceived? How was it conceived prior to Kant? the probability of the actualization of the just society was thought to be guaranteed by the overwhelming power of the end, which this just society was thought to serve. Self-preservation as the object of the strongest and most powerful desire of fear of violent death as the strongest passion is the support of the just society, according to the hobbes Lockean scheme. But why do we not have such sound society in spite of the power of the fear of violent death, of which we are all aware? Answer, the fear of violent death is counteracted by the fear of powers invisible, in the Hobbesian phrase, i.e. by religion. The just society becomes therefore possible in proportion as a fear of powers invisible is weakened when people cease to fear punishment after death, the fear of death comes into its own, and then a rational policy is possible. In other words, the solution preferred by Kant was the just society comes about by enlightenment, the spreading of the truth. And this spreading of the truth is a necessary consequence of the discovery of the truth. They somehow believe that. Yeah? That someone, a man has discovered the truth, he cannot keep it. He must do that. And then the consequence here. Yet there was a difficulty here, which was clearly seen by Rousseau. Men enter society for the sake of self-preservation. But society makes men oblivious of the supremacy of self-preservation. Society necessarily endangers vanity and thus weakens of primary self-love, self-preservation. It thus makes men willing subjects of despotism. And therefore, the discovery of the political truth, which means the discovery of the character of the just society, is not sufficient for bringing about the just society. The case would be hopeless if the powers did 
determining social men, determining social men, civilized men, love of gain, love of dominion, love of honor, and so on, did not themselves compel men to move towards a just society. The moral degradation, if I may say so, brought about by society must itself be an instrument for bringing about a society which is in accordance with morality, that is Kant's improvement of Rousseau, one can say, Kant's correction of Rousseau. Not the return from the imperfect civil society to the state of nature, but the progress from the imperfect civil society to the perfect civil society is possible and necessary. The general schema is this. Vanity, uh, Rousseau makes a distinction between self-love, uh, same as self-preservation, amour de soi, and, uh, say, self-love, and uh, amour propre, let us say vanity, vanity or pride. Now, this leads, uh, vanity is the root of the passions proper, uh, love of gain, love of the superiority of various kinds. Now, this leads to, uh, to the passions and uh, to, also to, uh, to wealth, comfort, and all these other duties uh, goods of society. It also leads to discord. The competitiveness leads necessarily to discord. Ever increasing wealth, ever increasing discord, ever more costly wars, enormous public debts. They spoke about that already then, you know. And therefore, the need for perpetual peace impresses itself on the most wicked hoodlums, uh, who may be peasants, you know. They see simply it is not to their interest, to their calculating devilish self-interest, to have any further war. Nature, as Kant puts it, nature achieves its end, this perfect, this perfect just society which would be a federation of republics, a universal federation of republics, brings it about through antagonisms. There is no moral motivation here necessary. You see, the situation becomes, the solution becomes much easier. If the salvation of the human race depends on moral regeneration, we can wait until doomsday. But if the very immorality of man necessarily contributes to the bringing about of the just society, uh, we can be sanguine. Men are compelled by their passions and the consequence of their passions to become receptive to the just society. Morality does not enter here. Therefore, the thing is fundamentally easy. Yeah? I mean, it is difficult enough, but the greatest difficulty has been overcome. Yet, given man's freedom, is he not able to resist the overpowering trend towards the federation of republics? Yeah, the Federation of the Republic's Perpetual Peace. No, and that's the beauty of Kant. A freedom as moral freedom categorically demands the just society. So both the wicked and the good, the wicked for wicked reasons, the good for uh, good reasons, must promote this progress. The just society is demanded at all times by morality. In our age, I mean in Kant's age, it is necessitated by intelligent immorality as well. And the latter is, of course, much more powerful than morality. Morality commands the just society. Calculating egoism is driven into the just society. But this this driving is much more, more powerful than the commanding or demand. It looks as if Kant doesn't go beyond the cautious, agnostic, it looks. It looks as if there were a purpose of nature which leads to the achievement of the same thing that ought to be the work of moral freedom. 
So just society ought to be the work of moral freedom. But it isn't the work of moral freedom. In a mechanical, amoral, immoral necessity brings it about. This is a marvelous convergence and harmony. In fact, a paradoxical convergence and harmony. So theology is assumed a priori. We cannot have any empirical knowledge of it. We cannot even have a theoretical a priori knowledge of it. We have only a practical a priori knowledge of it. If we are morally obliged to hope for it, that's the meaning of that. What we can observe is only the necessity of certain effects. For example, as an effect of bankruptcy coming from the cause of public debt or coming from costly wars. That is a mere mechanical, non-moral necessity. The mechanistic system, by its inherent necessities, without any interference on the part of morality, leads from the passions to the just society in a way which is at no point interrupted. Yet it so happens that this mechanical necessity leads to the result which is demanded by morality. It is truly paradoxical for the following reason. What morality commands cannot be simply the same thing as that to which men are compelled by mechanical necessity. Therefore, the philosophy of history deals only with institutional progress, not with moral progress. These events, which who are driven by, into the just society by calculation, don't cease to be devils. That they are now members of a republic, which in its part is a member of a universal federation of republics. So there is only institutional progress, no moral progress. Philosophy of history deals to some extent with intellectual progress, naturally, because the understanding of these devils needs some intelligence supplied by social science, economics, etc. But intellectual progress, in this sense, has nothing to do with moral progress, as I think is empirically known. The condition for the establishment of the just society is a victory of the spirit of commerce. Selfish gain uniting the nations over the spirit of positive religion, which as positive religion is divisive. This is the most important part of the philosophy of history as Kant understands it. You see here the importance of the so-called economic element. This mechanical necessity includes, as a crucial factor, the victory of trade over positive religion. But the intellectual pro progress which is implied, and there is a connection between trade and intellectual progress, which is quite obvious. The name for that intellectual progress is the development of economics. Now, this is however, not simply the intellectual progress or enlightenment which brings about this change. The passions engendered by ecclesiastical misrule and ecclesiastical wealth are much more important than the Enlightenment itself. The Enlightenment only gives some idea of the direction in which you move. But the power comes from the passions, you see. And how does it work? Yeah, the envy, I mean, the, the, the indignation against ecclesiastical misrule, the envy of ecclesiastical wealth, leads to such things as the Reformation, i.e. the religious wars, and the contrast between the religious wars and the commercially profitable character of tolerance, empirically shown by Holland. And these are the real elements, these are the weak traces of progress pointing towards the just society. And this makes clear what Kant emphasizes, that we are concerned here not with a moral progress, but with a morally relevant progress. Because as good men, we must be concerned with the establishment of a just society, even if it is established by the immoral passions. And the argument can be said as follows. The immoral passions are effective at all times, in the Peloponnesian War and wherever you might look. But gradually, the situation is now this, that these immoral passions, which were always effective in men, now become effective in the right direction. We can only be grateful for that. 
Philosophy of history cannot deal with moral progress. Moral progress cannot be achieved by any technology of nature. Philosophy of history deals with the necessary progress towards a just society, towards the goal of the highest moral relevance. How is this possible? I repeat, legality. I'll elucidate this by the distinction between legality and morality. The just society is possible as an automaton driven by enlightened self-interest as distinguished from morality, a soulless mechanism. All men do the right thing, but not for the right reasons. A nation of devils. This can be brought about by compulsion, legal compulsion or compulsion by the passions or compulsion by starvation or whatever. Institutional progress, which is in itself not moral progress, is of the highest moral relevance. But there is a radical difference from moral progress. Now, I will not go, I mean, I may perhaps take this up later. There are certain points here where Kant is compelled to prepare a, a harmony and perhaps even a coincidence of the moral progress and the intellectual progress. I will drop this now for the time being and go on to a point uh, after Kant. One way of stating the problem with which all these men were concerned, uh, from Rousseau till Marx and beyond, is that is a problem of morality and happiness. Rousseau's solution or, or statement of the problem was this. You have and you can have morality proper only in civil society, only there can be duty and virtue. Happiness, on the other hand, is possible only in the state of nature, which means practically beyond civil society, the individual at the fringes of civil society. Kant's thesis regarding this point, uh, happiness morality, is this. We are morally obliged to hope for the happiness of those who are worthy to be happy. But this hope does not make sense regarding this life. So we must hope for the happiness of those who are worthy to be happy in another life. As regards this life, our duties consist, according to Kant, to take care of one's own perfection, the cultivation of natural gifts, and of the happiness of others. Now that is of some importance for what I'm going to say. If you try to, the happiness of others means for some to protect them against want, against it, illness and this kind of thing. That's your moral duty. It is not your moral duty to take care of your own happiness because you do it anyway. There is no moral merit if someone takes uh, all kinds of medicine uh, in order to uh, not to get sick, you know. But on the other hand, you are obliged to cultivate your natural families. You are not obliged, as a matter of fact, you, you transgress if you regard yourself responsible for the perfection of other men. Because that means paternal despotism. It's his business to take care of his business. You must help him. But in the decisive respect regarding his, the cultivation of his natural gifts, you cannot really help him except as far as externals are concerned. I start from this distinction in order to turn now to a famous successor to Kant, who in some respects comes closer to Marx than even Hegel. Now, if I hit this, uh, oh yes, his name is Fichte. And I take the statements I'm going to use from his small writing, well, the Die Bestimmung des Gelehrten. How could one say it? Literally, the destiny. The destiny of the scholar or scientist. The word Gelehrter had at that time in German still the full meaning that it could mean the scholar, the scientist, and the philosopher as well. Uh, yeah, the, the function you could almost say, the scholar. 
Now, a fish that starts from Kant, and man is, as a rational being, is an end in itself. This is the Kantian doctrine. And that it is implied in what I said before. Morality consists in recognizing the rights of man, in, in recognizing the dignity of each man as a, as a being capable of morality. Man as a rational being is an end in itself. That means, as Fichte points out, he is because he is, and he not for the sake of something else. Hence, as a rational being, he is an absolute being. More precisely, man is meant to be the absolutely rational being, because he is it, he is it's not in fact. To be subject only to himself, and to subject everything non-rational within him and outside of him to reason. Man is meant to be the ruler or fellow ruler of the whole. But man is also a sensual being, not merely a rational being. Therefore, the absolute rationality for which he is destined can only be an infinite goal he could only achieve it by ceasing to be the rational, sensual being which he is as a human being. Man is destined, furthermore, to live in society. The, uh, society means the mutual interaction of individuals through freedom. This mutual interaction leads to, as a human fight, is a spiritual fight among the minds in which, according to Fichte, the higher or better always wins. You, you remember certain statements of Justice Holmes? That is Fichte. But in Fichte it is based on the fact because the spiritual or rational character of the fight itself guarantees the victory of the higher, the more rational. In brief, and that I think is a crucial point, the increase in intimacy in rationality is an increase in universality. Now that is of course crucial for Marx too. Why can this final society which embraces all men be the solution to the human, to the most personal problem? Because the most universal society is the most intimate society. That's a paradoxical assertion, but which we must understand. Take Aristotle. There is always, apart from civil society, friendship. And the problem which cannot be solved by the police in any way is solved by friendship. Friendship is essentially an affair of very few. Classically of two, you know, in all the famous stories of friends, there are two, Orestes and Pilates and what, what have you. So the political association is not the most intimate association, and therefore friendship can have a much higher function than political society can have. If you want to find a solution to the human problem, which is a social solution, you must somehow assume that the increase in universality is an increase in intimacy. And the, uh, the link between these thoughts is that universality is possible only by rationality. Yeah? I mean, nothing sure, uh, only by reason, something rational, can by its nature be common to all men, <coughs> universal. But the, the, ration, the, the meeting in the rational is the most intimate relation. Both partners, all partners, think identically the same, which you cannot say of any other human association. But, according to Fichte, society is not the state. The state is covered by compulsion. And compulsion means the presence of imperfect rationality. You do not have to compare a man to the rational thing if he is rational. So, therefore, the state can only be a means for establishing the perfect society. And, but in the perfect society itself, 
pure reason would be universally recognized as the highest judge. No, the highest society, the final society, is a stateless society. So the state is only a means for bringing about the final society, which is just as in Marx. The specifically human potentialities, potentialities characteristic of man, uh, peculiar to man, are founded on reason, naturally, if man is a rational element. And therefore, these specifically human potentialities are equal in all men. You consider that carefully. That is not a new thesis. The traditional view was that the intellectual inequalities among men are due to the body. You can find this in Thomas Aquinas, for example. To the to matter. The intellect is intellect is the same as in all men. But because the intellect is always found in, in a body, the body affects the intellect. And therefore, there is a great variety of uh, levels of the intellect. So, the specific human potentialities are equal in all men. Hence, if man's destiny is to become perfectly rational, it follows that it is man's destiny to become perfectly equal. And therefore, the function of man is to develop in each all faculties equally, i.e., to the highest perfection. The rational society is a society in which all its members are perfectly equal not only as they are in liberal society equal before the law, that's nothing. They are perfectly equal if the faculties of, if in each individual the same faculties are equally developed. Otherwise we have, for example, the difference between um, painters and non-painters, and so on. As those of you who have read uh, Marx's German ideology will recognize some Marxian thoughts here. By nature, men are different and unequal. This quote, mistake, unquote, of nature. Fichte's own word. In other words, nature is in a way unjust. She made men different and unequal. This mistake of nature is corrected by society. Society develops all faculties of its members to the highest degree but only severally. In it, it is not only due to my handwriting, but also to the light. Uh, at least that is what I believe. Yeah, in this way, why are all faculties developed in society? Because what one individual cannot do, another can. So the one is developed to a, a perfect painter. And the other is developed to a perfect blacksmith. And the other is developed to a perfect fisher. Now, the, the, the different faculties are perfectly developed, but in different individuals. That is what society yeah, does anyway. Now, there is a fight of reason against nature. The ideal goal would be the complete victory of, a, of reason over nature of egalitarian reason over unegalitarian nature. Now here a difficulty arises, what should we do in the meantime? Because this perfect egalitarian society is, uh, and the stateless, the uh, stateless river away is only in the infinite future. What should we do? Uh, should in the meantime a division of labor prevail, or uh, should we already try now to have uh, jacks of all trades. Uh, Fichte says one must leave this open. Uh, the moral law does not determine that it is simply a rule of prudence uh, for the time being. And uh, Fichte assumes then the premise of division of labor. And under that premise, he asserts the supremacy of the scholars or scientists. 
If there is to be division of labor, if men develop different faculties differently, then those who develop themselves to the highest degrees as, as scientists or scholars should uh, occupy the highest place. They are the supervisors of the progress of the human race. For the whole progress of mankind depends on the progress of the sciences. Now I point out here two different, uh, the Marxian traits are very obvious, very obvious, but they are of course also different. The differences which are most familiar are those. Marx's objection would be this. It is fantastic to set a goal to mankind in which man has ceased to be a sensible being, i.e. a perfectly rational being. Uh, in historical terms, here is where the influence of Feuerbach, of Feuerbach's sensualism against the spiritualism of people like Fichte comes in. The second point is that Fichte assumes an infinite progress, the stateless society where each develops the same practice as everyone else equally, is, uh, will never be achieved. It's an infinite goal. And here uh, is a difficulty enters which Hegel had pointed out against Kant in particular, namely the absurdity of the notion of the infinite progress. One can illustrate this more simply as follows. Kant taught that it is a moral law demands for us to strive toward perpetual peace. But perpetual peace is an infinite goal. Yeah? Infinite goal. And that means, of course, in plain English, as Hegel with his hard common sense saw, perpetual war. Yeah? And uh, that if you think concretely about it, you see that doesn't make the wars any way better or, or sweeter, and that they become uh, much, much tougher. To act on the delusion, we are closer to peace, you know, because we are after the last year, and, and then this leads to infinite troubles. In other words, what Hegel, Hegel's whole criticism of what he called bad infinity comes in into Marx's uh, doctrine, and therefore uh, he, uh, his objection to Fichte would be this goal of the abolition of the state is a meaningless goal if it is not within reach of men in the relatively near future. It cannot be an infinite goal, it must be a goal to be achieved within a few generations. Now there is one more point which I have to mention, and I'm through with my introduction. Do I still have time? What is the time? Thank you. I must now say a few words about the most important predecessor of, of Hegel. I will speak much less about Hegel than about Rousseau and about Kant, because quite a few characteristic elements of Hegel's teaching are in, implied in what Kant and uh, Rousseau said. And furthermore, in the case of Hegel, we shall discuss Marx's own critique of Hegel. And therefore, we do not, I must say, only some very general points. Now, I begin from a problem of Kant, as it appeared in Kant. And that concerns the teleology of nature. The teleology of nature is not knowable. We are morally obliged to assume it in a way, but it cannot be known. And we can state the reason why the teleology of nature is not knowable in a very simple way. God is not knowable. And in Kant's view, teleology presupposes an intelligent, a wise God. God is not knowable, i.e. we cannot demonstrate the existence of God. We can only postulate the existence of God on the basis of moral reason. But that is not knowledge, probably speaking. Hegel's, and, and since the teleology of nature is a problematic thing for Kant, the philosophy of history is a problematic thing. You see, I mean, that is for Kant only a kind of sketch, a sketch which has a certain plausibility, which probably meant more to him than his expressions say, but theoretically he does not have a good basis. Hegel's critique of Kant can be reduced to this simple formula. Kant had tried to prove 
the impossibility of a metaphysics proper, i.e. of a speculative or theoretical metaphysics. And that was the, uh, the root of all the troubles, according to Hegel's diagnosis. According to Hegel, Kant had discovered the true metaphysics without knowing it. And what did he mean by that? Kant uh, showed uh, in, in reply to you, I alluded to that last time, that the world as we know it, scientifically and pre-scientifically, is decisively a work of the human mind, of the human understanding, on the basis of sense data, which the mind only receives. Um, the mind organizes these sense data, to use the now familiar expression, it brings order into that chaos. The order originates in the, in the human understanding, not in the sense data. To that extent, the world as we know it is a work of the human mind. But since it is the work of the human mind, that was Kant's conclusion, it is not the true work. It is a phenomenal work. The world as it truly is, the noumenal world, is inaccessible to us as a theoretical man. No. Uh, Hegel makes this very simple observation. The understanding which creates the phenomenon is not a part of the phenomenon. and cannot be understood as a part of the phenomenal world. And that can easily be shown, that it cannot be understood as a part of the phenomenal world. Every psychological explanation of the human understanding and of science in, uh, leads to nonsense. The human understanding which creates the phenomenal world is not a part of the phenomenal world. But what then is it? That is uh, the no humanal world. More generally, the organizing, legislating, constituting mind, theoretical or practical, is the absolute. This absolute, a word which came into usage at that time in Germany, the absolute is not something which we infer by demonstration of the existence of God or what have you, or immortality of the soul. We find it by simple analysis. The hidden ground discoverable by analysis of the acts of the world and of the acts of the mind which constitute the world. That is a discovery of the absolute. So he arrives at the extreme thesis. And the absolute is mind that could have been said by Aristotle in a different way. The is mind. But everything rightly understood, if we go through the immediate appearance, say of a rock, or of the stellar system, or what have you, we discover mind. We discover mind. Now let me say, everything that is, is mind, yeah, of course a rock or a stellar system is not mind, it is a formula of it. It is alienated mind. Mind which does not present itself as mind, which is even non mind, but as non mind only intelligent, as, in, uh, as a verb of mind. Uh, I will, can now use, now use only this, uh, this, this, this deceptively simple formula, uh, but they are essential because they are the starting point of Marx's first. Let us call the principle uh, 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 one can say the formula of Hegel's metaphysics. A crucial part of Kant's critique of metaphysics was that if the theoretical mind tries to think about the principle of everything, it becomes entangled in what Kant called antinomies. The antinomies mean very simply roughly this, that it is possible to prove contradictory assertions 
שלא רואה בין מי קונטרטיטורי, אסור שזה גם אינטרסים בוחר, אס היא, או אס נוט היא, אין כל פרוסס. אז זה חייס לבר כאן זה, זה סיים נונסנס אוקרס, אבל לא אבטרי, בגלל זה כל הדיקשן אני יכול לבוא, אבל לא נסיסר. In other words, the mind must think the word has a beginning in time and the word has no beginning in time. It can demonstrate both. Therefore, a complete breakdown of pure reason that I have seen. That was, one can say, the most important refutation of Metaphysics' contract. And here comes the Hegel again says, don't you see that you have the solution to the problem in your hand? This contradiction, the essential contradictoriness of reason, is a vehicle of reason. Because this, the fact that, is a, that on this level here, and where is this uh, thing? Uh, and then on this level here, you arrive at a contradiction, proves the necessity of going to another level where the contradiction is overcome. And you find that this contradictoriness is the fundamental, logical equivalent to what Kant had discerned in his philosophy of history as antagonism. The antagonism among human beings. You know, the passionate, amoral or immoral antagonisms among men bring about the just society. Similarly, the seeming absurdities of reason contradicting itself, that is the highest activity of reason. The formula for that, which is of old origin, but rejuvenated by Kant, was dialectics. And that is the key. Uh, only for Kant, dialectics meant the collapse of reason. For Hegel, it meant the triumph of reason. So the Hegelian metaphysics is then, in this sense, a dialectic. To repeat, what uh, Hegel is so against the content against Kant is this. The noumenal word, the thing in itself, which according to Kant is wholly and inaccessible to us, is according to Hegel, accessible to us partly in the realm of Kant itself. Kant's analysis of pure reason and of the understanding is a part of an analysis of the thing in itself, of the noumenal word, because that is no longer the phenomenal word. The noumenal word is the mind and the things as the works of the mind, the objectivations of the mind. But the mind essentially develops. Therefore, the noumenal word is the true word, the object of metaphysics, is the mind in its development. History rightly understood. So the thing itself, far from being inaccessible, or accessible only as a moral postulate, is accessible to us if we intelligently look at the historical process. As this implies, to men mention one point which is crucial, that this is process, of course, as a process of the mind, a rational process. And I, I mean, just as these crimes and follies of vulgar history yeah, prove to be already on the base of Kant, a meaningful, because they bring about the just society at the end, in the same way, for Hegel still more, these crimes and follies are only the smoke and the noise which accompanies the true process, a silent process, of the progress of reason. In this process, the earlier stages are necessarily preserved in the later stages. They are, the earlier stages are immanent in the later. So the crimes and follies were necessary. And were, were necessary. The earlier stages did not merely miss the truth. So say some... Uh, Persian or Hindu notions or Chinese notions are not simply wrong. That it was essential, I mean necessary, that men thought these thoughts 
and thought them through for long periods so that the mind was enabled to rise to a higher stage. The mind is the absolute. This means the rational society, society in accordance with the mind, must become fully actual. Now, if it is to become actual in an infinite process, it will never become actual. Yeah? It's of, I mean, if you say it becomes actual on an infinite process, you say also it will never become actual. So th there cannot be an infinite process. And therefore, Hegel can now uh, develop a del teleological doctrine of the whole with the good conscience. The whole process is teleological. The development, the unfolding of the mind until it has manifested itself fully. This all implies that the historical process must have been completed. If the historical process is not completed, you cannot prove, never prove its rationality. You do not know what will come out later. As the, the rationality may only be up to a certain stage and then it may, it may lead to a tragic end. So the historical process is completed. That means in political terms, the just society exists. It's not a matter of the future. Now, how could Hegel say that the just society existed? But he did this on, on the basis of Rousseau and Kant. The just society is a society in which the rights of men are recognized. Now, this happened in the French Revolution. In the French the French Revolution, according to Kant, was the attempt of men, the first attempt of men, to stand on his head. That was not a criticism on Hegel's part. The greatest part that men stand on his head means he tried to build society on reason. And the rational society being one which recognizes the rights of man as man, that was done in the French Revolution in the famous declaration of the rights of man at the beginning. Yeah, surely then, then the French Revolution uh, became a great scandal, as we all know. And therefore the French Revolution is not sufficient as such. But then it, it needed stabilization. The recognition of the rights of man is not sufficient you must also have a government which is capable to protect the rights of men. And while the rights of men are fundamentally egalitarian, the need for government cannot be understood in egalitarian terms. Not everyone who, de who has rights has, can therefore have full political rights. As it was put some time ago by President Eisenhower, federal employment is a privilege but not a right. Now, still more, the presidency of the, of the United States and the cabinet in the cabinet is not an, a right, but a privilege. Government is something to be distinguished from the rights which everyone can have. And who was it that, who put the crown on the French Revolution by um, recognizing not only the rights of men, but making possible government on that basis, legislation, lasting legislation on that basis? Napoleon. And therefore, Napoleon, the Napoleonic Empire was for the younger Hegel the establishment of the final and just society. And then, as Hegel may have thought in some moments without publishing it, then uh, these peoples, the Germans and Italians and so, uh, fell on, back on their nationalistic dreams, destroyed the Napoleonic Empire, the Holy Alliance, you know, and then you got the famous reaction. And this, it was Hegel's uh, misfortune to live under that regime and uh, from 1815 until his death in 1831. And therefore Hegel brought out a somewhat more acceptable, I mean, at that time acceptable solution, that was his philosophy of right. And in the philosophy of right, he accepted the Prussian monarchy, for example, in which, of which he was an employee, uh, and he accepted it as a post-revolutionary state. In other words, yeah, Hegel adapted himself all right. There is no question. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but that was not, it was not a mere act of adaptation. There was some very good reasoning because the Prussian monarchy, and very since Frederick was great, had become a rational state somehow. 
and uh, to a higher degree under the influence of the reformers of 1812 to 15, with Hegel was in sympathy. Uh, I do not want to go into this question. It is very important for the details of Marx's criticism because Marx criticized, of course, uh, Hegel's philosophy of right, which was this document of, of Hegel's adaptation to the Prussian hereditary monarchy. And then he had, in many ways, easy going. But I must mention only, uh, and there are other great difficulties, there are many loose threads in Hegel, it's no question. For example, from Hegel's point of view, a war, at least among European states, is, in his opinion, absolutely impossible because there is no longer a problematic principle involved. The fundamental issue is settled. There can no longer be a genuine issue. A trivial things like a little bit of a frontier, that's not where the war. And yet the war plays in Hegel's political doctrine a very great role. And there are other things. I will mention only a few more points in the transition. For Hegel, it is as essential as for Kant and for Rousseau to make a distinction between the state as that work which guarantees the rights of men and therefore has a sacredness of the rights of men and even a higher sacredness and what they call with an untranslatable word die bürgerliche Gesellschaft. I don't know if the term occurs in Marx all the time and I don't know what the English translation is doing. Yeah, bourgeois society is really not a bad translation. It is, of course, a not an entirely good translation because bourgeois society is simply in ordinary civil society. Now, the, amb the ambiguity is worth looking into. The German word Bürger, Bürger in English, yeah, has an ambiguity which was first pointed out uh, by Rousseau because the French word bourgeois has a similar ambiguity. Burger, burger means on the one hand the inhabitant of a town, of a burg, of a, of a borough, of a town. And the, the towns had, the, the townspeople had a greater freedom already in the Middle Ages than the non noble country people. Therefore, from this point of view, the burger reminds of the citizen of the ancient republics. And they call themselves perhaps citoyens in France. Yes, they call themselves citoyens. Rousseau simply laughed at them and said, these French burghers, they are no citizens, they are subjects of the French king. And to be a citizen and a subject is mutually incompatible. The citizen means you are a member of the sovereign. And the subject is you are a subject to the, simply a subject to the sovereign. So Rousseau made a distinction between the citoyen, the citizen, and the bourgeois. The bourgeois being uh, the subject and preferably the wealthy subject of a half feudal king or monarch of the Ancien Régime. Now this, this distinction was taken over by Hegel and eventually <coughs> by Marx. And Hegel especially is very important here because he gives a philosophic definition of the bourgeois. The bourgeois is characterized by fear of violent death. You know, that had been Hobbes' definition of man, of, of, the, of the reasonable man at the end. But uh, what Hegel says is this. The subject of the old regime is not a soldier, of course. He does not defend the fatherland. That is done by mercenaries who are hired by the absolute king. The citizen fights for his country. The citizen is a republican concept, and bourgeois is a modern monarchic concept. Yeah, now, how does the distinction show itself? The bourgeois are burghers engaged in trade, commerce, industry. And from this, they develop the meaning the bürgerliche Gesellschaft, the bourgeois society, as a society of the market, organized by the market. Not the marketplace, but the market. And the economic society. Now, Hegel makes, therefore, a distinction in accordance with it between the state as an overarching and a sacred association 
and the, yeah, the bourgeois Gesellschaft, the bourgeois society, which, however, as a competitive, competitive society, must be a free society. As I have read, only Mr. Kropsky can uh, tell us whether it's true or not, uh, Hegel fundamentally adopts Adam Smith's doctrine and incorporates it into the philosophy of life. Substantially true. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but this bourgeois society uh, is accepted, but only as subordinate. Uh, only as subordinate. And, but the distinction of the two is absolutely essential and is one of the beginnings of Marx's criticism. Now, we can state Marx's criticism of Hegel. Uh, very, it's an initial criticism, very simply as follows. Hegel's state, this rational state, Prussia, 1920 following, Metternich, is not a rational state. It is not a rational state, and therefore the historical process cannot have reached its end, but on the contrary. The establishment of the rational state is the matter of the future, and if we think through the rational state, Marx says, we cannot be satisfied with any rational state for the Christian race. Because if men are rational, they don't need compulsion anymore. Therefore, they're withering away of the state. But in order to achieve all these things, Marx has to take a much bigger step, namely to develop not only a, not a philosophy against Hegel in particular, but to reject philosophy altogether. And that we must try to understand, uh, which I can only say is the thesis. Marx says, all, not only Hegel, but all philosophers have been wrong. And this was due to the fact that there were philosophers, not to, one, to any particular era. For philosophers, as such, believe in the primacy of thinking. That is their professional disease. But thinking is the relative. And hence, the philosophers, philosophers are wrong. Now, someone would say, but that may be true of these uh, fantastic Germans, but what about the sensualists and materialists of these enlightened countries in the West, England and France? <laughs> they, did, they all said thinking comes afterward. First you have impressions, sense impressions, you know, locked, human, and so on. Why are they also, do they suffer? from the professional disease of philosophers, if in a somewhat different way. What do they say? What is wrong with them? The fundamental phenomenon is not this. They admit. The fundamental phenomenon is sense perception, they say. But what is sense perception? I can't do it. I mean, what is the culture of sense perception? Receptivity. You don't do anything. Something hits you and then you have a, a sensation of colors or sounds or whatever. Merely receptive. That is, that is a form in which the professional disease shows itself in the sensualistic or materialistic philosophies. The true thing, which is human labor, may not merely as a perceiving, sensually perceiving thing, but man as a being which has needs and which in order to satisfy these needs must produce. As this producing angle, the Germans come in somehow, you know, productivity. But of course not their productivity, of which they spoke, the productive activity of the mind primarily, but the stuff, primary productivity, which consists, for example, in taming uh, animals or in digging a ditch and this kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think I have to leave it here for reasons of time, but I would feel very badly if we would leave the room immediately uh, without having seen whether there has been any, any contact, because I, there was no question and exchange today at all. So may I suggest that we stay here for another 10 minutes, Mr. Dawson? Yeah, of course. No, but because we do it together, and therefore we must have a peaceful agreement. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be unjust. <laughs> now, and we are supposed to teach justice, and therefore, at least in public practice. <laughs> uh, now, 
Is there any point you would like to raise before that? Some of you who may not know, may not have known anything of these German speculations, and there may be other difficulties. Mr. Benjamin? How does bourgeois society differ both from, well, differ from civil society as opposed to differing from the state? Civil society, I mean, if we accept the Hegelian doctrine, the civil society is a state. Yeah. Then the state is all inclusive of, of everything is social. Yeah, but only the state, as he can understand it, must keep his, his hands off bourgeois society. Yeah. It must make it possible by, for example, if someone commits a bank robbery, they have robbed the banks that is a state enters, yeah? but if the people are legally honest, the state is not legally alone. Is this the distinction between uh, the state and civil society? is of course part of the later tradition which you lay as the common dogma, the distinction between the state and society. Yeah? Rabbi Weiss. In, in 50, I don't understand, uh, did you say that the same faculties uh, are developed to the same extent by everyone, or, or to a different extent, or no, different the, faculties? No, the ideal goal would be the highest development of all faculties in each. I, I'm sure that Fichte, and not even Marx, meant that everyone should perform a first rate uh, uh, high-drop dance. You know, I draw the answer. I believe they would have said if someone is not so good at that, it's not so terribly important. But the other faculties, uh, the artistic faculties, the intellectual faculties, the faculties of deliberation, you know, all the really important human values should be equally developed in all that doesn't mean a mediocrity, however. You know, universal mediocrity. But in each case to the highest degree. In other words, a race of heroes. A whole human race consisting of geniuses. That would be as a goal. Are they equal? Are they on the, the same level? Yeah, I mean, that is then a question uh, on which they don't seem to have given thought. But you would say, if uh, perhaps uh, uh, Shakespeare was a greater dramatist than Goethe, at least Goethe himself believed that. Yeah? Well, if, let us say, uh, if there are such differences, and some are like Shakespeare, others are only like Goethe, and they would still be terrific. Right? <laughs> <laughs> then I don't know. But theoretically, it's not really a relevant question, because if equality is a terribly important, and then uh, this embarrassing situation, as some should be lower than others, yeah? say Goethe is lower than Shakespeare, still it would have to be considered. But um, uh, that has some time, sure. Yes. Perhaps you're going to deal with this next time, but if not, I wonder if you would elaborate on the point you made uh, in your lecture, which was that Marx got more from Kant than he did from Hegel. Did I do this thing? I thought you did. No, I only uh, no, I said only this. So many things of Kant enter into Hegel. Therefore, I do not have to speak of them anymore when I speak of Hegel. And for this is a brief of Gandhi. And the second phrase is particularly accidental, and I think it has that phrase, because regarding Marx, uh, has to be about Hegel, he is the leader of Marx himself, and he is the critique of Hegel. Thanks. 
to see a, a truly good man who has because of his suffers, ill, and we want some compensation or moral understanding, there must some compensation. This compensation order cannot be expected in this life. Therefore, we are, as modern men, we must hope for another one, where those who deserve to be happy are happy. That's, uh, that is the most important argument of Kant. And so he rejected this altogether, and he simply said that uh, he speaks with contempt of those people who want to have a reward for not having betrayed their friends. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. You see, you get that. A man who is not satisfied with acting decently and wants to have, in addition, some uh, money or uh, decoration for that, this is not a decent man. In, in other words, the other life, the mortality of the soul, plays no role anymore in Africa. In it is German, and of course, in Marx, of course, in the video. Whereas I did not mention that for sake of brevity. The, the, interest, the interesting thing in Kant's philosophy of history is this. The reason why Kant did not develop a philosophy of history was the belief in the other man. <coughs> because he found the solution, the satisfaction in the other life. Therefore, the need for a satisfactory solution in this one, i.e. for a politically satisfactory solution, was proportionately small. Mm -hmm. uh, that one can, uh, I think one can prove on the text. Uh, that must suffice for, uh, for, uh, for Hegel. The Hegel, one can say, replaces the concept of having and that of satisfaction. If you are engaged in a satisfactory activity, you are happy. You do not need an additional. Now the free member of a free society who has that job which he has chosen is in this. In, in, the, uh, in the reasonable sense of the word, happy. Now, he may be melancholy and he may not find a woman he loves. That is private. And he has had a contempt for all kinds of things. That's his question. Then he must be a man and uh, live it out. That's his thing. But uh, what you can expect as a rational being from social society is, is that you are recognized in your human dignity by the law. And that the society is, so is free in the sense that you can choose the profession or job of your colleagues for which you are fit and for which you have a life. And even that was, of course, only imperfectly uh, true, but that thing regarded as something which has no problem. We want, in this respect, we want a community model society, you know, with, with a hierarchy. Roughly corresponding to the hierarchy of a king. The other thing is that's fine. Just if someone, someone loses a uh, 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 child, I guess that is, that is not a problem which can be solved by uh, anything but by the fortitude of the individual who suffered the religion. Nothing else can be said about that. Uh, yes. yes. Did Hegel himself reconcile the seeming contradiction between his just society and the need for a stabilizing instrument, uh, the need for government? That he did sure. That he, he took care of that all right. Uh, the government uh, cannot be dependent on the popular will that he rejected us. One can say this. Uh, what he really did in this respect has a great thing, I mean, it's not very original, it, it has a very great similarity to Burke's. The character and the need of government is not deducible 
from the right side. According to the simple right, as I recommend Dr. Nasheri and Thomas Paine, for example, <coughs> it, uh, it is essential for the legitimacy of government to be elected by all who have the same rights of men. Rights of all different percent, rights of men, and political rights are coextensive. That is a, a cross exaggeration. But, uh, Everyone who has the rights of them has by this very fact the full rights of a member of the soil. That is denied. That is denied by Bergen and by Hegel. Because the fact is that it only takes a Hopkins formula, the right of self-preservation does not guarantee that you are the best judge of the means to your service. You have a right to the means of your self-preservation, if you have the right to self-preservation. But that does not mean that you are the best judge of these means. Hence, government cannot be simply public. And how Hegel tries to construct it is along that he tries to do in the most elaborate form in his philosophy of life. And the form which he took was uh, and, and he wanted to have a kind of representation, but that was much closer to what came to be called in our century the corporate state than the democracy. And it is really, it meant, of course, then, at the top of the world, a hereditary monarch as kind of yeah. in a fantastic construction. And he uh, brings about this conclusion. But the, nevertheless, the nerve of Hegel's political doctrine, if one uh, is not. I forget what's a pavilion by these adaptations to the terms I should say, the, the ruling, the elite, the political elite, in this expression, is the estate of intelligence. I mean, there are estates, yeah? In the there is an estate for some of the peasantry. There is an estate of the merchants, the free professions. But there is also an estate of intelligence. And this is the higher civic service. Class universities. That uh, he thought of, uh, of uh, what he had in mind was <coughs> that this would be actually gone by a very conscientious and very highly educated civic service without any regard to the origin, to the origin, I mean, the ability of commerce that they don't cost no role. That is what he demanded. This uh, the nobility he, he adopted, because he had to adopt it, but that is not the essence of the source. The doctrine is that there must be intellectual seat, uh, 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 an institutional seat of public spirited intelligence, and that is to be the uh, what we can call the holder of the things, the property trade, property trade. And of course, Marx, Marx was in this sense, started simply from the democratic tradition. You know, you know, that these fellows are simply, uh, can at best be technicians, you know, spes, as they were called by many, and uh, they can't show in their own right. Yes, that must be Marx's. Yes. Does Hegel or any of the other philosophers mentioned attempt to prove, or I think they only assume, that man is rational? And that is a hard question. I would say they regard it as, uh, if I may... Uh, self-evident, that yeah. they don't prove it. It's not self-evident. Why do you answer? To me, it's... Well, yeah, all right, but why? Well, assuming, uh, because they, they, they define rational, and I define it simply as being able to act on the conclusions of your intellect, or one definition of it. And you find empirical evidence is this isn't true. Or at least define rational, rational as a set of consistent ideas within one person, which you don't find, I'm sure. That is not required, but uh, that didn't mean that you know how foolish, moronic, and vicious, passionate, we all are most of the time, we get the early child like that. But as a good point is this, can any human conduct, however stupid or vicious, 
be understood without this being possessing reason. Can it be understood? So if you look at a mad dog, or even at a non-mad dog, or a duck, and in its first moves, and then you see a human being in its most impossible condition, uh, to intelligence, eating human flesh, and I don't know what you could still, by giving a concrete analysis, and not me, you know, going into it, you would discern the presence of truth. You see, the mere fact that most of these impossible human beings as are speak, yeah, speak, as the social scientists use verbal symbols. That means that the Russian element never meant that all men are always conduct themselves in an absolutely rational manner. No one does. But this is not enough. Uh, men speak. Dogs bark. They communicate. Cats meow. They communicate yeah, but, too. Yeah, but obviously the level of communication. <laughs> <laughs> so there's another reason. That there was there a reason. Yeah, no, but communication is not reason, but, but speech, speech, the presence, I mean, it will, it will, it will, if I may use the Lockean term, which should be an objection, what we want to do, uh, uh, words, apart from the wrong name, stand for abstract ideas. You know, this is what men have, abstract ideas. Three, all of this, are all trees, all. And they may have some more simple shapes, a lot of person has trees. Uh, that is what I meant, or part of what I meant. That is. That's all they mean by it. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, that, uh, but uh, there may be more by that. Since reason is that which is peculiar to man, or since all other peculiarities of man, for example, that he is the only animal which laughs and cries. Yeah? Almost so. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, that, is that a good example? Which other one? Monkey. Laugh. Is it true? Yes. And there are some papers, uh, 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 things which look like laughing. I don't laugh. I, I, well, I saw it. Experiment on it. But I have seen, if you make this, I have seen dogs laughing. But everyone knows me because I communicate. And therefore, that man's perfection yeah, consists essentially in the perfection of his rationality, both theoretically and practically. And then, of course, was elaborated first by Silas David Marister and was still accepted up to his inclusive. There had been some underground murmurings against it, especially in the 18th century. Uh, but it remained to uh, be told, I would say, until uh, he was inclusively. And uh, today, of course, everyone says that Freud has proven that Alison is wrong. Yeah, it's a question uh, whether that is really so, whether the evidence uh, adduced by Freud is of any relevance as far as it's concerned. I'm sorry we have to leave it at that. <laughs> I have to begin with some things that have nothing to do with the subject in hand. The bookstore has notified us to the effect that the German ideology is now in stock. So that uh, on Wednesday of next week, the second of the two papers on the Communist Manifesto is on to the work for the day. Uh, I must say, uh, I regard it as somehow appropriate or suitable that the doctrines of perhaps the most prominent enemy of the division of labor should be treated according to the external circumstance that prevails in this course. That is to say, by a massive division of labor. Uh, I think that this would be simply a, a frivolous remark, except for the fact that there is a most substantial reason 
for our having undertaken to proceed in this way. Uh, let me try to state that reason and the purpose for taking it into view uh, briefly as follows. Economics it can be viewed from outside economics. Uh, it is imaginable that there could be something called uh, meta-economics, as the scientists of science now uh, like to say. Uh, and what point of view one would adopt for viewing economics from outside would be, strictly speaking, essentially different from economics. Uh, someone who looks at economics from outside must, in a manner of speaking, cease to be an economist and must take some other point of view, which I won't uh, uh, try to specify too exactly, but which I think would deserve to be called, uh, if it were adequate, a philosophic point of view. It is, in other words, possible to view economics from outside economics, i.e. from the point of view of philosophy. There's a very real question as to whether philosophy can in its turn be viewed from outside itself adequately. Economics may be viewed adequately, non-economically. I wonder whether philosophy can be viewed adequately from outside without simply ascending to a higher stage or a different level of philosophy. Now, the reason that that question arises is not simply the uh, superficial one that Dr. Strauss has been in the course of treating this question from a non-economic point of view, and I will be uh, presumably treating it from an economic point of view. It isn't only that more or less ad hominem reason that I mention this, but also the character of Marx's doctrines calls that question into view. One could say that what Marx attempted to do was once and for all to get to the bottom of the economic question, to say absolutely and of necessity what is true about the economic relations that exist among human beings and to connect the understanding of the economic relations <clears throat> and the economic facts with the ultimate truths about human society as such. Now, I will, for certain purposes of convenience, refer to this as Marx's project towards the absolutization of economics. His project towards the absolutization of economics, an attempt to state once and for all what economics is about, what it rests upon, and always under the influence of the prepossessing idea that the most real phenomenon of human life is an economic phenomenon. I think that without this predisposition or without this preconception, the attempt to absolutize economics, at least in the way in which Marx did it, would have been impossible, or at least uh, unlikely even as a, an attempt. Marx, as you know, said in a number of places that the, the truly real uh, underpinning of human life is the set of circumstances of production, what it is that really lies at the bottom of social existence, and not only social existence, but the inner life of individual men as well. Now, Marx was not the first man to have raised the economic question. The economic question was raised repeatedly. The economic question was raised from the beginning of speculation on political philosophy as we have any record of it. It is a matter of some interest to us to note the course of the progress or regress or at any rate the, the motion towards this effort to absolutize economics, to try to raise, in other words, the question, what are the alternative modes of raising the economic question? Try to understand what has been traditionally, to begin with, and then in more modern times, the articulation of the economic and the supra-economic questions as they were at one time thought to exist. It goes without saying that if the effort to absolutize the economic problem or to absolutize economics should succeed, then references to the supra-economic 
would be out of order. So to begin with, we notice this fundamental distinction. The economic question was traditionally raised in the context of political philosophy, with the understanding that political philosophy somehow supervened over economics, and economics found a home or a place within a much wider horizon of speculation about the human things, the understanding being that the widest speculation on human things did not fundamentally rest upon a reality which was reducible to the economic relations. Now, uh, we could, I suppose, have begun with uh, some reference to Plato, say in the Republic, where at the outset, not literally in the first pages, but uh, very near the beginning of the substantive discussion, as apart from the, the setting of the dialogue, there is discussion of what we might call the economic considerations, the mode of life, the mode of production and consumption that would have prevailed in that highly moral but not very intelligent and far from commodious community which later on is called with some irritation by one of the protagonists, the city of pigs. And we could, by following the course of Plato's argument, through surely uh, books eight and nine uh, see the interweaving of the economic motifs with the uh, consideration of political philosophy on the highest plane, and that would serve our purpose very well. But for certain reasons, I prefer to speak of Aristotle's point of view in this respect, because, uh, well, for certain reasons, let me say. Now, Aristotle referred to the economic themes in three places, particularly. Uh, in the first place, in Politics, Book One, primarily, but not only in the first book of the Politics. Also, in Ethics, Book Five, Nicomachean Ethics, Book Five, uh, what are now called Chapters Five and Six. Uh, I would point out to you, incidentally, that in the first the, the first locus is obviously a place in which Aristotle is discussing political themes. The Nicomachean Ethics is not throughout a book on politics, obviously, but as it happens, that portion of Book 5, where Aristotle deals with uh, economic questions and particularly with value theory in the modern sense, that part of Book 5 is on the question of justice, a, uh, let's say for the time being, a political virtue. Now in the third place, in the third place, econo uh, economics is discussed, or economic themes are raised by Aristotle in a book called the Economica, which it wouldn't be profitable for us to make much reference to here. Among other things, the text is difficult in the technical sense. And there is some question as to how much of the economic was written by Aristotle and so on. And some evidence, internal evidence, points to the necessity that some part of it was written by one of the successors of Aristotle. Now, it would be impossible for me to summarize the doctrines of Aristotle with respect to the economic things. I only mean to give you some notion of the broad outline and how it might bear on our subsequent discussion. Aristotle takes as his modus vivendi the recurrence to the beginnings. And he says that things are well understood, or perhaps best understood, by resorting to the origins of them. Not exclusively, but begin with the beginnings. One cannot end with the beginnings. One must only begin with them. If one properly understood that remark, I think we could simply stop now and say, after five minutes of deep reflection on that observation, you would have it, and it wouldn't be necessary to go any further. But uh, unfortunately, or, or for better or worse, that's not a, a feasible proceeding, and we have to pursue the thought a bit. Aristotle begins with the beginnings, and in this respect, uh, he might remind you of, say, Locke. Uh, Locke also begins with the beginnings. And Hobbes, <coughs> uh, not the beginning of man, but the primary or proto-condition of man. Rousseau begins with the beginnings. 
And in a certain manner of speaking, Marx also begins with the beginnings. Now, these men end in very different places, although they all apparently concede that it is indispensable that one understand what eventually happened in the light of how it started and then came about. Why does Aristotle deal with the question of the beginnings? It isn't, for example, for the sake of proving that there is a, an inalienable right of men to the means of preservation, and that as Locke thought it necessary to point out, but as, Locke, as Aristotle would have thought it absolutely absurd to dwell on, man has a right to the things which occur in the natural environment surrounding him. I think if you reflect for a moment, you'll notice Locke had to give some attention to the articulation of man and nature because the, the scheme of thought which dominated the reflection on these matters in the time of Locke was very much affected with a teaching regarding the relation of man and nature as overhung by supernature. Now, in a certain way, this question didn't come up for Aristotle. In other words, it was not necessary for Aristotle, as it was necessary or desirable for Locke, to show that man had an immediate right to the natural things, that the articulation of man and nature, in other words, had to be proved in the light of a contrary teaching, which ran generally to the effect the right of man to the natural things was derivative from a certain act of donation that somehow or other there supervened over the common framework of man and nature, a supernature which uh, essentially governed. So we can say Aristotle's beginnings are not affected by the need to prove the articulation, the at-homeness, so to speak, of man in the natural context. That is taken for granted in one respect, but it is not taken for granted simply. <clears throat> the way in which the complication with respect to man's articulation in the natural whole is raised is through the notion of necessity, of need. Now, this is not perhaps the best place to speak of the ambiguity that resides in the term necessity. Well, I'll only mention it. When we say that certain things are necessary for man, we mean in the common sense that without them, his life would be impossible. Now, since we're spe speaking of Marx and uh, in the background Hegel and also Kant, you will immediately be reminded of the fact that necessity has another uh, meaning or bearing. That is to say, if it is true that A exists, whatever A is, A might be some condition of man or it, it might be some proposition, some assertion or whatever. If it is true that A is, then necessarily it must be true that B either is also, or which is much more interesting, will be sometime. This uh, sense of necessity, it is important to keep in mind because as you know, this arises uh, for Marx and has very much to do with the solution, uh, not to say the presentation of the economic problem. The economic problem for Marx is connected with a necessity that has transformed the necessity of the following of Proposition B by Proposition C with the following of some historical condition B by some historical condition C in the same ineluctable and inevitable way. Now, it goes without saying, or perhaps it doesn't go without saying, it should be said. Aristotle it, it speaks of necessity in the former sense and not in the latter sense. Man is confronted with certain needs which affect his life in the most profound ways. The notion that how man makes a living, or what acts of production he does and must engage in, that was not discovered by Marx. It would be an amazing thing if the world had to wait until the middle of the 19th century 
for somebody to observe that how people make their living has an effect on them, and a very deep and profound effect. Uh, this was known, of course, uh, to Adam Smith. Some of you will be aware of his animate versions on the organization of society under the principle of the division of labor. Uh, it was not Marx who discovered for the first time that when a man is set to doing some petty job and he spends his whole life at it, that this is likely to have some effect on him. And uh, that moreover, if he has to spend all his time in, in, a, in an office, in a sedentary occupation, thinking of nothing but calculations of gain and loss, uh, that this might affect his, his character. This was not uh, the discovery of the 19th century. Uh, uh, not a very long time ago. Now, Aristotle asserts that the manner of living, the way of making a livelihood, is of great importance for the characters of the men. He gives the examples of the nomads, uh, the shepherds, the agrarians, the hunters, and so on and so forth, and uh, apparently deduces nothing much from that. It is not Aristotle's point, in other words, that the manner of production leads ineluctably to a certain character of men, but uh, rather something different, which it is my purpose from here on, while discussing Aristotle, uh, to speak about. Yeah, what is the lesson that Aristotle means to teach by speaking of man's articulation with the natural whole and man's being confronted by necessities which he can only overcome by doing acts of production. Aristotle makes his way into the discussion of the question by some observations about nature. In this respect, he differs from Marx, who I mention only in passing. The number of reflections by Marx on the extent to which the solution of the problem is affected by some nature of man or some connection of man with a natural surrounding, that's a very small extent. And the reason for that, as you know, is that in a certain way, nature was replaced by something else in the Marxian formulation, say for the time being, by some process called history. But that, of course, doesn't exist for Aristotle. And what Aristotle, Aristotle is perfectly well aware of the fact that there is history, that is to say that events succeed each other and that there are rises and falls of empires and that there are follies and, and vices and crimes and so on and so forth. And even that there is a principle that underlies this succession of events. But still it doesn't add up to a necessity in the historical sense that I spoke about before, but rather the governing necessity is that much more simple and immediately visible one, man somehow having to exist in a natural environment. Now, what is the connection between this natural environment and the human beings who somehow or other have to find their home in it and exist in it? The problem is complicated by the fact that they don't simply live in it, but they are themselves an essential part of it. Man doesn't simply live in nature, but man is himself a manifestation of nature. And then the question arises, how provident has nature been, or how provident is the natural order in taking care, so to speak, of its own? There is the, the vast surrounding, the, the heavens above and the earth and the waters and the birds and the bees and all this innumerable congeries of things, and man in the middle of it. Uh, Aristotle's formal teaching is, nature is benevolent and means the good of man. The things which are here have been put here for the sake of man. Uh, almost going so far really as to say that, that, that all the animals are present for the sake of contributing to man's well-being, his preservation, his life, and so on which is a manifest absurdity. Because if one reflects for only a moment on the, the, the variety of animals, the, the fleas and the lice and the, 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 uh, the vipers and the, the, the serpents and toads and all this kind of thing, not to mention wild animals who can hardly ever become of any use uh, to man, uh, then it becomes clear 
that however it might be true in some sense that there is an economy of nature and that man fits with a perfect articulation into this natural whole. The sense in which that is true is not the simple sense that nature provides for man. Nature provides for man in the sense that there is a great mass of material, let's say of unformed material, and it is necessary for man somehow or other to appropriate, to make of, of himself those things in a way or in ways which are not strictly prescribed to him by uh, nature as immediately visible. We could even go further. We could say that when man confronts nature in the course of satisfying his needs, then he finds that nature is indeed uh, helpful in some ways, but it's a very tough enemy in other ways. Very tough, has to be overcome. The soil is rocky, infertile. Nature is frivolous in the way in which it provides the, the fertilizing materials. Sometimes it rains and sometimes it doesn't. Frost comes too soon and kills off the crops. <coughs> uh, the birds come and eat. The birds can be used for food, but the birds have ways of adapting themselves to certain acts of men. And they, they reverse this natural process. Then there are, there are the various blights and so on. Everyone knows that the farmer's life is very difficult, and Aristotle recognizes this, speaks of it. And if one thinks of it, one can see the potential enlargement of this theme, of the difficulties that nature confronts man with, so that one could say, not only in this visible and external sense is it true that the benevolence of nature with respect to man is a rather <coughs> qualified or equivocal benevolence, but that there is a certain sense in which viewing man's <coughs> own interior construction, uh, nature might even be said to be at odds with him. His own nature, representing a kind of inner conflict, showing the respects in which he may even be thought of as not a simple being, but as a compounded being, the parts of which may even be thought of as being at war with each other. Now, to speak more concretely, it was uh, not only peculiar to the Aristotelian teaching, but perhaps even more massively uh, uh, conspicuous in the Platonic teaching that man is a compounded being, uh, not a simple thing, and that the elements so compounded live in a, a rather uneasy equilibrium, and that that equilibrium is subject to pressures, and uh, that is where the question becomes most interesting for our purposes. What is the level on which this equilibrium of the elements of that compounded being will eventually occur? What is the level? Now, I can't go into the details, but uh, let me try to put it this way. Aristotle apparently understood human life as taking its character from the human being, from the nature of the human being. The human being is a absolutely unique combination of things which are unchanging and things which are changing, of the, the eternal and the semi-eternal on the one side, and of the transitory, the things that come into being and pass away on the other side. The human problem could be said to be reducible or to be expressible as the question, how to achieve the articulation of those two elements, those two kinds of things which seem to have nothing to do with each other, the eternal and semi-eternal on the one side, and on the other side, those things which come into being and pass away, which are united in man as in no other being of which we have any knowledge. This is, if I may recur to the question that was raised last time, a way of approaching the matter of what is meant by the rationality of man. Somebody asked last time uh, whether man was, uh, what, what's meant by the rationality of man and so on and so forth. I would say that if one understood, at least from Aristotle's point of view, this, uh, this linking, of those two extraordinary, uh, that extraordinary linking of these two elements, then one would understand a bit at least what the ancients meant by the notion that man is really the unique 
animal in virtue of his rationality. But now, to come back, what uh, does this imply for the Aristotelian teaching with respect to economics and politics? <laughs> I would say that Aristotle seems to teach that the solution of the human problem, so far as there is a solution of it, is the articulation or the joining of those two elements in their proper relation, not as if they were equal the one to the other, but as if one must inevitably govern the other. Now, when the ancients, and Aristotle particularly, looked around at the circumstances of human life as, all, as almost all men lived it, and indeed as almost all men have lived it since, they noticed what actually occurs, what might be said to be the reality, doesn't conform quite to this uh, perfect articulation. And then they were confronted with the need to satisfy themselves that what they were asserting as the solution of the human problem was, uh, in fact, as represented, namely the solution of the human problem. Now, if that would lead us very far afield if I were to try to say on what grounds it could be asserted that a solution is really a solution, although it almost never uh, comes into sight. <clears throat> that would be a very difficult and long procedure. But it wouldn't be necessary. For our present purposes, let me put it more dogmatically. Man is confronted with this necessity. He must face it according to the manner of what he is. He is this strange conjunction of the two elements that live so uneasily side by side or contained in his little frame. What is the manner of his producing the solution of this question? The solution of the question of the broad articulation for most men of these two uh, uneasily coexisting elements is political life. That's what's meant by politics. What is, the, what is the basis of politics? The basis of politics is a certain kind of human making, a certain kind of human production done under the palladium of an overriding phenomenon which is not made by man. So there is a kind of human production which goes on underneath the aegis of what is not humanly produced. The things which are humanly produced might be said to be the conventions and what all that implies, what opinions, uh, notions, and beliefs either underlie the conventions or are generated by the conventions. Those conventions are the basis of political life. So common life, political life, that is the, the solution of the human problem for most men. It can't be otherwise. <clears throat> uh, there is a solution of the human problem in another sense. And I think uh, probably everybody understands this, that uh, philosophy was plainly said by Aristotle to be superior to politics uh, and, and, and the life of making money and so on. Uh, where our attention is therefore directed sooner or later to the fact <coughs> that there is a solution of the human problem which transcends politics. But that is a solution for, for exceptions, for a numerically unimportant infinitesimal fraction of all human beings. For most men, most times, in most places, there is a solution which begins and ends with political life. And that is brought about by human deeds, by a kind of human production. And there is no higher solution for most men. Now, it might appear to you as if what I'm saying is going to be made the basis of a, of a remark that Marx and Aristotle really had a great deal in common that acts of production are really underlying the solution of the human problem for Marx. That he says plainly in the German ideology and in the Communist Manifesto and everywhere else. And also that Aristotle believed that some act of human production that was really the solution of the human problem, the most real. I think that one could make that case only if one neglected the qualification that the solution of the human problem for Marx depended upon this absolutization of economics, that's say the understanding of production in a certain sense, not only the production of conventions, this figurative act, 
of human generation. But uh, the gross uh, making, the doing of the daily deeds by all men, all the time, that is a very different kind of act of production. What Aristotle meant by the, the supreme, supreme act of human production in the political context was something which could be done by very few men, by the great benefactors of the humankind, as he himself calls them. The men who are in a way responsible for the, the elevation of human beings out of their proto-human condition, out of what he did not call, but what Locke and Hobbes called the state of nature, into the state of civil society, i.e. civilization. Civilization and, and living in cities, or living in political bodies, this, these two things mean the same thing. So the kind of production which was had in mind by Aristotle is, of course, a very different kind of production from what was had in view by, uh, by Marx. This is uh, true in a variety of ways. In addition to that, Marx's solution eventually degenerates, uh, so to speak, into uh, an abstention from politics. So that in curious ways, the absolutization of the economic leads to a dispensing with political life in the famous formula, the withering away of the state. For Aristotle, it would, be, it would have been regarded as, as an, an absolute a nightmare, as nothing but a, a, a fantasy, a wandering of the mind. The idea of beings such as human beings are, that is to say, compounded beings, not, not all rationality, and therefore not all equal, but beings affected with all those uh, subtractions from rationality, which the incorporation of the mind in a body necessarily involves. For such beings, the solution of the human problem by an abstention or an abstraction from politics, i.e. the rule of some over others, would have been a fantastic and inexplicable wandering of the imagination. Now, somehow or other, that transition was made and the tradition slowly affected, moved from the doctrines of uh, Aristotle and those under the influence of Aristotle and Plato and so on, slowly, but with a, an accelerating velocity, beginning in the time, roughly, of the 16th, 17th centuries. Now, but to give you one example, but only an example, of the sense in which one could speak of, it's nothing but a specimen, and I'll recur to it later on, uh, the sense in which one could speak of Aristotle's supreme contempt, ultimately, for those things which came to be regarded as the heart and the core of social science in the age of the absolutization of the economics. To give you only one specimen, I'll refer you to, uh, in fact, I'll read this uh, passage from the Nicomachean Ethics, which is in Book 5 and is 1133b, uh, uh, approximately 14, uh, about 10 and following. I'm introducing this a bit out of order, but in a certain sense, any organization would be imperfect. If I omitted it at this point, then I'd have to remind you of all these things later on. And if I read it now, then the full context of the later discussion obviously won't be available, but that's, uh, it can't be helped. We will be talking later on about the expression of Marx's absolutizing of economics in a form of theory of value. Now, everybody who has had any exposure at all to uh, uh, modern economics will know that there is a part of economic theory now prevailing which is called value theory sometimes. Much more often it's called price theory. The fact that the term value theory can be and is in ordinary speech often replaced by price theory points to the obvious fact. Uh, value and price are now regarded as being substantially indistinguishable the one from the other. The meaning of that is that people now tend to deny professionally, they do flatly deny, that there is such a thing as the value of a commodity or of a thing, uh, irrespective of its price. 
it uh, comes to have a price, let's say uh, supply and demand, and then uh, that's about the extent of it. That's about as much as you can say. Now, uh, this was not discovered by modern economists. This was discovered by Hobbes, at least. Uh, there is a brief passage in the Leviathan in which it becomes perfectly clear that this is what he means, that the value of something depends exclusively on what the buyer of it is willing to give for it. And if his needs press on him, then in a certain way, it's an unwarranted interference with his right to preserve himself and the right to exercise his judgment, which is better in his affairs than the, that of a privy counselor could be, uh, with respect to the worth of this thing to him at the time. That leads more or less directly to the notion that the, the distinction between value and price, if value is objective, and price is uh, subjective, uh, it disappears. Now, here is what I think is perhaps Aristotle's most uh, succinct expression of his value theory. It contains a passage, or is in the close, but it contains a passage which Marx quotes in Das Kapital in order to show that although Aristotle was in many respects a very intelligent fellow, yet there was some things that he couldn't understand because the state of society surrounding him somehow blinded him to facts that came to view later on. Uh, now, uh, this is Aristotle. Now, money serves us a, as a guarantee of exchange in the future. Supposing we need nothing at the moment, it ensures that exchange shall be possible when a need arises for it meets the requirement of something we can produce in payment so as to obtain the thing we need. Money, it is true, is liable to the same fluctuation of demand as other commodities. I would tell you parenthetically that's a rather sophisticated idea. The notion of the demand for money, as you know, has played some part in the formulations of Keynes and other people, and has even thought to affect the rate of interest, and therefore the price of money. That, maybe, is precisely what uh, Aristotle had in mind here, maybe. Let me repeat that, uh, that last sentence. Money, it is true, is liable to the same fluctuation of demand as other commodities, for its purchasing power varies at different times. But it tends to be comparatively constant. Hence, the proper thing is for all commodities to have their prices fixed. This will ensure that exchange and consequently association shall always be possible. Money then serves as a measure which makes things commensurable and so reduces them to equality. If there were no exchange, there would be no association. And there can be no exchange without equality and no equality without commensurability. Though, therefore, it is impossible for things so different to become commensurable in the strict sense our demand furnishes a sufficiently accurate common measure for practical purposes. That's the end of the quotation. Uh, he continues, and there is some interesting matter uh, on the relation of the uh, exchange relay ratio of beds and houses and so on and so forth, but those of you who are reading Capital and all of you sooner or later will, will know that uh, Marx takes that up, and uh, then you'll be familiar with the, the, the reference. Now, what is the teaching? It would be very hard to make out of this the foundation for a whole social structure, I think. What Aristotle is saying is essentially men have needs. I assume now the division of labor, they help each other to satisfy their needs. That means exchange is necessary. Adam Smith repeated this long elaboration. It's all contained in a few sentences here. Now, what will be the terms on which people will exchange one thing for another. It's very hard to establish this. Uh, a bed is not a house. If it's a question of exchanging one house for another, it's uh, comparatively easy. If you look at the two, and it might turn out that uh, they simply, the two men swap, and that's it. But uh, a bed, it's very different from a house. How do you, how do you know that a, a house is worth five beds? Is there something intrinsic to beds and houses that leads this to be true? Uh, Aristotle says, no, the fundamental question is really uh, how much people need the two things. It sounds uh, a bit uh, hobbyian. And as for their being commensurable on the basis of some objective link, such as Marx was at infinite pains to draw out 
and which, without which he would have been unable to proceed, incidentally, as you know. That's why there is a later theory of value in Marx. There, but for, for Aristotle, there is no such link between the two. He, we might say, to use somewhat later language, it's altogether an empirical question. Uh, how much one thing comes to be worth in terms of another? It depends on how much the people are willing to give. There is a general tendency towards practice of a certain kind rather than another in a given community, but that's it. You can't go any further. And he says, that is sufficient for practical purposes. Now, I would tell you that the entire science of economics would simply collapse if that uh, notion were to be adopted, taken seriously, by uh, professional economists now. <coughs> yeah, it would be impossible. No, there must be some, some scientific principle by which the articulation of the commodities can be, uh, can be understood. Aristotle does not regard this as a necessity. Modern social science regards it as absolutely necessary. Without some understanding that goes beyond the mere remark, this is good enough for practical ordinary purposes, without some understanding that goes beyond that and that rests on a scientific basis, which means ultimately in modern life a mathematical basis, it is thought that there is no such thing as a proper understanding. And now, let me tell you what I think this means, skipping a great many uh, steps in the meantime. In order for there to be what I hope I'll be able to explain as the absolutization of, econ of economics, there must be a science of economics. It can't be left in the realm of merely empirical things, merely empirical things, without some trans-empirical or uh, let me say, abstract uh, notions, without ideas, without something to go beyond the mere things seen, there would not be a science. Now, I think Aristotle was perfectly willing to face this. I think he believed that uh, there was no need to transcend the empirical in certain respects, uh, particularly with respect to economics, because not that much depended upon it. I will not go into the question of what Aristotle would have answered to the question, is it possible to have a trans-empirical economics? I suspect he, if he were shown the, uh, the demonstrations in modern textbooks, he would have to say, this looks very much like a science. It uh, does indeed. It starts from certain premises. Those are not outrageous. <clears throat> uh, it makes deductions from those uh, premises. Uh, for the most part, those are not fallacious. And then what else is required in order to have a body of information, or information is the wrong word, a body of assertions, which can be called a science. And I suppose Aristotle would be bound to admit such a thing is a possibility. But I believe he would have regarded it as, quote, not necessary, unquote. Whether he would have gone further and said it's positively harmful, I wouldn't undertake to say. But the non-necessariness of such a science, the willingness to leave it at those empirical rules of thumb, is, I believe, part of what we could properly call uh, Aristotle's unwillingness ever to depreciate the political as really what supervenes over the circumstances of human life. The government of the relations between men can never fall out of the hands of men. I believe this is what uh, Aristotle meant. Government of men is always by men. What's the alternative to that? Well, there is a very common formulation in modern times to the effect, not men, but laws must govern. That is not usually asserted in the context or in the sense that I now have in mind, it's perfectly true, but still it is both relevant and useful from the point of view of what we're now discussing. Laws are not only those things which have been enacted by legislators, but there are also such laws as the laws of thermodynamics and the laws of motion and the law of gravity and so on and so forth. Now, there came a time when men fell increasingly under the influence of the idea that laws of economics are, are quite similar to the laws of motion, that, and to be more precise, that there are natural laws 
But the natural laws are not natural laws in the same sense, let's say, in which Cicero might have believed, or St. Thomas Aquinas. But that the, in other words, that the natural laws are not primarily moral laws, but that the natural laws are primarily the laws of motion. Now, it happens by some reflection, if one considers what man was to begin with, how he advances out of the condition in which he was to begin with, what he makes of himself, in other words, the story of the transition from the state of nature to the state of civil society, and the grounds on which that transition rests, then you see that man is in a way driven. He's moved. He has emotions. They are the source of his motion. His emotions, where we now call them, they used to be called uh, passions in some part of this literature. There should be a, a law of man's inner motions in the same way there is a, a law of his outer motions as a heavy body. Let's say, if you were to drop uh, two men from the top of the leaning tower of Pisa, although they one weighed 150 pounds and the other weighed 300 pounds, then we're told by certain formulations that they ought to arrive at the surface of the ground about the same time. Now, so if it's possible to speak of laws of motion with respect to, to man externally, because he fits into the natural order and he forms no exception to the way in which things other than himself behave. What about this more interesting aspect of human beings? They have not only an exterior motion, but an interior motion. In fact, what else is their life generally? except some manifestation of the interior motions. What is there about a man which isn't susceptible of motion? When uh, such people as Hobbes and Locke looked around, they had great trouble finding something which was not susceptible of motion. Now, I know this is a very perplexed question, surely with respect to Locke, because when you read the essay concerning human understanding, of course there are many repetitions of the assertion that there are spiritual beings, and that, that man is not matter alone, and so on and so forth. But then when you try to understand what effect this might have on human life, or in what way it has any bearing on Locke's formulations with respect to human life, one is more or less at a loss. Now, what is the most interesting, and for our present purposes, most relevant expression of this internalization of the laws of motion? I would say, for our present purposes, the laws of economics, what we now call the law of supply and demand, let's say. Now, in their own way, economists are still interested in this question. They still raise the question, as far as they have traveled from any serious speculation on the grounds of their own discipline, yet they're still interested in this question. Can you repeal the law of supply and demand? If I'm not mistaken, this is even the form in which uh, Samuelson raises the question in that uh, infinitely <coughs> conspicuous uh, textbook on economics. Uh, probably, well, the best textbook, the elementary textbook. Can one repeal the laws of economics? Uh, uh, I beg your pardon, the law of supply and demand, which more generally stated would be, can one repeal the laws of economics? Uh, I won't tell you what his conclusion is. That's beside the point. But the uh, question still raised. <laughs> Why does, uh, yeah, his, well, I will tell you, generally speaking, he thinks that, that maybe you can go pretty far in repealing them. That has to do with a certain tendency nowadays called liberalism in the current sense, which is to say, in other words, that we don't have to be blindly under the influence of the laws of supply and demand, but that something other than the, the brutal market may also have some effect on how we rule our affairs, and I dare say that is uh, one way or another true. Now, where does this originate? Uh, this notion that there is a question with respect to these laws of nature, i.e. the laws of interior motion of man, i.e. the laws of economics. Where does that originate? Well, I wouldn't undertake to say uh, positively because it, it could be that uh, I simply don't know of a previous, of a prior uh, source to Locke's monetary essays. But I know surely that, they are, uh, that that notion arises there, say roughly in the 1670s and thereabouts. For Locke states, Locke was born in 1632, he was very reticent and didn't publish anything until he was an elderly man, practically. And then, so it's hard to say exactly when his notions developed. It's not very important. Sometime towards the last half of the 17th century, 
Locke has developed the idea that there are laws of economics. They are, they are really natural laws. <clears throat> they are the law, the law or laws of supply and demand. He uses the terminology quantity and event. Uh, those do not correspond, strictly speaking, to supply and demand, but in roughly they do. And the way in which Locke opens his discussion that leads into that question is uh, uh, substantial. Well, he asks the question in some considerations on raising the, the value of money and lowering the rate of interest. He asks the question, can this be done by law? Now, let me tell you very crudely what was the proposal. Uh, there was a certain difficulty in England at the time with respect to the monetary metals. They saw that they, they had, uh, I suppose it must have been an adverse trade balance, and bullion had a tendency to flow out. Now that was awkward. And so some, uh, because they were constantly being drained of their monetary metal, it made the carrying on of commerce difficult, or so it appeared to them. Now, their thoughts were not absolutely consistent in this respect. Because at the, on the one hand, uh, such men as Locke developed the notion that there is a certain amount of money which naturally fills the channels of commerce in a community at a given time. And how much is needed will find its way there, and that's, uh, that's it. A forerunner of the international gold standard doctrines as they came to be developed in the 19th century and, uh, and are, are clung to with uh, a desperate affection by a small and diminishing number of uh, human beings even to this day. Now, so then there is the idea on the one hand that there is a, a certain amount of money which is appropriate to the level of commerce, but on the other hand they were conscious of some difficulties and they realized that the money would tend to flow out even though it should have stayed there if the amount of traffic called for that amount, and then incidentally, if money flowed out, they should have regarded it with equanimity, because uh, that would be a kind of proof that they didn't need any more than what was remaining. But somehow it didn't quite seem to them like that, and they, they took pains to, uh, to prevent the draining away of their money supply, which only shows that the common sense will win out uh, over almost all obstacles sooner or later. Now, some of the, the suggestions that were made to, uh, to rectify this unsatisfactory monetary situation included the following. In the first place, to do something with the, the coinage system, which we would call now devaluation. That is to say, to take a, a, an ounce of silver and instead of forming it into 12 pieces of money, form it into 18 pieces of money. Now, you might have to add a little something else uh, to each piece in order so that people won't lose the, the little uh, the coin. They get so small after a while, but, but that has, the, the devices for doing that have been known for hundreds, I mean, literally thousands of years, and so that was no obstacle. The, the technology of the coinage was well in hand. The only question was, what about the principle? Now, Iraq asserted that this is a piece of nonsense to do this kind of thing, <clears throat> that you can't make, you cannot legislate. There is no human legislation by which the, the character, the fundamental character of the coinage, i.e. its value, can be tampered with. It can't be done. These things follow a kind of natural course. You cannot, it for the same reasons, yeah, incidentally, I should say, that he not only argued that you cannot, but he very strongly argued that you ought not. But Locke was a very complicated man, and on some occasions he was known to argue, as for example, against the censorship of printed matter in England, argue against it altogether on the grounds of expediency, whereas uh, it was some other considerations that he really had in view, and he is known to have presented the argument in the form which he regarded as being the most compelling, which only shows that he was the same man, that if he had a certain number of human beings before him whom he wanted to convince, and arguments of type A through X wouldn't do it, but uh, Y and Z would, then he would be very willing to ignore the fact that there are 24 good ones and two bad ones if the two bad ones would do the work. It turned out that he was very ingenious in the application of this method and apparently succeeded 
in, in killing the last proposal for censorship of printed matter in England that has ever been raised, and uh, on that kind of uh, reasoning. So, uh, well, now, in this case, I would say Locke presents both kinds of arguments, but the arguments with respect to the ought not really turn out to be rather weak. And it almost self-contradictory. There, there, you might not believe me, but I refer you to the, to the early part of uh, some considerations. There is repeated reference to the widows and orphans. Uh, we now take that to be somehow a, a, you know, a stock quip in speaking of, of uh, commercial practices uh, appealing to the, the conscience of uh, acquisitive men by reminding them of widows and orphans. Now, uh, he literally did that, and he pointed out that there are quite a few uh, uh, widows and orphans, and in fact, to believe him, you'd think that the England was uh, nine-tenths populated with uh, 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 widows and orphans who would be uh, desperately affected by the measures which were then proposed. But those are very quickly dropped, and the widows and orphans, if I remember exactly, are not mentioned after something like page four or five of a very uh, extensive work, and thereafter he gets down to business, and he shows that the attempts to do these things simply must fail. There is a law of supply and demand, it's what he develops at great length. That's the law that really governs. To try to reduce the rate of interest, that's been going on for ages, as you know had been by his time. Uh, there were uh, acres of writings on the, the just price and the just price of money, and on usury, and so on and so forth. Uh, Locke said, oh, you have to find some way by which you can prevent men from giving their goods away before you can effectively control the rate of interest. <clears throat> because a man doesn't borrow unless he somehow or other needs. That's not strictly correct. And after this, soon after this point in the argument, very early, Locke drops that false notion, too. He knew perfectly well that, for the most part, borrowing is not done by men in need. He takes the example of men who need some more money than they have because they might starve or their families won't have it. That's not why most borrowing is done, and he knew it perfectly well. That most borrowing is done for the sake of gain by businessmen in the conduct of their business. Now is then. Is there any way of, uh, of uh, uh, suppressing the rate of interest? No. Locke said exactly the same rules apply with respect to the, the rate of interest as apply with respect to the price level, as apply with respect to the circulation of the coin, as apply with respect to the, uh, the devaluation, the depreciation of the coin. There are certain economic laws. Those are not the proper province of government. The beginning of the transcendence of human rule by the laws of economics is surely uh, visible in the economic writings of Locke. Now, how does this come about? And why, uh, why is it that Locke comes to this point? And incidentally, I might uh, mention, Locke was not the only man who saw the matter as such. Montesquieu, with, with very great delicacy, uh, manages to suggest that he believes the same uh, kind of thing is true. Only in order to mention this to you before we lose sight of the point, Book 20, in the Spirit of Laws, uh, is on the subject of uh, commerce, of laws and the connection which they have with commerce, considered in its nature and its distinctions. Now, that book forms the first part of the second volume of the Spirit of Laws. The second volume opened in some editions with a quotation from Book One of the Aeneid. And that uh, very short line was uh, docuit quae maximus atlas, which by itself doesn't mean very much more than he or who was taught by great Atlas, Atlas the Great. Now, the surrounding material has this general uh, meaning, this long, long-haired Iopus, once taught by mighty Atlas, makes the whole ring with his golden lyre. I wouldn't swear that this is an absolutely uh, satisfactory translation, but I think it, probably, it, it corresponds pretty well with the, the sense of the two verses. 
Now, why this reference to a great atlas and what he taught and what he taught the poet, incidentally, in this context, especially in immediate juxtaposition with Montesquieu's own invocation to the muse. This is the same place where he, he starts the second book with the invocation to the muse. Montesquieu is in the position of the poet in that place, invoking the muse as Homer invoked the muse and as, and as other poets invoked the muse. He was like this long-haired musician. I'm sorry, but that's exactly what it says. It's long-haired. I always heard <laughs> taught to uh, play on the golden lyre. And by whom was he taught? By Mighty Atlas, the, the great worker, the man who by the strength of his bent back and broad shoulders kept heaven from earth and made human life possible. The, the prototype, perhaps, of the, the strong back laboring man. One way of looking at Montesquieu's meaning here is that he was really initiated into the laws of nature by thinking about the working of men by their economic life, so to speak. Now, that's not altogether fanciful, as one may easily observe by going on to consider what follows in books 20 and 21 and so on, uh, the books of the spirit of laws in which he deals with the laws of nature. I beg your pardon, with the laws of, of commerce and how commerce must eventually provide a solution of the problem for modern man. Now, uh, so we have then this uh, preliminary or provisional conclusion by a certain transformation of the basis of political philosophy, and it would be absolutely idle, a waste of time for me to go over this. I mean, that was what, I mean, if you bear in mind now what Dr. Strauss said on the first, the first two meetings, and try to assemble that with the, my present remark, then it will make some sense to you. Uh, the, the, that course of development of political philosophy down through the time of the 17th century provided the basis for the realignment of political philosophy and economics. And generally speaking, one could represent this by uh, reference to the two pans of a balance, more and more weight being applied on one side and the other one rising equally into the, uh, into the air. So there is, the analogy breaks down because the one that goes down is more graphic, more heavy, and more solid. That isn't what I meant in this case. What I meant was simply the difference in direction. Political philosophy subsided by an act of its own being, its own decision. It decided of itself. I say more or less in the person of life of value and the claim, having a claim to the value of a thing. Is to take the case of Locke from approximately where we left it in order to introduce this subject. What is it that originates the valuableness of the thing? What, in other words, is the source of the value? I'm not speaking of exchange value. You know, Locke's answer to that is really substantially everything subsumed under the heading the law of supply and demand. That's where the things get their value from, i.e., their price is determined that way. And he was thoroughly modern in the sense of equating the value and the price. <clears throat> it, isn't, it, it isn't labor, as Marx would say. No, Marx made the terrific attempt to eradicate the law of supply and demand and to reduce it to the law of supply. As far as Locke was concerned, this wouldn't have made any sense. It turns out, in fact, that Marx can't live with it either. Uh, we'll see that he must make certain reservations which so much vitiate the labor theory of value that, uh, that some people have raised the question whether anything remains of it afterwards and whether he has not, in effect, been driven back into the same kinds of loosenesses as always perplexed Ricardo, for example and Adam Smith, and surely Locke, although Marx claimed to have got rid of the difficulty. Now, what about the claim to a commodity, to a, a good? And as for that, it's quite clear Locke said yes. In the state of nature, without any question, 
what gives a man a right, a title to a thing, is his having mixed his label with it. But in the first place, he didn't by any means admit that this was also true after the state of nature had been transcended. In the second place, therefore, he didn't show any particularly important consequences to flow for the state of civil society from that fact. <clears throat> now, what I mean by that is this. In the fifth chapter of the second treatise, Locke makes a remark about the things that I mix my label with belong to me. I have a claim to them. Title. And then he goes on to give the example, the turps that my servant has digged, and the grass that my horse has bit, and something else that I myself have done. These three together, they indicate the things to which I have a claim because of having mixed my labor with them. Now, you might say, with respect to the, the grass that his horse has bit, that's very complicated. Uh, in what sense is it true that he has a claim by virtue of labor uh, to the grass that his horse has bit? And I suppose you have to say, well, he owns the horse, and the horse owns the grass. Uh, therefore, because property is a transitive relation, he owns the grass. Now, maybe that could be, I suppose, because you would say, well, the grass contributes to the horse. It's bigger, horse, more horse, and therefore, he simply, he owns the grass and directly, something like this. But do I, you can't get out, you, it makes no sense, whatever, with respect to the, uh, the turfs, or whatever it is, his, his, his servant has digged. Uh, that's not his labor. That's somebody else's inconvenience and irksomeness and so on and so forth. Now, well, the resolution of that is very simple. Apparently, when Locke speaks of my labor, he doesn't mean things I do with my own back uh, or my fingers, but he means that I may purchase labor the same way as I can purchase anything else. And uh, once I've bought it, it's mine. Same as once I've bought the horse, it's mine. Now, I, as it happens under the present circumstances, I don't buy the servant. It's not outright. But I, I, I can buy pieces of him from time to time, meaning by that pieces of his, his service. And then while I've paid him, I have bought him, and he's mine, and what he appropriates becomes mine. Now, uh, and unequivocally, now, if anybody likes to call this a labor theory of value in the sense of my labor being um, what, I, what, what I mix my labor with, becoming mine in virtue of some uh, sanctity of the working of men, uh, then I think he's entitled to do it, but it's only in a very exact sense. So uh, Locke has produced this extension of the doctrine which is very visible in the period of the state of nature and the transition to the state of nature, and he is, is silently taking for granted that it is possible for one man to buy the labor of another and to become the sole owner of those things which are produced by the second man having mixed his labor with something else. So in other words, the whole idea of a man entering into a kind of relation with another man by which the second becomes an instrument for the purposes of the first, only in virtue of a money payment having been made, which is obviously at the basis of Marx's whole understanding of the capitalist society. That is uh, very much uh, present in Locke. Now, the thing that is noteworthy is that while Locke was able to assert that the value of a commodity is, under some circumstances, contributed by labor being mixed with it, and the right to it is, under all circumstances, let's say, derivative from so-and-so's labor having been mixed with it. Yet he did not turn out to have a fully developed uh, labor theory of value of the kind that Marx's whole political and social formulations rest on. Now, we might ask ourselves, why is it that uh, starting with such even apparently similar beginnings, the Locke and Marx wound up so very far apart with respect to their propositions, their proposals uh, for civil society. 
Now, at the present point, I have a, a, a terrific problem. It's five o'clock, and I'm nowhere near. Yeah. And I am make a suggestion. I think if uh, that we uh, devote part of the next meeting to the continuation of your paper, because we are reading now the bits of it, and it's like a serial. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a discussion. I believe we can make it by shortening a bit the discussion of the communist manifesto. And or somehow we can find the evidence. Yeah, well, of course, the, the principal way and mean is really up to me. I, I somehow have to compress this thing. And I even uh, took two lectures about Yeah, but considering the remark with which I began about the relation between philosophy and economics, I... <laughs> well, uh, let me break off at this point, because what I would like to do next is to say something about Adam Smith the respect in which his doctrines are similar to and yet different from those of Locke, also Ricardo, and then uh, to lead up uh, generally to some notions prominent in Marx, and then to conclude with some general observations on the, the modes of raising the economic question that we've been over. But before closing entirely, is there any point that anyone would like to raise an objection as long as you've been? Um, I'm just wondering, so apparently comparing Aristotle and Locke, uh, you're suggesting that for Aristotle, uh, economic factors are conditions which are wise or political men would have to take into account in, in his actions, but which are not in any way determined to finally up his actions. Whereas, well, in what way that in other, in other words, you seem to me to be making a contrast between uh, economics as something to be considered and economics as, as absolutely determinative of politics. Ultimately, I think that in order to save time and avoid all kinds of complications, that would be quite fair, yes. And you are suggesting then that the modern economists would, uh, leaving even Marx out of it for a moment, would uh, postulate that economic conditions do determine uh, political yeah, I think surely that there is a, a, a growing inclination in that direction, very strong. Uh, even if many economists would, would recoil from putting it in those terms for certain external reasons, you know, because it sounds too much like something else, but still, even if they wouldn't put it that way, I think that they would subscribe to the view that there are such things as the laws of economics, and that these have an independent status, and that they are not in the most interesting ways subject to the discretion of public authority, but the public authority must somehow find a modus vivendi with them. Uh, for example, the question of the agricultural surpluses. The ordinary account given by the economists of the government's manner of dealing with the problem of low incomes in agriculture is by an analysis that shows a rectification of the demand schedule and the demand curve on the one side by, by parity things, and then on the other side, a rectification of the supply schedule by your acreage allocations and controls. So that, and I mean, I don't object to this. I think it's probably what uh, is actually the best way to understand it. But yeah, unfortunately, there is a tendency to leave it at that, and then the whole evaluation of policy of agricultural control comes to turn on the efficiency or some other uh, secondary characteristic of the new articulation of the supply and demand schedules. Whereas one might very well say, no, there's an altogether different way of approaching the problem of agricultural relief. You call it that. I mean, it's not a popular way to call it. It's what it amounts to. And that is, uh, what are the rightful claims of the agricultural part of the population with respect to the rest of the population? Is there such a thing as, say, the national character to which some contribution is made by uh, farmers or something like this? Uh, and is it really true that every problem of distribution of the national income is going to have to be settled in the market or primarily in the market? by the operation of the law of supply and demand. I mean, I don't know, maybe the answer to that is yes, but I must say the question is really yes. May I ask you, 
I think I have a special right to raise that because I'm most ignorant of economics of all the people here. Now, I found it very illuminating when you said that that was in the way for me the peak of today's lecture as a confrontation between Aristotle and Marx. In, in Marx, there exists a supremacy of production, yeah. and that is not now in every respect. In every respect. In Aristotle, production is subordinated to something non-produced, certainly not produced by man. Now, there is a connection which you left wisely in a mystery, and so I believe I have seen some of the links. Is in Aristotle, subordination to the subordinate kind of production. Hence, supremacy of the political within the human sphere. Yeah. In Marx, supremacy of production, absolutization of production, hence denial of the ultimate relevance of the polity. That, uh, uh, that, made, uh, that seems to be really uh, true and be very clear. I had a difficulty, I had quite a difficulty when you spoke of the, the passage in the ethics, in our social ethics, and that is linked up strangely with what you said about law. I mean, since the principle of contradiction is valid in spite of Hegel and Marx, so either one of you, only one of us can be right. Now, I always understood Locke to mean that labor is the only natural right title to property. If there is no positive law, the only way in which I can have a right to it is by having mixed my labor with. Since mixing labor with it can be such a lazy test, as I say, but it can also be hard work. But this, uh, this is superseded by the civil law. In, in the civil law, I can own of property without doing anything. I mean, by being the heir, for example. In the heir. Or, sure, a mere gift. A begging, for example, is permitted in civil society unless certain uh, uh, laws, and there even laws against begging, uh, complicates the situation. But in Locke's, there is no mention that strictly speaking of begging possible. Uh, but in any case, it's clear. Labor is a title to property in the state of nature, but no longer the sole title. No longer any title in civil society. If I begin to eat in another man's garden, and, and from morning to the evening, I wasn't giving me a right to right, of course, because I did not have the right to dig in the first place. It was someone else's property. And then it was not his property because he had rolled the ground. And because he had sold it or or, or you know, bought it. <laughs> and I made some very clever activity in the stock market and so which has very little to do with real paper. And so that is clear. But there is one part of, I think that is deliberately done in this, this wonderful fifth chapter. Labor has two functions. A, in the doctrine, as I understand, A is the original title to, uh, to property. B, the sole origin of value. Here we differ, and I must be permitted to state my point. And in this respect, as the sole origin of value, the difference between the state of nature and civil society is irrelevant. And therefore, there's a real McCoy. I mean, the other is no longer valid in civil society, the title of property. Now, what is the point? And I don't remember all the remarks of law, but the crucial sentence runs roughly as follows Nature gives us only the almost worthless materials. It's so you need raw materials. Uh, but they are in themselves practically valueless. You have air is in one sense infinitely valuable. You couldn't live without it for a second. Yeah, that is probably the point where you will try to refuse me later. I see now your point. But still Locke's point, which he makes by using very long songs, you remember the, the threat which we eat, the enormous labor which went into the, the miller and the man who grew the grain and the baker. And, so. and now, the, the, um, labor is the origin of practically all value. It doesn't have to be my labor. 
It must be human labor. It has nothing to do with property law. Uh, but uh, uh, st uh, stated differently, nature is extremely non-beneficent. Man, by his labor, <coughs> is it, who makes things beneficent. Good. Now, this is connected, I mean, uh, before I present the refuted by you, I would like to refer to one point in Aniston which is connected with that. And that is a question of uh, what you said in regard to the fifth book of ethics and the demand as a common denominator of all things which are exchanged. Yeah, that is surely true. And there are certain problems in this in which I will go ahead on later occasion. But you see, now, what about the, the price, the just price, the key notion, not only in Aristotle, but the whole scholastic tradition up to Locke's time? Now, I do not remember the moment whether, Locke, whether Aristotle says so or whether only Thomas Aquinas says so in his commentary. But I would say, even in the latter case, I believe Thomas Aquinas in the terms is correct. When he gives the example of the shoemaker and physician or whatever the, oh no, it's a house builder. Now, what is, how do we determine the price? And uh, 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 Thomas certainly answers there are two elements which have to be considered. One is the cost of the raw material, and B, uh, the work, the work. I mean, and really the work is different if it's a very skilled worker, you know, that is work at a higher value than if it's merely carrying for So, some product of cost of the raw material and the work involved gives you the just price. That implies, and that implication surely understands, the just price is something which may very well have to be regulated by law. And if some uh, greedy speculators try to exploit uh, situations, you know, uh, scarcity, uh, that is, can very well be made punishable. And that is, whereas from the supply demand point of view, that ceases to be meaningful. Yeah. I mean, there seems to be a certain uh, yeah, you know, there's a point connected with it, which I mentioned only as something which we might have to take up. When Aristotle says in this part, uh, remark in Book 5, that the homogeneous medium by virtue of which all things become exchangeable, a house and a bed is to use, is this I thought not so very good because a carpenter is involved in both cases. So the house and the shoe we might take. If it is not so, he makes a high power. So the house, the, all right, the house is the bed then. And the homogeneous element in which all these heterogeneous things become unchangeable is according to Aristotle the need. According to the modern doctrine, if I can understand you, uh, um, the master doctrine, it is labor. Now, this contradiction between need as a fundamental phenomenon. And labor as a fundamental phenomenon seems to me incredibly suggestive. You know? Whether you start from man's need or whether you start from man's production, his labor. I think the whole world right that. But I would like to hear my refutation. Well, I'm not so sure it's a refutation. I think in a certain, up to a certain point, I believe I believe that we don't really disagree so much with respect to whether it is only labor in law. Yeah, but he, he wishes to say only labor, and, but he can't say it. Therefore, the compromise is almost worse than labor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he has this problem, if I understand him correctly. There is a, a, a disproportion between Locke's formulation with respect to man altogether as opposed to nature, number one. And on the other side, this man and that man with respect to the other man yeah. in that same relation. Now, with respect to all men taken together, uh, confronted by their needs and by the natural external, I, I'm sure that there is no answer other than labor. It's only labor that... Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. That would be another way to put it, yes. <laughs> but, but when you talk about this man and that man, then it turns out that really supply and demand is uh, uh, yeah. But I think that fundamentally I could uh, agree with what you said because just as that needfulness of human labor to be mixed with the natural things transcends the transition from the state of nature to the state of civil society, so also does the law of supply and demand transcend, because that's as much a natural law, I dare say, as the law of the rotation of the heavenly bodies. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I, I, believe. I believe well, as well as I understand it, that's the case. And so therefore one could say they have equal status as being superior to that transition, but they apply in two different directions. Uh, what about the yeah. Uh, yeah, I believe so. I uh, I took one short passage, which is which I read exactly mostly mostly because it surrounds the thing that Marx himself makes quite a bit of in Capital when he showed, tries to show the shortcomings of the Aristotelian understanding. Well, that, I cannot say much more simply what I meant. Uh, um, while I was saying that your understanding, because your understanding. Taken by itself would amount to a denial of conjugal justice. That is to say, if there were justice that could prevail between a bedmaker and a house builder. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. because uh, one can say supply and demand, the law of supply and demand is an attempt to find a satisfactory way of dealing with the demand of the last time to Locke, and it isn't either possible or desirable to go into detail with respect to Locke, but I will say this, Locke uses the term value in a number of ways, and those ways are not mutually inconsistent, although they point in different directions. Locke speaks of the intrinsic value of an object, and he means by that the respect or the extent to which that thing contributes to human life and convenience. Now, that is a sense of the word value, which has nothing particular to do with any labor theory, and uh, which is relevant alike, uh, both in the state of nature and in the state of civil society. That is to say, one could say of food, for example, of a particular kind of food that it has considerable intrinsic value for the obvious reason. And uh, likewise, one could say, say, of diamonds, which is an example that was often used, of precious stones. They don't have much intrinsic value, or they might even have none, because they don't contribute to the support of life. Now, the reason that this fact was thought to be noteworthy was that some things like diamonds obviously are very valuable in the sense of exchange value. And it was to this consideration that men in their economic speculations addressed themselves, namely, how is it possible, or what it accounts for the fact that there are some commodities which have a considerable intrinsic value and very little exchange value, please. Value. You could put it that way. I think that would be a probably a satisfactory equivalent, although what they did themselves in so many words was to say... Yes. Kind of, 
He said, would uh, intrinsic value be generally the same as consumption value? And one could say, yes, by and large, it's uh, contributory to sustaining life. Now, this uh, distinction between a value which Locke chose to call intrinsic value and connected with contributoriness to the preservation of life, that on the one side, and the other use of the term value, which is much more connected with things that happen in the market, that roughly corresponds to the distinction between value and use and value and exchange, or exchangeable value, as that uh, term, co those uh, terms come to be used in Adam Smith. And then later on, of course, much more is made of this distinction in Marx, and that we'll see about. Now, generally speaking, use value then has some connection with sustaining life. Exchange value is accounted for by Locke, Smith, Ricardo, generally speaking, by all the uh, economists, including Marx in some context to be more directly connected with supply and demand. So the, the distinction then is some value which arises out of a characteristic of human life and the things that support it, and then on the other side, supply and demand, which could be affected by that need to sustain life, but might go very far beyond it and take in all kinds of things that have uh, nothing to do with merely sustaining life. Now, at the same time that uh, Smith, and I'll now speak more about uh, Smith to uh, proceed with the development, at the same time that Smith connected exchange value with supply and demand, although with supply and demand in a sense which is different from that now commonly understood. And let me add parenthetically different because what he meant by supply was different from what's now commonly understood. What he meant by demand was generally speaking similar to what we now mean. What he meant by supply was different. Uh, those of you who know anything at all about economics will be thoroughly enlightened in this respect if I tell you that what he meant by supply had nothing to do with a schedule of marginal costs, and more particularly, a schedule of increasing marginal costs. So in other words, when he speaks about retrenching the, the level of output, he doesn't connect with that some decline in the marginal cost of production and introduces some rather considerable differences into the analysis. Well, I say that only in passing. If that, is that perfectly intelligible to everybody? I mean, do you know what's, uh, what's meant by this? I, 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 some of you probably do and some of you don't, but uh, it has to do with a certain aspect of the development of modern economics which proceeds from and through what's now vulgarly called often the law of diminishing returns, but which is more properly called the law of diminishing marginal productivity. And then if you understand that, then you'll know the rest, but we can't stop to, uh, to work it out. Now, to resume, therefore, Smith meant supply and demand in a sense which are generally speaking similar to, but not in all respects identical with, the modern understanding. Where does that leave the labor theory of value, then? If exchangeable value is really the outcome of some interaction of supply and demand in a market as generally now understood, then the origins of the labor theory of value in uh, Smith must be doubtful. Now, Marx refers all the time to the respects in which his predecessors in classical economics did adumbrate the labor theory of value. And he meant by those predecessors such people as Smith and even Locke in some ways. Now, Smith and Ricardo do speak of the source of value in labor. But they are, both of them, very careful to stipulate that labor only is the source of value in the early time, in the, the long time, very long ago, by which they meant essentially the time before property had begun to accumulate and such a thing as capital came into being. Yeah, in Locke's terms, you could say really in the state of nature, value arose peculiarly out of the application of labor and from no other circumstance. It was Marx's contribution to radicalize this formulation with respect to the origin of labor so that the... Uh, I beg your pardon. The origin of, the, the, the origin of uh, value in labor so that it was irrespective of that transition from the state of nature to the state of civil society and was also irrespective of the accumulation of capital. He found a way 
of making more radical what was already present in Ricardo's formula, for that matter, namely that capital was a form of congelation, of incorporation of labor, and that the process of production, the collaboration of human labor with the machinery, was nothing but a combining of labor in two sorts, labor in the living flesh and labor embodied in instruments at different rates, flowing slowly or less slowly into the product. Now, what was the basis for Smith's having recoiled, so to speak, from the full elaboration of the labor theory of value? Now, what Smith says is that value, in fact, does proceed from the quantity of labor connected with the object in question, but he introduces a distinction which led, it must be said, to, to complications, in fact, to confusions. He made the distinction between the amount of labor embodied in the thing and the amount of labor commanded by the owner of the thing. It's a very simple idea. If you have a pair of shoes and it took the uh, 24 hours of labor to make the pair of shoes, then we'll call that the amount of labor embodied. Now, if by the ownership of that pair of shoes, you can get somebody else to do 24 hours worth of labor by offering them to him in exchange <coughs> as a wage, in effect, then we would say the amount of labor commanded by the ownership of the shoes is 24 hours worth. Now, then that would leave open the question, what is the genuine quantity of value which is represented by the object in question? Uh, in either case, you could say what results is a labor theory of value, but Smith happened to choose the one of those two possibilities which led in a direction that had to be corrected by Ricardo and then radicalized by Marx. What Smith chose to do was to say, it's really more important to consider how much labor can be commanded by the ownership of the commodity rather than how much labor is incorporated in the commodity. And this for the following reason. When Smith tried to understand what is it that generates the wealth of the nation, which was his primary question, he came to the, to the, the conclusion, which also formed the premise of his work, that it's labor, the amount of human effort that is at the foundation of the wealth of the nation. Now, there was always a scarcity of labor, as strange as it might seem. I mean, this was part of the, uh, uh, of the premise of these men, a scarcity in one respect. With more population applied to the same resources, there would, of course, be an increase in the output. Now, the, the conditions were of the essence. The question was, under what conditions could the increased application of humankind to the natural resources result in a satisfactory, i.e. a satisfactorily increasing growth of, uh, of the output so that in modern terms there would be not diminishing marginal product, but either a constant or even perhaps an increasing marginal product. However, that problem might be solved. Smith goes into that, but we will ignore the question for the time being at any rate. However, Smith might resolve that. He does, as a matter of fact, always resolve the labor scarcity problem and the labor value problem in terms of the irksomeness, the human sacrifice that's involved in a given quantity of toil. Now, without going through the details of his development, he comes to the conclusion that labor is always at all times and all places substantially of the same value for a reason that Marx did not regard as especially impressive, namely, that a given quantity of labor will always amount to about the same quantity of sacrifice, of irksomeness, toil, fatigue, uh, giving up of uh, happiness and leisure on the part of the laborer. The equal value of an hour of toil to the laborer was made the basis by uh, Smith of the labor theory of value as it finds an expression in his work. How can you express, therefore, the value of a commodity, and why should you uh, try to express it in terms of a quantity of labor? Uh, for the following reason. 
because if it takes two hours to make this and four hours to make that, you can depend on there being something like a ratio of one to two in the exchangeable values of those on the sole ground, primarily on the ground, that it involved equal sacrifice on the part of the human beings involved in the process of production. Now, if you like, you could call this a purely subjective foundation for the, the labor theory of value. In the feel, foundation in the feelings, uh, the, uh, the sacrifice of effort and ease on the part of the men involved in the productive process. Now, this led to some terrific problems, as was detected by Ricardo. A question comes up right away as to the relation between the labor embodied and the labor commanded. Will you run into difficulties, for instance, if it should happen that the process of production changes, the technology uh, improves, and then it turns out that whereas before it used to take a man a day to make a pair of shoes, he now can make four pairs of shoes in a day. Now, Ricardo raises this question, will it be true that because now there are 10 hours of labor embodied in four pairs of shoes, that in order to command 10 hours of labor, you must pay the man the equivalent of 10 hours of uh, four pairs of shoes. Now, that problem arises for the following reason. If technology advances sufficiently and productivity increases, <clears throat> the output of labor will grow very far beyond the mere subsistence level, however that could be defined. Does that mean that the purchase of a day's labor will always be at the expense of the output of a day's labor, even though productivity is increasing so much that that, in effect, means a very high standard of living for the wage earners. Do you see that this, what this, uh, what this problem is? No? Yeah, let me uh, try to restate the condition. Suppose that by working a day, a man can turn out subsistence for a day, a package which amounts to his and his family's support of food, clothing, so on and so forth for a day. Now suppose there is an in, in improvement in technology and productivity increases so that the one man can now turn out in a half a day the subsistence for himself, his family, and so on for a whole day. What it takes, what he and his family require to live for a whole day, he now makes in a half a day. That means in a whole day he'll make the output of two days subsistence. Will he have to be given two days worth of subsistence in order for him to work, to be made to work for one day. You see? Now, Ricardo said, no, uh, he won't have to be given that at all. And then there's going to become, there will, will come into being a, a failure of the labor commanded and the labor embodied to, to mesh. Now, Smith was not altogether uncognizant of this question, but he thought that it made more sense to resolve it in the light of his original principle, that really the value of a, of a commodity is, is better understood in the light of the subjective sacrifice of the men at, uh, at work making it. And that there, there is only this one uh, anchor which holds down steady the whole value system. Now, I don't want to go into the implications of this. Smith, at several points, found himself in difficulty on the ground of this assertion, he uh, asserted that there was really one thing that stayed steady in value all the time through the eight, more than any other single thing, and that was the value of an hour's labor. However, for uh, reasons that you might guess even from things that I've said, he was willing to increase the, the list of stable items by one. And he included corn also, say food, as being a commodity which would stay stable in value over very long periods of time, relatively speaking. And this for the reason that there is a close connection between the subsistence of workers and the amount of food that they must absorb in order to continue. So he drew this implication from what came to be called the subsistence theory of wages that there was a, a connection between the doing of an hour's work 
the sacrifice of leisure and ease and so on connected with doing an hour's work, and likewise the amount of food necessary to sustain a man in order for him to do an hour's work. The one thing that he did not do was what Marx found it necessary to do, and that was to abolish that distinction that Smith had made between labor and all other things, which made it possible for him to consider the value of labor on a ground different from the ground on which he considered the value of every other thing. Those of you who've read ahead a little bit in, in the Das Kapital will know that uh, uh, Marx speaks about labor as a commodity and says that it has a value, or more particularly labor value, power has a value, which is determined exactly in the same way and on the same grounds as every other commodity. The amount of socially necessary labor time involved in the production or generation of that commodity. Smith was unwilling to do that. I couldn't say whether the, the thought ever occurred to him, but it, he explicitly denies that labor is a commodity and insists on treating it on its own uh, absolutely unique ground as arising out of uh, the human life and the cost of it being simply dictated by the circumstances of human life, by sacrifice and so on. Before the labor theory of value could have been made absolutely airtight and radical and perfectly scientific, this step had to be taken. For purposes of gravity, let me say that Ricardo stands as a kind of halfway house between Smith who tried to assert a labor theory of value without including labor itself as one of the things whose value was determined on the same principle. And Marx, who asserted without exception all commodities, not only including but primarily labor power, has its value determined and governed according to the same rule, namely how much of labor power goes into the production of it. Now, if this seems unintelligible to you, let me only say very briefly, by way of anticipation of Marx's doctrine, that he took this absolutely calculating position with respect to labor power. It comes into being on the basis of a certain support. It, is, it has to be supported by a prior production. The human beings have a power to work, which only comes into being because they have ingested a certain quantity of matter, because they're clothed with a certain quantity of matter, and so on and so forth. The generation of that quantity of matter, which by the metabolism of the worker and his body and so on, gets transmuted into labor power, is for all of the purposes of economics similar to the process by which Raw materials are thrown into the hopper at one end of an automated uh, plant, and then by the grinding of the wheels and so on, they come out in the form of a, of a product at the other end. That radicalization had to be achieved before the labor uh, theory of value could be made. So, yeah, let me say so consistent for the time being that the kinds of problems that afflicted Smith, one of them being what I mentioned to you, but there were others, and the kinds of problems that afflicted Ricardo, because he had some difficulties, before those problems could be made to disappear. So Marx's radicalization of the labor theory of value was not uh, simply uh, accidental. It really was necessary. It, it, without it, he could not have done the one thing needful, and to that I want to turn next. The one thing needful was to make an absolutely airtight connection between the theory of value and the theory of distribution. Now, <clears throat> Smith begins by asserting the problem to be the wealth of the nation, the growth of the wealth of the nation, the conditions for the growth of the wealth of the nation, and the distribution of the wealth of the nation. Yeah, that's, of course, a very long story. Yeah, I would only try to give you a very rough sketch of how he attempted to proceed. He starts with the view that in this state of nature, which he doesn't call by that name, there is a distribution according to the strict principle 
of the the labor theory of value. That is to say, uh, one man kills a deer in 10 hours and one man kills a beaver in five hours, and so therefore you have to exchange two beaver for one deer. That's very simple, because nothing else enters in except the labor. Now, the difference between the primitive condition and the civilized condition is accumulation. Accumulation is virtually tantamount to the development of the means of production. That is to say, some men will now have more goods than he himself needs, and that means he can put somebody else to work. But he has stored up some corn, and he can support a man, or he has, he has made a tool which another man can use while he himself works on and so forth. Now, that is simply the end of the period in which the labor theory of value is decisive with respect to the distribution of the product. How does Smith make that transition? He uses a certain word, he uses it often. He says the product is resolved. The product is resolved into its parts. And then there are several chapters, one on rent and one on wages and so on and so forth, uh, the profits of stock, in which he shows, according to the principles of supply and demand, fundamentally, how on the basis of monopoly power, he, he uses this term in respect of rent, how on the basis of a monopoly power, by which is meant simply accumulated possession, the output of labor is resolved into the three major distributive shares, wages, profits, and rents. Now, these distributive shares have certain laws of uh, growth and decrease, and these laws of growth and decrease are connected with the possible states of the society viewed from an economic point of view. Those states, as everybody knows who's read The Wealth of Nations, are called the progressive the stationary and the retrograde uh, states. That's the standard terminology, but he sometimes uses uh, another. <clears throat> now, what happens to the distributive shares as the society either advances or declines? That is what takes up the remainder of book one in which this question is dealt with, but I don't want to go into that. For our present purposes, what really matters is that there is substantially no account of how it turns out that the accumulation of property leads to these uh, leads to the partition of the product into shares. It simply happens. Uh, well, there is an implicit account. Some man has come into possession of the ground, uh, of some plot of ground. And now, that means that he can impose on somebody by law the obligation of paying him for the use of it. It doesn't go any further than that. Smith speaks of this as being a, a kind of exploitation. He says so. And the, he points out, incidentally, that the, the paying of the distrib distribution of the output in industrial production between wages and profits has, generally speaking, the same character, a kind of exploitation. He doesn't use that word, but it, it has that general uh, flavor. What does this mean? There are... There are working men on the one side, there are men who's, who live by profits on the other, there is a certain product, and they squabble over it. And who gets how much of it depends simply on uh, who can apply the greater pressure to the other side. Uh, this is sometimes called the bargaining power theory of distribution, to give it uh, a handle. It's very prominent in, in Smith. Now, uh, there is no question, one of the difficulties surrounding the transition from the value theory to the, to the distribution theory in Smith is what is it that legitimates, not to say what is it that accounts for in the mechanical sense, this scheme of distribution. I think that one can only say Smith was aware of the problem, of the moral problem, and that he believed that the solution of it in the capitalistic form, another term that he didn't use, had a, a kind of higher justice. It looks like a, a piece of, of gross exploitation and injustice that the product should be resolved into parts, which is really only a euphemism, that term. Marx, incidentally, saw this when he spoke about predecessor theories of distribution and value. He pointed to Smith, and he said, look what kind of a thing this man uh, has cooked up for the occasion. It's resolved. And everybody knows what that means. Because somebody simply takes it away from somebody else. Well, Smith understood that. 
but the question is, how could a man with, uh, with any claim at all to uh, simply to ordinary decency publish such a thing to the world without any kind of glossing over? Because there was none in Smith. There is no glossing over. It's quite plain. That's a very long question, and I believe that one can only solve it, to, if you can answer it at all, you can only solve it by taking in Smith's entire horizon. It has something to do with what kind of political and social order he thought would, generally speaking, conduce most to the comfort, peace, general satisfaction of the largest body of men. It is very reminiscent of Locke's uh, proposal. There is not a descent into the absolute interior of, of value theory. There is no attempt to make the, the foundation of economics correspond with the foundation of all of morality and, generally speaking, all the principles of form and matter, and so on and so forth. It's quite a pragmatic thing. Mostly, Smith looks about him, sees the same distinction that Locke saw between the rational and industrious on the one side and the lazy and ignorant on the other side. I mean, these are, these are Locke's terms. He doesn't use them both in the same place. He speaks of the rational and industrious frequently in the, in the treatises, but in his economic writings, he specifically speaks of the lazy and ignorant to make sure that nobody misses the point that he really had another class of human beings in mind when he spoke of the first uh, variety. Now, Smith's view with respect to these people did differ a bit from Locke, I think Locke believed that the, the lazy and ignorant were more likely to be transformed into the rational and industrious by having the, the most rigorous pressures, pressures applied to them. Smith has a surprisingly uh, liberalistic doctrine with respect to this and believes that, that encouragement, an increase in the standard of living and so on and so forth, uh, generally speaking, more consideration will tend to relieve the problem. But this is only a detail. I think that both Smith and Locke, looking at the scarcity present in the articulation of men and nature, believe that the only way to solve it would be through the institution of property, which would lead to inequalities. As Smith said, there would be 500 poor for every one rich. He was willing to face that. I think he didn't anticipate uh, some institutional arrangements which have altered that ratio. But even under those tough conditions, he thought that the entire level of human convenience, freedom, and development so far as it was possible would be raised without the need to resort to certain things which uh, he called superstition. I'm sorry to say, I mean, he, uh, he had the same view of this kind of uh, solution of the human problem as Locke and Hume and similar people. Purely secularized society would be possible on the basis, free and convenient, would be possible on the basis of this rather empirical solution. Now, this was absolutely detestable from the point of view of Marx, this, uh, this failure uh, to get down to the, to the fundamentals. And I won't say any more about uh, Smith, although there are, there are very many things that could be said. And they would be, I think, of, of a great interest if we had more time. But the general character of Smith's solution is this modified Lockeanism, but essentially the same foundation as was present in Locke, which is characterized, from the point of view most interesting to us, by a failure to make absolutely rigid and consistent, and also, you might say, respectable for that reason or others, the connection between value theory and uh, the distribution theory. That was left in a highly empirical state, mostly explained by things such as supply and demand, uh, the operation of the market, and things like this. Now, uh, how this situation was modified, not to say corrected by Marx, is the purpose of our study of Capital Volume One where the attempt is made to nail down, once and for all, value theory and distribution theory, make them, in effect, one, and thereby put distribution theory, for the first time, on a perfectly respectable basis. Perfectly respectable basis. That's from his point of view. Now, let me see if I can summarize this. 
I think that you could say that there have been two points of view from which the economic question has been considered. Two primary points of view, and then it will turn out that by the conjunction of these two, a third one arises. Uh, there is, in the first place, the point of view of abundance or convenience. Viewing the human condition here as being a sort of unending contest with nature, plagued by scarcity, by the, by the pains and troubles of toil, hard work, and labor. How does one somehow provide a home in the natural environment for men with the understanding that nature is, is really a terrific obstacle to overcome? and that men have enough of the natural built into them so that very complicated devices are necessary to induce them, not to say coerce them, to move in the direction which will help to solve their problem in one restrict restricted sphere, the sphere of abundance lived in a rather free and more or less enlightened uh, condition. It's a very modest aim. It took a long time to advance on it, and the achievement of this is one of the absolutely incredible uh, accomplishments of the, the human species in the western part of the world in the last two or three centuries. That was the, the modest and solid purpose of such men as Locke and Smith. I would say, let's call this the approach to the economic problem proceeding from the goal of abundance or, or convenience. Now, but there was another point of view, much older, which did not die in the olden time, but which had a life that came down even into rather modern times. Let me call this the approach to the economic problem from the point of view of morality or of the way of life, or broadly speaking, excellence. Now, I know that there is a kind of overlapping between uh, the one that I've named first and this second one, but let me make these rather broad and crude distinctions. And let me point out what I mean by some examples. Rousseau would be a, an outstanding, perhaps the outstanding example of this way of looking at the economic problem, the problem of how to supply man's needs to, in a, some social context. Now, Rousseau saw that there was a problem with respect to social life generally, which had a diminished or reduced expression in the economic part of human life. That problem was the strange paradoxical relation between society and morality. Or, to put it now in the reduced terms, between abundance and vice. In the second discourse, uh, Rousseau points out how much man's character is reduced, is, is undermined and, and uh, worsened uh, by uh, abundance. He becomes a dependent uh, being. Uh, all the things he used to be able to do for himself, he can't do for himself. All the rigors that he used to be able to withstand, he can no longer withstand. And instead of being a self-reliant person, the being now, he becomes subject to a thousand uh, ills and wants and all kinds of things, and he really becomes a kind of detestable weakling. Uh, this is the, the result of the impact on uh, human beings of convenience and abundance, that thing which everybody else seems to regard as so much a desirable thing. I don't say that this is the whole story, but it certainly is what Rousseau in part asserts. Now, there was another man, a much less stature, than Rousseau, and that was uh, Bernard Mandeville, who uh, was, generally speaking, in the generation between Locke and Rousseau, whose works have, uh, were published, I think, between approximately 1700 and 1737. I believe the last edition of The Fable of the Bees was uh, 1737. Now, to put it very simply, whereas uh, Rousseau appeared to believe that abundance somehow or other contributed to the deterioration of human character. 
Mandeville appeared to believe that the deterioration of human character was a necessary condition for abundance. That you had, yes, that there must be certain vices present in man before a market could develop. I make it very crude now. Before uh, these conditions could arise under which a full blown, a fully developed economy would come into being. Now, I don't want to go into the question of whether they were right or wrong or whatever. It seems as if there is some truth on both sides. Uh, both that, that abundance leads to a kind of deterioration in, in the individual self-reliance, fairly obvious, and also that a certain amor habendi, a certain uh, concupiscence of various degrees and directions is necessary before the, the market and the process of production can become elaborated in uh, ways consistent with the generation of a high standard of living. And incidentally, while I'm speaking of this, not only Rousseau and Mandeville, but Smith, too, understood in his own way the paradoxical uh, foundation or the paradoxical consequences of a fully developed uh, economic order. Uh, he, too, saw that it, it necessarily generated some mild effects, some very unsatisfactory characteristics of men, which... Uh, he was willing, more or less, to make his peace with. You see, he was a very politic man, I think, in the, in the English sense and tradition. And he was willing to make his peace with all kinds of things. Now, these paradoxes that are connected with the, the elaboration of the economic system, that if, if the prosperous order has either vice as its precondition or vice as its consequence, these posed a terrific problem. It looked as if whether Mandeville was right or Rousseau was right or unhappily, even if both of them were right, there was no way out that if we want certain good things, convenience, the rise in the level of human life, which can only come about on the basis of some solid economic base, if we want these things, we must pay a certain price for them. And that price is going to be in terms either of human morality, self-reliance, freedom as it came to be viewed. I mean, the Rousseau's connection between uh, freedom and uh, virtue that can't be overlooked. The price that has to be paid in terms of virtue runs over and becomes also a, a price in terms of a, of a higher freedom that becomes lost to these mass men, as we would now say. Now, it, that seems to be unbeatable. There is no way out of that uh, dilemma. So it would appear. <clears throat> now, I believe, if I have not uh, misunderstood Marx entirely, that Marx said, no, there is a solution uh, to this, this question. You can have everything all at once. <clears throat> uh, you can have abundance. Uh, the abundance that will be generated by the technological system that has been brought into being by the activities of the exploiters, the bourgeoisie, and so forth, that transcends this or that human society. That can be had in all human conditions. And not only can it be had, but it can be had in a way which is perfectly consistent with human excellence. That is to say, you can have fully developed human beings, but not uh, broken down wrecks living in, uh, in depraved conditions, but uh, self-reliant, upstanding men, free, uh, thoroughly human, notwithstanding the condition of production. And in fact, even arising necessarily out of the condition of production, provided that that condition of production is sufficiently organized in the light of a principle which is dictated by a proper understanding of the labor theory of value and how that labor theory of value overflows into distribution theory, provided that you do certain things, it goes without saying, provided you do the right thing with respect to the ownership of the means of production. But only provided that, then all the rest follows, and the, all the old contradictions between abundance and morality and excellence, and these all disappear. These are not intrinsic to human life. Men are not corrupted by an abundance of good things. It's only men under certain conditions that are corrupted 
by an applied, if at all, but it's to the extent to which they are, it's altogether a historical proposition. So Marx apparently believed that if one does certain things about the common ownership of the means of production and the division of labor, then abundance and morality, which let's say equals morality in his context equals justice in the dis distribution of the product, and the development of the human being by being liberated from the circumscription of his horizon through division of labor, these become possible simultaneously. Now, that raises some very difficult questions. I don't want, I can't go into them at length, among other things, because we're, we're going to run out of time. But let me only very briefly tell you what I think this development has rested upon. If you go back to Locke, you notice that he regarded the transition to the state of civil society as, in effect, the solution of the the practical solution of the human problem. The, the human problem was the endangering of the, the status of human life through the lawlessness, let's say, of the, the state of nature. The, state of, the transition then from the state of nature to the state of civil society is really a very radical transition for Locke that makes a very great difference. And in effect, you could say that is the most important act or, or occurrence in human uh, history. That is what really makes the difference. Now, but there is a sense in which that is not true for Locke. Because Locke understood that there is something like the immutable and eternal law of nature. And that, that prevails both in the state of nature and in the state of civil society. So now, you could say there is then a, a decrease by one degree of the apparent importance of the transition from the state of nature to the state of civil society. What that transition does is to produce a certain improvement in the environment for the operation of the, the law of nature to work for preservation rather than for mutual destruction and poverty. Uh, the same law to change the conditions, that vital change in the conditions, and are the law which used to lead men to kill each other, leads men instead to an advance in understanding and uh, contract and so on to, uh, to help each other. Now, I, you might say, uh, Locke was so far in the tradition that he believed that political life advanced the intention of nature. Polity, or political life, was not contrary to the intention of nature, but the transition to the state of civil society out of the state of nature was, and you might say it's paradoxical, in the interest of nature and the natural order. It, uh, it, as Aristotle would have said, I believe, that the advance into society was not something contrary to the intention of nature, but it was a kind of rising above to a higher state for the sake of some ends which were indicated by nature. I don't mean to make uh, Locke into an Aristotelian, but there is a certain sense in which the, some traditional things that are very important still lingered on. Then the question arises whether the state of civil society does not operate radically against human nature. Uh, that was the question which was, you might say, was raised by Rousseau. This, briefly, was the way of looking at the transition from the state of the nature to the state of civil society based on the proposition that polity, or political life, is really contrary to the foundation or to the intention of nature, and that there is a, a tension between society and man's nature and nature simply, which causes an, an absolutely insoluble problem. Now, this was Rousseau. Rousseau was, you might say, the, really the man who broke it for the second time with the, the ancient tradition, but he broke on a, on, a, on a different ground. But he didn't break entirely either, because in Rousseau, there is still the belief that there is a difference between one condition of man and another. There is a, a virtuous, free, moral condition of man. Now, what it rests on might be very complicated, but there is such a thing. And then there is a, a sub condition of man. And uh, there are free men, good men, courageous men, real citizens on the one side, and then there are the others on the other side. Rousseau's point was somehow or other to see if there was not a solution of the social problem 
which would be guided by or controlled by this harking back to a very ancient understanding concerning the difference between virtue and vice. Now, as it happened, that solution was provided in Rousseau by reference to the freedom, the self-legislating freedom of the individual, which was the ground for his the citizen virtue, so to speak, expressed through the, the legal process, legislative process. Now, but Rousseau, it was Rousseau who discredited that distinction between the state of nature and the state of civil society. He replaced that distinction with a single historical continuum, so to speak. Now, there is some preparation for this in Locke. It's not often dwelt upon, I believe, but Locke, too, understood that there was something like a historical development, a very long-term rise in the level of human life, which was distinct from the transition from the state of nature to the state of civil society, and which I'll only remind you of by speaking of man's majority. There are certain passages in the second treatise where Locke speaks of the difference between minority and majority, a kind of coming to one's senses. But I believe there is some reason for thinking that he didn't mean only individuals at the age of 21, but he really meant a kind of growing up of mankind and being released from some serious restraints by having their minds opened up and being made free of the law, free of the law of nature, in the same way as an individual is made free of the law of England when he comes of age, is no longer simply subject to his father. Now, but this, this maturing was a, a civil fact. It was something that had to do with the order of political life and could only come about as a kind of political emancipation from erroneous beliefs. There was a kind of political life that replaced another kind of political life. And that progress, which I don't have to tell you was assisted by Locke's own writing, that was his understanding of it, that was the, the foundation of any solution such as one could hope for. Now, but it was Rousseau who, by discrediting society, discredited that transition to society. He discredited both at the same time, the transition to, to society and society, on the ground of, of it's on what I think generally are three grounds, human, human excellence, the, the goodness of the individual, justice, that is the theme that comes out very strongly in the, uh, in the second discourse, surely. And freedom. But at the same time, he asserted, it's quite clear, that man in this pre-social condition also was nothing much to be uh, proud of, and that uh, society had in a way substituted some difficulties for some other difficulties. Now, Marx took some different ground. Although he, you can see how he comes uh, rather directly out of the Rousseauan formulation, he simply dropped excellence in its fullest sense. And for it, he substituted something which in our terminology we would like to call the notion of the well-rounded man. That is to say, not being circumscribed in his horizon by a, a, an insane, obsessed attention always to one petty little activity which would form his life so that he becomes a kind of uh, automaton. That obviously has to do with the problem of the division of labor. Now, this, so this, this uh, completedness of the human productions on the one side, and on the other side, justice, justice in the sense of distribution of the physical product according to the laws laid down and indicated by the labor theory of value. Now, both of these were made possible in Marx's formulation by the radicalization of the labor theory of value, as we will see, that it was, it was possible to achieve both this human excellence in the limited sense of roundedness or completedness on the one side and justice on the other side in the distribution of the, the product through this, through the radicalization of the labor theory of value, which I think is tantamount to the absolutization of economics that was impossible. The, the radicalization of the labor theory of, of value rested upon a reduction of economics to its foundation in true reality, as Marx himself says it, 
Now, when he speaks about true reality, he really means the conjunction of form and matter. He reduces the, the old categories of value and use and value and exchange to the oldest categories of form and matter, below which I think it would be impossible to reduce the question. Now, this then is the conjunction of Locke's emphasis on preservation, this just distribution of goods in perfect abundance, Rousseau's emphasis on morality and freedom, the elevation of the, the man to his rounded, free, and uh, satisfactory condition, and Hegel's uh, doctrines with respect to necessity, the dialectic, and history. The, the formulation of Marx is in this respect an extremely impressive thing. It was really in effect through his radicalization of the theory of value that he was able to assert, in effect, that there is an absolute order of human production. And this absolute order of human production is a reflection of the deepest layers or levels of, uh, of reality. The order of human production is a model of the true order of being, in fact. And human production, in a way, becomes the microcosm of all production, which sounds perhaps reminiscent of uh, the theme with which I began when I started the first lecture, when I tried to tell you something, of the, the ancient notions with respect to human life and, and production. There is only this one difference, that the ancients, I believe, never supposed that the conjunction of form and matter in a human activity was ever conceivable as a political solution. That it might have been the true characterization of the lives of 10 men out of three or four billions, maybe that could be imagined. But that this, this conjunction in human production of the true elements of all existence that that should be the foundation of the political solution of the human problem, I believe would have been regarded as a sheer absurdity by the, by the ancients. <clears throat> now, you might say, therefore, that Marx represents the, the peak of optimism in its modern signification, the possibility of bringing together through the proper organization of, of uh, human production of those elements of nature, which are the foundations of the excellent, just, perfect life. That, that belief that Marx had was, I believe, the foundation of his whole structure, or to put it somewhat differently, that towards which his whole construction pointed. And it is my function here to show you in what way it was the elaboration of the labor theory of value that was the visible manifestation of that uh, movement on his part. Yes. Yes, and I believe he won't give the paper today. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. We will be in the same position. No. I mean, I begin my question in the form of a repetition of certain things which I have said frequently in, in my class, and this is as follows. There was first, I mean, that is again a very uh, summary uh, view of the situation, the classical doctrine. Say Aristotle, or what is matter Plato. Society is for the purpose of human excellence. And this human excellence is, in the highest case, theoretical or speculative excellence. And there is a certain complicated relation between speculative excellence and the city, into this I don't want to go. So modern solution. There are, I distinguish three waves, as I call them. The first wave, which is represented by Locke, for example, but already by Machiavelli and Hobbes, takes this view. Let us lower the goal of the end of civil society, not human excellence, 
but the most massive thing, self-preservation and its natural expansion into comfortable self-preservation. Yeah? In other words, self-preservation at all costs. And if it is possible, comfortable self-preservation. It's just plain common sense. That was the classic formulation of Hobbes and Locke, and that meant a lowering of the standards, a conscious lowering of the standards. And therefore, this, uh, so, uh, this sophistication that abundance might require vice or produce vice is in a way implied in it. Yeah? I mean, that is only a final aberration because many things which appeared as vice from a severe point of view, did not appear as wise from this easygoing uh, of you. Now, then there came a reaction to this view, which at a certain moment was felt to be degrading. And the great trumpeter of this moral indignation about the first wave was Rousseau. And out of Rousseau grew then German idealism, Kahneling and Hegel, and last but not least Marx. From this point of view, I think Marx belongs absolutely to that second wave. And what you said, Mr. Hobbes, is that was a very beautiful formulation. Abundance plus virtue. Comfortable self-preservation plus virtue. What the second wave, as I called it, tried to do was to, on the modern foundation of plain British common sense, comfortable self-preservation, to erect an imposing moral structure, which would even, if possible, be more moral than the Platonic Aristotelian structure. That is, I think, what we are driving at. Yeah, I think at this point I absolutely agree with Mr. Gobbi that is that is what Marx is striving for, just as Rousseau, Kant, and Hegel are already striving for it. Now so we come to the subtlety. And I mean, it's a peculiar Marxian thing. In a private conversation with Mr. Cropsey, we agreed on two formula, which we will not sufficiently develop in this seminar, but which are, uh, I think, sound hunches. And the first is, indeed, for Marx, economics becomes metaphysics, nothing short of that. It is the absolute science. And Mr. Proxy has shown today some strands which are wholly unknown to me. I have other strands and that we confirm each other. And the second point, which we also agreed was, and that is in a loose vulgar formula, uh, Marx tries to eat the cake and to have it. In other words, he expects of this comfortable self-preservation people, yeah, men in that acting on that spirit, or more generally stated, of sensible man, man concerned with his with the fulfillment of his needs. Sensible man of all men, therefore, what could be expected reasonably only of a very tiny minority of men who would lead a rather ascetic life. That's also a point which you make. Now, that, of course, these two assertions, that Marx replaces metaphysics by economics, or in other words, he transforms economics into metaphysics. And secondly, that eating the cake and have it, that has to be proven still. But Mr. Cropsey laid a very good foundation. And here I simply repeat what you said in order to check on whether I understood you, and I believe I act there vicariously for some people in the class who also have no economic training. Now, the first is this. You said, in, if I understood you correctly, Marx really completes classical economics. And you mentioned two points. First, labor itself is, by Marx, understood as a commodity, whereas in classical economics, labor was not understood as a commodity. Labor power. Yeah. Labor power, yeah. Secondly, Marx, in distinction from Smith and Ricardo, links up the value theory with the distribution theory. More tightly. More tightly. In other words, he makes, he makes the doctrine more consistent, more lucid. Yeah. 
And now we have, of course, to see how this intra-economic change, making economics a more perfect union, has this profound human, oh, comprehensive human meaning, which is implied in the first part. Here I fail to understand you, and the only thing I could guess was this. Virtue plus abundance. Let us call this the formula. I mean, not virtue on the basis of scarcity, so that you have a small stratum of gentlemen and masses or, or, or multitudes of toilers, but you have a universal aristocracy by message. Yeah? Everyone a gentleman. And what a gentleman. So that this implies one crucial point, which I have disagreed in that first round, namely that the meaning of virtue itself changes. So the human perfection, let us use this term, which Plato and Aristotle had in mind, and that which Marx has in mind, and already his German predecessors, is not the same. Now, what is the difference? The difference is that in this modern notion of human excellence, freedom is a key word. Virtue and freedom always belong somehow together. But in Plato and Aristotle, the emphasis is on virtue. And in the modern doctrine, the emphasis is on freedom. I'm not speaking of political freedom, but, of, but freedom is a moral phenomenon. It's, uh, Kant tries to understand human excellence as freedom. Human excellence is self-legislation, is self-determination. And the contents as temperance, courage, justice, and so on, they come in somehow. Whereas for Plato and Aristotle, what is in the foreground are these contents of virtue, temperance, courage, uh, justice, etc. Now, what is, the, what is the link up then? Virtue means here is self legislation, self realization, however it is called. What has this to do with economics? Economics is not merely the condition for virtue, as everyone would admit. There is a degree of squalor and poverty where um, nothing can develop. The connection is much more intimate. Virtue in this modern sense is itself productivity. Or if we want to have a more beautiful word still, creativity. So what economic man does is on a lower level, or on a more basic level, we should say, the same what spiritual man does, if we still can make this distinction. Now, these points are, of course, for the time being, in, the, in extreme abstractness, and they must be closed with, these bones must be closed with some need before we can say we have solved our problem. I have one point of information which I would like to add for those who are interested in this kind of thing. The, this problem of the combination of virtue and all around abundance is of course an old notion. And the classic presentation of it is Plato's incomplete fragmentary dialogue, Critias, a sequel to the Republic, where a, a man has a nerve after Plato or so it has presented in the Republic is highly virtuous and austere and aesthetic society to show, no, you can have both. You can have virtue of an incredible level and at the same time eat from silver dishes or gold dishes. That's a criticism. And that is only um, yeah, as a point or as uh, somewhat I'm using the thing. But the question which would interest me as a complete ignorance in uh, economics is this. What did economics do in, in a nutshell after Marx? Oh, yeah, marginal utility. What does it mean in terms of these terms which I have now created? <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me put it this way. Had Marx thought that he was providing a solution of the value, and let me say at the same time, value and price problem, yeah. which is very complicated because... If you could say, I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> uh, he, he thought he was solving the value problem, 
by reference to the conditions of production or supply, essentially alone. Now, there are places in, well, particularly in volume one, but I believe also elsewhere, where something is introduced by Marx, which is a way of sneaking in by the back door what is now called the demand conditions. Yeah. This has to do with what is called socially necessary labor time, which is uh, asserted by Marx to vary for certain kinds of reasons. As, for example, the most massive instance, it takes on the one prevailing system of production eight hours to make a pair of shoes. Now, somebody makes an invention, and it's now necessary only to invest four hours of labor in the production of a pair of shoes. And nearly everybody goes along with the change, but one man is, he likes the other way of doing it. So he invests eight hours, and, that, and Marx says, well, that's absurd to me. He, his eight hours are worth no more than four hours, because socially necessary now is only four, and the rest is a waste. Now, that's clear. But then there arise some other conditions. For example, suppose that a man spends a thousand hours uh, engraving the first chapter of Das Kapital on the head of a darning needle, <laughs> out of devotion or whatever. And it's a tremendous thing, very difficult, it takes a long time. You have to be a very skilled man and lose your eyesight and everything. So by all his conditions, this would be a very valuable thing. But Marx said it's utterly absurd. If, you, if nobody wants it, and there's some reason for even to know this in advance, this is not the expenditure of labor on a socially necessary object or in a socially necessary one. Now, that's only another way of sneaking in backwards what's now called demand. In, in more conventional terminology, one would say there is no market for it or there is no demand for it. The demand curve vanishes or uh, there would be some, some uh, situation like this, excuse me, <laughs> uh, suppose now that the, uh, the supply curve is something like this, which, I mean, excuse me, Dr. Scott, is the curve of marginal uh, cost, which means that in order to increase the output, there is an increase of the expenditure, unit by unit, equal to the ordinate of this curve, so uh, supply curve. Suppose that the, the demand, well, and suppose we were to uh, extend this uh, to the axis like this, and suppose the demand curve looks like this. That is to say, you can sell any number of these that you want at a price equal to the height of that little line, but that price is lower than any price at which this thing can be made. The lowest price at which it can be made is higher than the highest price at which it will be bought. So no market. And now Marx would have to say, yeah, this is an example of the situation in which the socially necessary labor time is in uh, excess. Some, it doesn't, we, I don't know what he would say it's in excess of, but it's an excess of something or other, and therefore it can't be made, and then uh, there's, there's been a waste of effort or something like this. Now, what, what uh, economics did after Marx was to normalize that kind of uh, explanation so that in the case of everything, not only these odd yeah. things, that this would, come, this would enter in every situation, a conjunction of the, the marginal utility, well, the, the, the satisfaction to be had from increasing the consumption of this thing over some wide range through the market, that on the one side, call it demand, and on the other side, the inevitable changes in the cost of production as the scale of output is increased. Now, of course, that means value and price no longer are simply a function of the one variable. They inevitably depend on some conjunction of the two variables. That's what, that's, this demand curve, which under normal conditions has a, a negative slope, shows by its decreasing ordinates a decline in what is called marginal utility, the increase in satisfaction contributed by n, n plus 1, n plus 2, and so on, as the increases. Now, may I ask you a very, 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 very,
starts from extracting cakes and makes it the key to the knowledge that Marx has got. No, the knowledge of I, I think it would be fair to say that uh, the marginal utility solution would be the solution to a question that could have been raised by thinking about the difference between value in exchange and value in use, not in an extreme, but under any conditions. Yeah. But provided one doesn't start with a doctrinaire decision not to introduce anything except the labor, the supply side, then he could naturally come to this conclusion. And it's very hard to say whether the, the, the law of supply and demand as so expressed in terms of marginal utility and marginal cost is necessary in the sense that anybody thinking about it must naturally come to this, this thing. I really don't know whether that's, that's a very difficult question. But I will say that it doesn't involve any great distortions. Yeah. It's not an out-of-the-way solution. Yeah. And in fact, I think that uh, probably the post marxian economists are, if anything, more correct in saying that his represents a bit more of a contraction of the field. But with this kind of thing, you could never do what he did. That is to say, you could never make that absolute uh, conjunction between value theory and, uh, and distribution theory. Distribution theory now is probably in the worst condition of any, well, the economists are free to admit this, the worst condition of any part of economic doctrine by and large. In other words, this kind of economics cannot possibly be made into a metaphysical. Uh, well, I, I don't know whether it could be. It, it, it certainly hasn't been. And, uh, <laughs> in fact, it has certain elements built into it of such a nature that the ones who are really devoted to it would have a kind of bias against even making that attempt, yeah, sure. or a bias against metaphysics in any of its, yeah. Thank you. So it's not just a Marxian analysis. Um, I would assume that they've taken into consideration some of these other, uh, other factors. What has happened to the actualization of their, their approach? Well, nothing has happened to it. The, uh, the uh, a regular Marxist doctrine still uh, adheres to a, a strict form of the labor theory of value, but, well, I say nothing has happened to it, that's misleading. It's not untrue, but it's misleading, because in more recent Marxist economic literature, I think there is more emphasis on the crisis problem, the problem of crisis. I mean, I haven't told you, I've told you just a very small fraction of all the things that Marx did with respect to economics. He was a very intelligent man, a very able man, and he foresaw certain things which it took the rest of the economics profession a very long time to catch up to, is no question. Some of his formulations with respect to uh, economic fluctuations, for example, these became regularized only in the 1930s or thereabouts. It's not that they weren't known, but uh, somehow or other the problem uh, was sought to be disposed of in other ways. Now, especially since the Big Depression, Marxist economists have been uh, more interested in the question of crises, the Marxist explanation of crises. And now, if you mean by what they have done since this, what they have done about this, they haven't done anything about that. They couldn't. Uh, that's absolutely built into the foundation of the system. And nothing, it cannot be changed. There are, there are polemics against the marginal utility school of economists. If the polemics take their tone from Marx's own uh, animate versions on some people of his time and a bit earlier, he called them hypocrites, in effect. Uh, such men uh, as, as Nassau Sr. and so on, uh, these were apologists. And the argument against their doctrine was, to a large extent, ad hominem. Now, there has been a lot of that kind of thing since the evolution of the Marxian utility thesis. That is to say that these men are, are kinds of uh, prostitutes who have developed some apologetic for the bourgeoisie, and that's right. But there is no way of, of uh, meaning. I mean, the most they can say is, no, it, it, we, we start from two entirely different premises. They seem to believe that somehow or other value can be affected by the, the opinions of people with respect to the goodness or the worth of this thing and how much they're willing to pay for it. This is, it's all irrelevant. Uh, there is such a thing as yes, with respect to the other. 
Yeah, there is something to what you say. When he speaks about the so-called fetishism of commodities, he tries to show that people under our circumstances take as immutable laws some things which are, strictly speaking, historical. These relations between and among commodities, you know, we, we seem to think that these are natural, and they're really not. 
Uh, that's uh, that is that's one fact. Now, but if you read Marx on uh, on uh, the labor theory of value, I suppose sooner or later the question arises: How historical is that? Because if he really asserts, if he means what he asserts with respect to the merely historical foundation of all understanding, of all understanding, and therewith also the understanding of this set of relations, yet there's a real question as to how, how much this is also not uh, Marxism. Would you not say that the doctrine is developed by him to refer to something which is not the doctrine of society, Labor is not slave, but free, and such other things. Yeah, without any doubt, the uh, the explanation of the of the market that is surely uh, that can only apply to the conditions in which the market exists. But still, his own explanation is not strictly speaking formal. His own explanation has a, a subtle content, and then uh, his explanation of the relations among the human beings. For example, the relations among the human beings in the productive process is to a certain extent prescribed by technology, the application of science, and so on. I don't know how he avoids that. There is no way for him to, uh, to circumvent that fact. I mean, to talk about some future state of man without the division of labor, but with the application of machinery, it's very hard to understand. Yeah, that maybe this other famous delivery in Marx that he refuses to elaborate the, the details of the future society. That, that may be a very uh, serious weakness, I'm going to uh, term that. But does he in this particular wish to do anything else but to give a thorough analysis of the laws governing capitalist production and distribution? Therefore, a special historical form of, of becoming. Yeah, I mean, Therefore, so, he yeah. will not be uh, uh, subject to the criticism of the policy historical school, that in a sense, as universal laws, which are the laws which are only valid and in a given historical Yeah, but of course, the difficulty is that the, the laws that he uh, asserts to be the laws of capitalist society are in question. I mean, that, that is precisely yeah, the point. Right. Yeah, but the point of view from which those laws are generated is supposed to be itself transhistoric. Let us say Marx, viewing capitalist society and indeed all society from outside capitalist society, speaks of the laws of value and crises and so on and so forth within capitalist society. Yeah. Yes. But if that standpoint of his outside capitalist society were not itself somehow transhistoric. Yeah, that is a, it's a difficult that is a great question. Yeah. And I believe mean, that Marx at least once explicitly claims that it is transhistoric. Because otherwise relative is invariant to follow. Yeah. It would be pretext that not going to be Are there any other any other questions? Please. Mr. Marx is one of the peculiar things that may occur to Ah, that's, a, that's not bad. Well, you mean, for example, what do they do in the Soviet Union? I mean, there are no Marxist societies. If Marx didn't ever say what he would do if he became the, the chief of budget in a, in a big country. So all we can do is to see what happens when a country, generally speaking, tries to live by these rules. And incidentally, they had uh, plenty of awkward situations. You know, they, they were stuck with his uh, his antique notions with respect to the gold standard. But so for a long time, the Soviet Union had the most conservative uh, monetary system of any country in the world because they had uh, they were still operating on the basis of the, you know the essentially Ricardian notion of the money supply. But you no, know, what they do is to forget about Marx 100%, as indeed they must. There, there is not a, a Marxist foundation for the Soviet budgeting operation. What they do is to, like sensible men, they start with the end, as Plato, I think, suggested. You start with what you want, and Descartes, and so on. You say, what well, first see what you want, and then work back from there to what you've got. 
and then, then move forward again, see when you figured out the process backwards. When you know what you want, and then you finally made your way back to where you are, now then do the steps in the reverse order, articulating all the various lines of, of operation. It's a purely empirical thing, guided by the fact they have to maintain so many divisions here and so many missile bases there, and that requires the support of such a steel industry and such a cement industry and such a railroad system. They have so many men, so many factors of production now available. They need a certain minimum of consumption goods. That's squeezed to the bottom. <clears throat> the rest, well, properly, and the rest is made available according to purely technological considerations. I mean, there is absolutely no uh, movement in the Soviet Union towards the abolition of the division of labor, for example, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, unless they mean to give up the, the whole world situation and commit suicide, then they won't do it either. What about the pricing system? I mean, that's one of the major problems. Sure. The pricing system is yeah, in the Soviet Union or yeah, in Marxist in system? Soviet in the Soviet Union, there, there are several budgets. Uh, some of you undoubtedly know this better than I if you've actually studied their government. But there are, there are different budgets. There is a, a labor budget. There is a financial budget. The budgets, are the, these are the bases of the plans, the so-called plans, five-year plan, one-year plan, and then there's subordinate periods. The, the general principle is that there has to be an articulation between the, the real budgets, i.e. the budget in terms of production and the use of the manpower and the other factors of production on the one side, and the financial budgets, the wages, prices, and the, the taxes and the other government financial fiscal support budget on the other side. The reason for that, of course, is that the only alternative would be the physical allocations in the direction of every industry and every individual consumer. So the, uh, there are only two possibilities now known. Either by administration, this individual is entitled to so many shoes, hats, so on and so forth, so many cans of beans and, uh, you know, everything. And then this one, so much. And then you have the big question. <clears throat> Suppose that you want to deal with them both equally. You give them both the same ration of beans. But one of them doesn't like beans. Now, that's no, it's a very important question. Yeah, sure. And, yeah, no, he might well. He might, either he would have to eat them, which would mean to say that you, you tell him uh, no trading. Everybody gets an allocation and no trading. Or else you say, we'll, we'll start you off with the same amounts, but you may trade internally. That would be possible. It's terribly awkward. And there's no reason to do that. I mean, why should they make life more difficult rather than uh, less they've got? That's not their purpose, I'm sure. I mean, they impose hardships, but they don't go out of their way to uh, make it difficult. Now, moreover, what about the fact that, that it's, uh, some people you like to give a higher wage than others? It's a very complicated question. If you want one man to have double the wage of the other, do you give him two cans of beans for every one can of beans for this man, two pounds of bacon for one pound? I mean, it might be the tastes are such that this would result in a, you know, absolutely impossible situation. More, if you increase every item by the same factor, you naturally you become, you get absurdities, because, for instance, everybody gets the same salt ration. Yeah, so you give that to your mind. Now, uh, I wanted you to see that there are real complications in trying to live on the basis which they at first themselves hoped they could live on. Sure, I mean, that was, but if you give them money, that means that uh, everything has to have a price attached to it. Uh, then somebody has to administer these prices. And that means you have to adjust the net money income of all the recipients of income in the community at such a level that the aggregate value of all the consumption goods will be in a proper relation to the aggregate incomes of all the individuals with the understanding that the disproportions in the money incomes assigned to the individuals will have to bear a proper relation to your schedule of encouragements and discouragements in the different lines of work, except if you want to say you send a postcard to every man and tell him where he goes to work, which is very difficult. If not that, then you have a wage system where you draw some more in here and extrude some out of there by fiddling around with the rates of wage. But that aggregate 
of incomes has to match the aggregate value of the output on the other side with all of those prices being adjusted so that there won't be 30,000 people lined up outside some department store, all of them wanting to get ironing board covers, let's say, because last month you made it very easy to get electric irons, and the month before that you made it very easy to get the ironing boards. But this month there are no ironing board covers, so all the irons and the ironing boards can't be used except if they take the dining room table off and, and use it, in which case there will be, then it'll show up. That's right, honestly. In fact, I'm, this is an example which I'm not making up. They had that difficulty several years ago with respect to the irons and the ironing boards. And that is incidentally connected with the price of, of servicing the garments in the, in the state dry cleaning establishments. If you see, if you want to get factors of production out of the dry cleaning industry, and you say, we've got a, if, I mean, we've choice. It let them all go around looking as if they have lived in their clothing for several years is one possibility. The other possibility, give them the means to do it themselves. But the means to do it themselves have to be provided in a certain package. One iron, one ironing board, and then a certain number of covers to go with it over a period of time. So I'm, you know, they outlive the covers. Now, if you don't adjust the production of all the components in the right quantity and at the right prices, see, so that the demand will just about clear it off, either you have a waste of factors of production, some things being made and distributed without the complementary goods making it possible to use them, See, that's one. Or else you have inflation, in which you have large quantities of, of, of purchasing power in the hands of the people, money incomes, and the prices, are, by uh, some mistake, are set so low that people can exert large demands and then over, over the quantity of the whole goods. And then there's dissatisfaction and, and savings begin to go down in, in value and the various difficulties. So they, in, in other words, what is done automatically by the market has to be duplicated by administration. So they have to recreate by an artificial process the conclusions of the market through administration. I don't say it's impossible. I don't say it's immoral to try to do it or anything like that, but I'm only trying to tell you it is a very difficult thing. And they must achieve it. And Marx made, I think, no particular helpful contributions to the solution of that problem. It's the latter. The latter. They're not running into any extraordinary economic problems. And people in this country are very ill-advised if they go around under the illusion that the Soviet Union is bound to collapse because of the intrinsic unworkability of their economy. That's absurd. Their economy isn't unworkable. Perfectly workable. So is that. For example, such a little thing as the development of uh, linear programming and uh, 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 IBM-type machines, that makes the solution of inventory problems and allocation problems very easy by mechanical measures. That means that the work of the planning bureau in the Soviet Union can be made much easier and more efficient, same as in this country. Now, uh, to expect them to collapse because of the difficulty of the planning problem, I think that's absurd. But yeah. I would say that what their experience shows is that within wide limits, you can do pretty much what you like with respect to the economic arrangements. That's exactly the opposite of what Marx tried to show, I believe. That, uh, that from the economy, you have to move more or less directly and rigidly on a very short rope to the political consequence. No, I think that the, the political uh, solution is what is dictated by judgment, and you can shore it up with different kinds of economic arrangements, more which more or less depend on, uh, on ingenuity. Now, I don't say everything will work. I mean, obviously some things wouldn't work. But uh, it's remarkable how many things do work, economically speaking. Radically quite different. 
And, uh, and I think that, if anything, really shows this is an enormous mistake to try to deduce the political system rigidly from the economic arrangement. Their own experience belies it. Mr. Shetty, please. Uh, I don't think there is any difference as to whether or not the Soviet economic system would work. The difference, I think, lies in the fact that it provides the best way of economically allocating resources. Yeah. And these people then, the control economy does not provide the best way of that's a very complicated question. That's about all I could say for the time being. Yeah. But they don't go on the assumption that the Soviet economic system would not continue. Yeah. Yeah. Now, not anymore. I mean, people in this country, you couldn't, uh, two people couldn't meet and look each other in the face without bursting out laughing if one of them tried to say that anymore. But there were times when that was said before the Second World War, for example. Now, but their enormous uh, technological achievements manifested in their military programs makes it absurd for uh, people in the West to say, no, this thing can't work, they can't solve the problem of production. That's uh, it's ridiculous. Now, as to whether they do it at a minimum of cost, that's a very difficult question. Uh, so we say they don't get the, the maximum allocation or the optimum allocation because of the failure of the, the market to supply its own limits. And they say it's fine for you to complain, but you have fluctuations in the level of economic activity. And those fluctuations lead to constant uh, costly readjustment. And so now you have 30,000 thrown out of work in this industry, and at least 24,000 thrown out there, and uh, resources go unused, and the men are on relief, and so on and so forth. And the uh, stock market rise and fall, and all kinds of uh, uh, nonsensical results from the operation of the market system which can't be altogether denied. So I think what it proves is that you can't argue very far from the mere operation of the economy. <clears throat> Unless you can get above that and look at, uh, at the, the problem of that political society from a larger point of view, the mere economic arrangements won't tell you whether it's a good system or a bad system. Now, I think if uh, you, you might be thinking for a minute of the case of India, where the economic problem is really tremendous. Uh, and you could say the political system stands or falls on the basis of whether it can solve the economic problem. It's true up to a point, but I think most people would be unprepared to say if it's necessary to install a leftist, a, a mainland Chinese kind of regime in India, that's worth it. I think quite a few people would say no. That, uh, the solution of the economic problem can't be taken as the sole ground for dictating the, you know, in the other direction. But still, you wouldn't deny that there are certain income, uh, income capabilities. Say that it's a limit which can go, if you still want to have political freedom, the limit which you can go to that economy and by the church. Yes, no, but I, I would only say that the economic arrangements include a broad latitude. Yeah, and to try to make a rigid connection between these economic arrangements and those political institutions, I think that tends to break down. Well. not a scientific statement does not necessarily mean exists merely a rhetorical statement. I will take that up. Do you really wish to give up a statement? Well, there were a few points. Some of them yeah. really rather small. Uh, uh, Strickland mentioned the problem of the operation of the means of production under capitalism and how that didn't seem to be given any proper foundation in the Communist Manifesto, which is true, it isn't, but it must be said that that's given a very extensive explanation in capital, and we will come to that. Yeah, and, and similar considerations apply also to the philosophic things. If I may have only mentioned one point, this is not such an easy contradiction as you seem to think that the future course of history is determined and yet need for action because the action is a part of the chain. Yeah. The part of the chain. For example, I mean, take ordinary determinism, the older type, Hobbes. 
or who says whatever he is determined. And yet he demands a certain kind of state, this law and law enforcement. But why? This law and law enforcement is a part of the determination. If you want to have people behave properly, they must be determined to behave properly, and that is done by such beautiful things as gallows, jails, and other things. You see? And if you say, well, but that is done by free agents, by men, Hobbes would say, yeah, these free agents are themselves determined in that by their desire for peace. And ultimately, Hobbes, the author of the scheme, is determined by his thought, and perhaps also by his ambition, to propose these things. So that is not, I mean, the difficulty comes up in a much more subtle way. Yeah, and in addition, Marx would say that there are now individuals, or a small group of proletarians, or half-proletarians, who see the future, see the trend, and therefore devise his a clear and consistent policy, he would say that's not an accident, that belongs to the human situation. There are always men around, given a certain level of articulateness, who, who do this kind of thing. Now, uh, whether it is concentrated in one individual called Marx, or in two individuals, Marx, Engels, or in seven individuals, that's accidental. The difficulty comes out in another way. And I don't remember a passage in Marx, but in Engels there occurs this remark in, in the anti during that this communist world society is bound to come as a peril of the destruction of civilization. There is an alternative. For some reason, people might act foolishly or, well, uh, by determination, yeah. someone is killed in 1918. Uh, there's an interesting discussion of that problem in, in Trotsky's history of the Russian Revolution, which it shows really the difficulty of determinism in a concrete form. Now, Trotsky must admit, if Lenin had been killed, uh, since the thing would have uh, run very differently, and surely the, the, the victory in October 1918 would not have taken place. And God knows what then would have happened. But the problem is this, this ultimate alternative. Civilization might perish. Yeah. is admitted by Engels and also by later writers. Now, this is of course very grave. There might be people who say, let civilization perish rather and get this abomination. Then the whole case is passed right off. There is where the difficulty uh, arises. Now, the tacit premise of Marx and I think also of Lenin and of Khrushchev today, is people are not so foolish to ruin themselves when ruin is obvious. In the case of Hitler, ruin was not obvious. There was a fair chance for, from his point of view, and it was touch and go. But now, in the age of terminal nuclear war, uh, it is impossible to play with that kind of thing. You know, a, a minimum of common sense suffices to rule that out. It still might accidentally happen. That's also true, and that is not entirely irrelevant. But I suggest that we... Or do you wish to bring up some special questions? Well, there were very small things. I don't know if it's right. No, then I'd rather not. Yeah. Now, I would suggest we start from a, a few dates. The Communist Manifesto was written and published in 1848. Marx was born in 1818. And I mentioned that 1848 was, of course, the year of revolution in Europe. Yeah. That everyone knows that. And even in Germany. And in 18... I mentioned only one other date now. 18... 31, the death of Hegel. These are, I think, the most important dates. Now, Marx was 13 years old when Hegel died, as you see, and he, he studied and so on, and only about 1837 does he begin to think for himself, which is a fairly young age. And this development was finished roughly 1846. 
1846 and even perhaps a bit before, Marx's position was, philosophical position was, was com completed. And then, after 1848, he began his detailed economic work. He had already very clear notions about economics at the time. As a detailed work began afterward, and 1859 was his critique of political economy, and 1867, I believe, the first volume of Das Kapital. So, these are the uh, key points. Now, I, may, I mention this for one reason, which you will see later is of some relevance. Marx had completed his intellectual development when he was 28 or younger. There is a case, a parallel case in the 19th century, as I, of, which, as, I, as I will show later, that is the case of Nietzsche. Nietzsche died in a sense very young, as you know, because his insanity began when he was 44. But if you compare the young Marx with the young Nietzsche, the young Marx is a much more completed and much less immature than the Nietzsche was when he was 28 or 30. In Nietzsche, the breakthrough came when he was about 40, much later. That is of some interest, as I will, uh, will appear later, but that only in passing. So, at the time when Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, his whole doctrine was already clear in his mind. And he did not present this doctrine in the Communist Manifesto. The Communist Manifesto reveals nothing of its philosophic origin. The work is as I would call it to begin with, a political statement, not a philosophic statement. If I read a few pages from the Communist Manifesto, translated from the German. Every class struggle is a political struggle. The organization of the proletarians to a class and their with to a political party so, in other words, contrary to the vulgar Marxist notion, uh, the political is really the more intense, the higher, the transformation of mere quantity, one can say, into quality. Uh, I remember in, in uh, Trotsky, in his history of the Russian Revolution, when he speaks of the hunger strikes and this kind of hunger, hunger revolts in Petersburg, Petrograd, and other places during the war, and, and other kinds of economic struggles. That's chicken feed. It becomes interesting only when the strike becomes political and becomes a strike for political power. That is perfectly compatible with the assertion that ultimately the relations of production are decisive, but primarily in the everyday life. The real stuff is a political and not economic. So the book is a political state, not a philosophic or economic state. But it is indeed based on philosophy, uh, philosophy and economics. The situation is this. The addressees know less than the writers. It's clear. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to write it. Who are the writers? Officially, a commission of the Communist Party. But in fact, of course, Marx and Engels. Who are the addressees? It's clear. Who are the addressees in the statement? I was aware of that. I presume they're, first of all, the workers. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. uh, why not use a more precise term which Marx uses? If it is more precise. The proletarians, the last, the last call. Proletarians of all countries unite. So the proletarians are the addressees. The writers explain to the proletarians the situation, the prospects, and the tasks of the proletarians. The philosopher economists address not all men, but only those men whose interest makes them receptive to the message. Not the bourgeois, but the proletarians. Why do they do that? Why do they not address all men as proletarians? That's a question of principle, which is not explained here, but presupposed. Marx sets forth, or Marx and Engels sets forth an idea, to use a term 
which was is still in common use and was perhaps in more common use at that time in Germany. I set forth an idea. Now, what is the relation of idea to actualization? Marx had very definite opinions on that. You make a, you elaborate an idea. Well, that can be mere talk, air. But how does it become real? And under what condition does it become real? There is a translative interaction which um, fulfills the ideas. Sure, that's elementary. But what is the condition for that? It's sufficient organization. Oh, no, no. There's something more fundamental than organization, which comes in only secondarily. No. No. Huh? Acceptance of the Yeah, but what makes people accept? Sure. Uh, how strange is a simple word which is still used and which is still like interests. Interests. Marx says somewhere ideas have always made themselves ridiculous if they were divorced from interests. The only people who are interested in this message, who will embrace, who are compelled by their interest to embrace it, are the proletarians, not the non-proletarians. Now, interest means here primarily the selfish interest of a class. I mean, you must not be befuddled by the present usage of interest in. Uh, in uh, present-day political science, you know, you have a group of people who uh, love cats and uh, form a union for the protection of cats, and then it says also an interest group, yeah. you know, is of course absolutely misleading. I mean, then you formalize the concept of interest that it loses the punch, which it always had. So selfish interest, but selfish interest of a class, of a section, we don't have to go now into what a uh, class precisely means. Now, this presupposes one decisive thing. Namely, I to repeat, interests are essentially sexual interests. What does this imply? That latter point is, of course, elementary now via Bentley, uh, process of government. Yeah? But what is the presupposition? Already in Marx, of the assertion that interest is only sexual interest. What is the opposite of sexual interest? That is, proceed step by step. What is an, an interest which is not sexual? What is that? Um, or, yeah, general, common good. System. There is no common good. That's the tacit presupposition. Let us look at, I think that is right at the beginning, the history of all previous society is a history of class struggles. Which implies, as I was really stated, every society of which we know consists of sections or classes. And therefore, the common interest is something very dubious. It may exist to some extent in the fighting against uh, uh, diseases and the building of bridges, perhaps, but in a substantive sense, it doesn't exist. Now, this is the point with, with which, which Mr. Strickler pointed out. This sentence with which they begin the argument, the history of all previous societies, the history of class struggles, is not evidently true. There were class struggles, we can say, but there were also other things. There were, for example, foreign wars. There were the, also there were also war of the roses in England. And uh, as they should prove to us that this was a class struggle, yeah? the two branches of the dynasty. Or the war of independence is not obviously a class struggle, nor the civil war in this country. So that is a mere search for which Marx has yes, ample proof, but somewhere in his uh, desk, well, we don't know that, and that wasn't published. You know, the earlier writings were published only much later, in much uh, after Marx's death, some of them only in our century. Now, what is the reason for this assertion? regarding the class struggle. That there were such classes, rulers and ruled, and if you please, oppressors and oppressed in the past, 
was generally admitted by all democratic people. Yeah, all democratic people. Because that was exactly the uh, idea underlying the democratic revolution. The abolition of oppression. There were free and unfree men in the Middle Ages or before. And now the key tendency is this. That is about a, uh, three or four paragraphs later. Modern bourgeois society, which has emerged from the decay or the destruction of feudal society, has not disposed of the class oppositions. It has only put new classes, new conditions of oppressions, new forms of the struggle in place of the old one. Now let us see what that means in the context. The modern democratic state, which of course at that time did not yet exist, as you know, but it was about to emerge in a much more moment in France, 48, was destroyed by Bonaparte, but it exists in this country, uh, but not in Europe, and surely not in, in uh, semi feudal Germany or Austria and still less in Russia. And even in England, it is, you know, the, that was touch and go, the key year was there about this time. Hegel still was able to protest against the reform bill. It was his last right. So the modern democratic state, the most progressive thing you have, and which you have only in very few places in the world, presents itself as a state of universal freedom and equality. The first society in which everyone is free and equal, and therefore it's a just society. But now comes the punch of Marxism. This society consists, in fact, of oppressors and oppressed, just as every society before. The historical assertion about the past is not interesting. The exciting thing is that the modern democratic state is itself a class state. And here, Marx appears to something which was known to the aggressors, and it was not merely a, a far-fetched assertion. These people who were locked out and tried to associate and were not permitted to associate, you know, all these kind of things, they knew that there was a struggle between labor and capital. It was, uh, they knew that. Now, Marx only says this, your, your experience which you workers have, is not an irrelevant thing, your private fate. That is the most important fact of modern society. That is the point which the Communist Manifesto is to make. So, in other words, at this point, the whole thing becomes empirical, not in the sense of a social science study, but an appeal to what these people know from their daily experience, and therefore much more impressive. The old story of oppression merely continues under new names. That names is too big a word, but I've been overstated one. Now let us again proceed empirically and disregard Marx's philosophic premise in order to see where the philosophical premise must come in to give the thing its character, its unity. Now if we look at the situation dispassionately, and accepting the facts as Marx states them. This oppression of the proletariat by the bourgeoisie is one, the new, most recent form of that universal human phenomenon of oppression, of one class by another. Now, what is the difference from the practical point of view? As a practical point of view means in the first place from the point of view of good or bad. Now, in some respects, the oppression is less bad than in former times. Yeah? Clear, I mean, they are not chained, the workers are not chained, and there is not a, an overseer with a whip, like galley slaves or like uh, Indians in Peru or what have you. They are free workers. But on the, in, on, in other respects, however, the oppression is worse. And that is a point which Marx will bring out, that it is in some respects the worst of all oppressions. And therefore, because it is the worst of all oppressions, because it is the extreme oppression 
for this reason some an wholly unexpected solution to the present problem is possible. But we must proceed step by step. So the, uh, to return then to the point uh, which I made first, the oppression is in some respects worse, in some respects uh, better than in older, in the older orders. That is again an empirical assertion. The present order will be succeeded sooner or later by another one. Would, that would seem to be the simple, common sense of the conclusion. Oppression, we find everywhere in history we find oppression. We find oppression now. And every particular form of oppression had its time. Therefore, the present form of oppression will come to an end and will be succeeded by another form of oppression, where we will be no longer bourgeoisie and proletariat, but X and Y. And no one can know what that X and Y is because human malice is inventive and can find all kinds of those things. So this would be the old-fashioned way of uh, looking at this equation. How does Marx arrive at his solution? At his solution? Now, if oppression is the universal fact of human history, then we have to raise the question, why? Why is man a being which he, uh, oppresses his fellows everywhere? It must be in human nature if it is everywhere. And that, of course, was uh, always said. Now, in the first place, it could be due to human malice. There is a strike of malice, of viciousness in man. And uh, to take one theory which is very pertinent here, that of Rousseau, is the viciousness of man is pride, the desire to be superior to others, and that leads man to oppress his fellow man if he can. Rousseau had, for Marx, Rousseau had disposed of them by the following consideration. Pride, malice, viciousness, is itself a product of society. It does not belong to human nature. Therefore, we can get rid of that. But then there was another reason, a more pedestrian reason. Why do people oppress others? No, not out of malice. Surely there are malicious people, but they are uninterested. I mean, there are exceptions. Really massive things induce men to oppress their others. Oh, is there fellows, and what is that? So, so but desire to have more. I don't want, I don't want to, to be admired by you as a big shot, but I want to live conveniently. And if you have to live in huts so that I can live conveniently, that's your business. If I'm, if I'm more rational and industrious than you, who are lazy and impro improvident, that's your business. Scarcity, in other words, is the reason why they are oppressors and oppressors. And now Marx comes. This true reason why men have always oppressed others, scarcity, has disappeared. For, and that he proves empirically. For we have a phenomenon without parallel in earlier times. And that phenomenon is overproduction. Overproduction. Men produce more than they can use. And what is wrong is the distribution. In other words. This being the case, there is no need for future oppression. Plenty makes oppression superfluous. More, more and more than that. But still, the present oppression could go on indefinitely. Yeah? So it is the last, it, there is no longer a need for oppression. But some people are better off in the present system. The oppressors, why can they not perpetuate their system indefinitely? It might be possible. Marx says no. The present form of oppression is self-destructive, self-defeating, and therefore the emphasis on the progressive character of bourgeois society, 
That is not a state of things of 1848, which can be frozen and then be forever. The dynamism is essential to civil society. So it means the overproduction now is child's play compared with the overproduction 30 years hence, 50 years hence, 100 years hence, and so on. And therefore, every, the, the, oppress, the oppressors will become ever richer, the, the oppressed will become ever poorer, and therefore, the present system is not only the last form of oppression, it is also one which is necessarily self-destructive. That means, to say it in a very ge in a general way, to come to make some advance in the argument, the present oppression is unique. It is not only one special form of this age-old phenomenon, but it's a unique form. In other words, the two classes which we have now the bourgeois and the proletariat are not just two classes like any other classes we have in, in earlier times. They are the absolute classes. The absolute classes. There is a qualitative difference between these classes now and any earlier classes. Still more precisely, because the class of the future is the proletariat, not the bourgeois. The proletariat is the absolute class. Now, uh, there are a few uh, details which are important uh, to mention by the way. I'll come back to the question on which I started. Oppression is a universal fact. Therefore, why not forever and ever? And needless to say that our experience up to now, with communism in particular, does not refuse to seize it. Yeah? Because no one can say that there is no oppression in Russia or China. I mean, the, to limit myself to an understatement. But still, Marx, is, uh, of course, denied that this would necessarily be the case. Now, the proletariat is in a unique position. It is an absolute class. And this absoluteness refers to its oppression. <coughs> it is the absolute oppression which the proletariat undergoes. Now, that to be is our thing. I refer to the Indians in Peru and this, after the Spanish conquest and, and for quite some time, and uh, well, one could perhaps also think of other examples. Was it, were they not treated infinitely worse with these bloodhounds, you know, and all the kinds of things the Spaniards did than the modern proletarians, even in the worst slums of Manchester or Lyon or whatever they were? Now, what is that? What makes the proletarian oppression? so particularly uh, terrible. The proletarian, the oppression of the proletarian is the most revolting of all oppressions. More revolting than what the Spaniards did to the Indians or the Romans to the public slaves in mines, etc. One can perhaps say this, and here I come back to the point which was mentioned by Mr. Kropsey last time. For the first time, the oppressed are treated as merchandise, as merely non-human. Again, what about these slaves? Uh, well, what what uh, the Nazis did uh, to the Jews and others in the concentration camps? Now, I mention this only in passing because there is a very common delusion about this point. When such beasts, as we might say, torment their enemies in the most bestial way, so do not act as beasts. Shall I explain that? So bestial is therefore a metaphoric expression which is very minimal, but it's not precise. What does this, what does the tormentor, what does the tormentor do with the, with the human being he torments? He does this only to human beings. Only very accidentally and uninterestingly does someone do this kind of thing to, to tables or to other things. He knows that the being he torments is a human being. That is essential for the act. 
So what we call bestiality is a particular behavior of humans to humans. And therefore, if is this the Spaniards and the, and the Indians, they, they, they still treated them as humans in the most uh, uh, inhuman way, that's not the point, but they would not have treated in that way trees or stones. So a capitalist, from Marx's point of view, treats his workers with his, in, in the same spirit in which he treats uh, his merchandise. I mean, in his way, he even takes care of it naturally because he doesn't want his merchandise to spoil and he doesn't want uh, his labor force to be inefficient. Uh, it's therefore, in a very radical sense, that's, uh, from Marx's point of view, the most inhuman a dream. To say, to, to repeat, from this point of view, the older barbarians were perverted human relations. But they were human relations. So this is no longer a human relation. It's not. But that is not the decisive point. Let me see, there is an other passage, not in the Communist Manifesto, but in his uh, Marx, uh, uh, National Economy and Philosophy in earlier writing. Marx gives this description of the situation of the modern proletariat. It is the, the dwellings of the modern worker, he says, are caves, caverns, yeah? holes, not fit for human habitation. But all right, men lived very well in caves. Why not a modern cave dweller organization that could last for ages? Marx says no. This there is a fundamental difference between the old cave dwellers and the modern proletariat. And he you, uh, describes the difference by saying that the modern proletarian, as distinguished from the old cave dweller, returns to a cave in an alienated form. We have to come back to this term alienated. The savage in his cover feels at home in his cave as fish in water. But the cellar habitation of the poor is an inimical, inimical power, an inimical power which he cannot and may not regard as his own, where he cannot say after all the hardships outside when he comes home, here I am at home. For a very simple reason, he is in the home of someone else in an alien home, namely, which far-fetched fact does Marx think of here? And? Yeah, in other words, he's a tenant, and he can be thrown out every day. So he does not even have a home as a cave dweller. And therefore, but to return to the principle which we will try to explain, the key phenomenon is alienation. That modern workers may have all kinds of modern ideas, may have kinds, many conveniences, many rights, which the mass of men never had, is uninteresting for Marx. Because the fundamental character of his existence is what no existence of oppressed people before was alienated. Alienated. And we must gradually see to understand. What is the more? Yes? Are you saying that of in previous just class society, according to Marx, it was not elevated? That is a very necessary question. And I'm grateful. I don't compare me to make a parenthesis. In one sentence. There is an essential difference between all early alienation and the modern alienation. There was alienation. But it is so radical, the difference is so radical, that you may call the modern world and the modern world alone the alienated world. We come back to that later. But more specifically or concretely, in the case of the bourgeois and the proletariat, the oppressor degrades the oppressed. But 
That was always. But now something else. He, the oppressor must simultaneously degrade and elevate the oppressed. So that this makes the situation revolting. Revolting not only for the spectator who is revolted when he sees a Spaniard uh, chasing the Indians with his brother, but it makes it, the Indian cannot revolt because he is hopeless. Well, he's simply the prey of the blood, perhaps. In this situation, so the, uh, the situation in the modern period is of this unique character, that it is revolting to the spectator and revolting to the victim. Therefore, the corrective is in the situation. In the situation, Spaniard, Indian, no corrective in the situation because they were so powerless they could simply become slaves and remain slaves and try to flatter their masters, perhaps, the individual, so that he would have it better. But here the corrective is in the situation. The oppressor must degrade the oppressed and make him sensitive to of his degradation. That is a disgusting Now one can illustrate this in various ways. The bourgeois cannot allow the proletariat, what the worst slave owner had to allow. Since the oppressed became accustomed to his degradation and takes it for granted, and thus became reconciled to his slave because of the revolutionary character of the relation. It is the, the constant transformation of the living condition. More simply, the bourgeois must compel the proletariat to become literate. He can't do his job if he can't read and write. Whereas the former oppressors prevented the oppressed from learning to write. But other education is needed, technical education, even to some extent legal education. And so in other words, he must he raises the, the level, not necessarily of external living conditions, but the level of expectations. And also more shocking is the disappointing of these expectations. That, I believe, is the, the practical point which Marx tries to drive home. The people's circumstances of proletarians will necessarily feel extremely humiliated. But look at another point. When in modern times, one tribe for another, type A1, the males, the surviving males of tribe B were enslaved. If the people of tribe B could complain, they would have done exactly the same thing to tribe A. The principle to which both referred was identical. People who are licked in a war deserve to be saved. Yeah? I mean, there was no appeal possible. But now the oppressors go out and tell the oppressed, every man is born free and equal. Our society is radically different from all former societies because it's a just society and still oppressed. It won't do. There is no longer a principle to which people can no longer oppress with a good conscience. In former times, they could oppress with a good conscience because the oppressed themselves could not deny the right of oppression. That was is a new situation. And this teaching of the rights of men, I mean, Marx does not go into that, but it's perfectly in the spirit of Marx or of Hegel to introduce that. That's part of the mechanism. That is not an accident. So, in other words, it's not an accident that the old changes were made in the name of positive law. You remember that the war of the Dutch against the Spaniards in the late 16th century was made on the basis of positive documents. These laws of, of the low countries. Yeah. And in the English Revolution in 1688 to some extent, the old, it was uh, 
and to uh, some extent, even the measure of independence, in so far as it uh, was an appeal made to the English law, yeah, which uh, allegedly then the British government had transgressed. But still, in, uh, certainly in the, the, in the American Revolution, and more visibly still in the French Revolution, there was no appeal to positive law. There was an appeal to natural law, to the right of man as man. And that was not an accident, because the bourgeois revolution, revolutions, there breaks with the positive, with the inherited, and with the traditional, in a way in which no such break had ever occurred. Then the bourgeois class is the first radical revolutionary class, according to Marx. Therefore, they had to appeal to national law, to universal principles, as it says, from local principles. And these principles, of course, they affect everyone in the society. You cannot preach the rise of men all the time, and in, when there is a revolution and you need the strong arms of the Paris workers, and then send them home. Of course you can't do that, but that creates uh, difficulties. You see, the situation is different than that of the Spaniard and the Indian, to take this example. A man circumstanced as a proletarian will necessarily feel extremely humiliated and are able successfully to abolish the exploitation. That is the message of the Communist Manifesto. In conclusion, communism is evidently reasonable to the proletariat. And I would say in this presentation, Given the situation as it existed at that time in Western Europe, it is not merely rhetoric. You must not forget that the great change in the situation of the working class came after all. And at that time, uh, such an anti-communist as Carlyle, Thomas Carlyle, said exactly the same thing about what was going on in Manchester and other places as what Engels said. As a matter of fact, Carlyle said it before Engels. And Engels' book on the condition of the working class in England is based on Carlyle, among others. But these other people like Carlyle were reactionaries. They tried to go back they say to the pre Whiggish ideas. Archbishop Lord, you know, because that was a great story. In the fight between the Stuarts and the Whigs, the Stuarts stood for a social policy. That, I mean, uh, Tony has presented this, I think, most clearly in his book on, how is it called? Capitalism and the Spirit of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the first chapter, I think, for that. Yeah. So that, that was the situation. Yeah, but now let us go a bit deeper. And again, a very simple observation. Communism may be reasonable for the proletarian, but Marx was not a proletarian. He was a poor man, but he was not a proletarian. Why then does Marx take the side of the proletariat? He speaks of the fact that in a certain stage of the development, members of the non-proletarian classes will join the proletariat. Marx view, Marx joins the proletariat because he thinks that the cause of the proletariat is the cause of man. Communism, in other words, is evidently reasonable, according to Marx's claim, uh, claim, not only for the proletariat, but, I now use the German again term, an sich, in itself. It is not only for the proletariat, but in itself. And therefore, the not petty human being who thinks beyond his own interest and his interest of the class will uh, be induced by this reason to this uh, uh, participation. Uh, what was it? Yes. Under the condition of 
as long as there is political society, master, there cannot be communism. Because political society means coercive society. And the coercive society exists as long as coercion is needed. And according to Marx's analysis, coercion is needed because of the antagonism of classes. And therefore, there cannot be communism. Therefore, we have to use it and there is a common good in the final society. The final society will have a common good. As that common good will be no problem, and therefore there will be no need for coercion. But I suggest this improvement on your formulation. The fact that Marx takes the side of the communist presupposes one thing that communism, the cause of the Voltaire, is the cause of man. Marx is guided by an idea of man. That would be the more exact We can start from that. And now let us see what that means. I give you one formulation which comes from this, also from the manifesto. What is that? What will be after the Voltaire has won? Universal freedom. Good. But Marx does not leave it at this point. This point. Freedom, we, we have learned from Rousseau or from Kant, the freedom of each requires the freedom of all. That was old stuff by Marx's time. Yeah? I mean, you cannot be free, rationally free, if not all are free. That was the key point of Rousseau and Kant. Marx goes beyond that. And that gives us an inkling of what his idea of man is. It, it, Marx is not primarily concerned with freedom in general. Marx, nor with the freedom uh, to pursue happiness as you see fit. <coughs> it's not so The so free development, free development of each. In other words, not if you have a fancy notion of happiness, a mere idiosyncrasy, that you can follow that, that is not a great good. That may be practical uh, because of the complexity of any other solution. It may be uh, convenient, but that's not in itself a sensible system. But that everyone should develop his faculties, that is sensible. Now, Marx therefore says his future society is covered by the fact that the free development of each is a condition for the free development of all. That's all. There is perhaps another formula which we can use. And what does he mean to free the dog? Well, have you never heard of a poor boy who is musically gifted? And then he had to become a minor. Yeah? And he could never develop his musical fact. Have you heard of that? You can imagine. And another boy is mathematically gifted. Another boy is gifted to others. And it's prevented. Yeah? So in, in all societies as we know them, in all scarcity societies at any rate, quite a few human beings are prevented from developing their fact. Now what Marx says is that but some men develop their faculties in a tremendous way, Shakespeare works. Marx would say this, with all admiration for these great men, he would say this, that there is some defect not noticeable or perhaps on a purely artistic sphere. But if we take a broader view of the work of art, there is some effect, defect in any development of an individual, however gifted, if it is bought at the price of the non-development of others. Yeah? That's it. Just as, uh, according to the more common formula, the freedom of each, which means that you can, uh, the freedom of each uh, in, in the common sense, freedom before the law and this kind of thing, yeah? uh, presupposes the freedom of all. Yeah? Because your freedom is not secure except 
If your freedom is based on the ground, which is universal, i.e., which gives freedom to everyone else, that was the simple argument of the first one. Is there a concept here of love to mutual supporting of one another? That doesn't enter here. I mean, uh, that would be secondary. That is Feuerbach, and that's not Marx. And Marx was too tough for this kind of thing. Uh, or you can also say too legal. Uh, but you must not forget another point, uh, a point which, uh, of which much is made by present-day liberals, that you cannot recognize po potentialities of young children because of the slums in which they live. How many people can ever dream of developing their faculties? Yeah? Because of the terrible conditions under which they live. And so the free development of each is possible only in a society based on plenty, but a plenty reasonably distributed. That's the point. Yeah? Yes, uh, Mr. Johnson? Would this require something like a, a technocracy, uh, a kind of not, not in Marx or Peter. And Marx, you know, that is, of course, one of his right uh, degrees at which the whole thing ends. The formula which goes back either to Saint Simon or to Proudhon, I don't remember the moment. And no government of men, but only administration of things. Technocracy is, of course, government of men. Government of men by the technocrats. Now, that the administration of things is simply not possible. Without government of men, it was not sufficiently considered by Marx, nor by Lenin. Because all these terrible things, Lenin and so did, uh, were of course meant as provisional measures. And so on. But that you cannot have a large society without some people telling others as government of men. Yeah? But what about, say, the position of uh, Calum music? We were to consider a different number of free free society, wouldn't there the warmth and receiving this, uh, since everyone would have equal use of the qualities? And yeah, that is not a bad you know, Marx, they, that is always the, 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 uh, the box into which Marx can put convenient, inconvenient grace, but simply say, I can't say what's the quality and it has to be to have the power and exactly how they will do. There are obviously two alternatives. The first is, the monetary, he who likes to become a musician should become a musician even if it is only a gift. Or the other is some experts who have judgment on gifts, tell him, and then of course it might lead to the conclusion that someone has a gift for something without any inclination for it. Yeah. It's a hard question. But as we come to your passage later, when we come to the German ideology, where Marx seems to have that such an idea that if all these necessities which can't be stopped, we have already, everyone who develops all habits, and that gradually, everyone who has all habits, everyone who has all habits, and the famous story with Lysenko, Mark, you know, Stalin's Lucas, Lysenko, was also a Stalin, and Mark and Stalin was at least, in spite of his bloodthirsty character, a good theoretician at this point. Because it's absolutely necessary for Marxism to accept Lysenko. Because if we have an ideological inheritance of which we will never get rid, the natural inequality and diversity will, of course, exist as long as human beings exist. And you will always have specialized human beings, except some geniuses or fakes. Yeah? But the majority of men will be special, special gifts. The division of labor will be a natural phenomenon. And the division of labor cannot, in order to abolish the division of labor, you have to abolish the genes. You know what I mean? We have to, 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 to not to review, but to silence the opponents of the same. And that's what Mark has started with. 
But there's a third alternative for your experts, and that is that they not only determine, I used to say, secondly, uh, who has musical qualities, but how many musicians are in the need. And that's okay, but that would be only a sub case because then you would, if they have sensitive musical rights, I would like to believe. reply to that. Consciousness varies the environment. Yeah. What is the status of the idea of man? That's the question which we have to write. Right. 
all ideas depend on being, because ideas have to do with what Marx calls the consciousness. The consciousness. And the consciousness depends on being. Therefore, the consciousness of a feudal serf differs from the consciousness of a modern bourgeois. Therefore, their ideas differ. Therefore, the ideas of men differ. The idea of men must be, according to Marx, a product of history. His idea of men was a new idea, which was hardly more than 40 years older than Marx. And I, I don't believe that you can trace it beyond Fichte, of whom I spoke in as a, my initial lecture. The idea of man is a historical product. Now, what does this mean? We, you, we are at the threshold, if this metaphor is bearable, of an old friend of ours. I call the friend by its name relativism. If all ideas are products of history, then the idea of man, as Marx sees it, is a product of history and will therefore be superseded in due time by a new idea of man. How does Marx, Marx protect himself against it? All his ideas are products of history. And that we made one tacit premise, I made one tacit premise in this argument. Let me say history is an infinite process. And then you have this simple situation. Here are the states of history. And here you have the ideas yeah, corresponding. And that goes on infinitely. Of course, there might be a cosmic catastrophe and the whole thing might stop, but that would be a purely external end. In itself, history is unfinishable, and therefore relativism is necessary. How does Marx protect himself against that? Let me, there's a passage which possibly Mr. not Mr. Who, who reads the next paper? Mr. Benjamin, yeah, uh, will have to discuss. Communism as a positive outgo, that is where how do you say preservation both preservation, destruction, and surpassing. Transformation. Transformation. Yeah, but it is also the conservation. Preservation, destruction, and Enhanced. And communism has posted our feelings to the grasp of the private property as of human self alienation and therefore as real appropriation of human of human to human essence, through man, for man, therefore as complete conscious and a uh, complete and conscious return of man to himself as a social, i.e. So, uh, a human man. The word is return. return. History does not have the linear character. The linear character means that history is a cyclical character. We must understand that problem, not in the old sense. There is a beginning and a return to it. Therefore, it is finite. Therefore, it is finite. You see, when Marx speaks of alienation, he implies, of course, that man was originally with himself or himself, not alienated. The beginning man is with himself. At the end, he is again with himself. In, the, in between, there is alienation. You don't, you don't believe that? 
Tell me your objection. Now, my father seems too good to base to say that I'm just a I think that, um, are you talking about return to nature? No, I mean, is that, uh, no, I didn't, I, I didn't tell him. No, no, um, that is something. Communism, private property, final communism corresponds strictly to Rousseau's state of nature, despotic societies, and natural society on the human level, uh, i.e., the modern republic. That is necessary. Uh, Marx, in contradistinction to the ordinary evolution, yes. and you know what happened that after Marx, yeah, after these early writings, in, in at the same time when Marx published his first economic book, 1859, there appeared another book, if I am not mistaken. We were reminded of it very forcibly, of it last year on this campus. Darwin. And uh, Marx accepted Darwin with enthusiasm, and of course Engels in a way still more, and therefore we know Marxism generally in the Darwinistic transformation. That's not the original form of Marxism. And if he takes a vulgar Darwinian view, then it is this. There is, of course, no question of self-alienation, uh, of alienation. A man was a brute, yeah? And you know, these famous monkeys who were compared by floods to, uh, or no, not by floods. First by floods to jump, no, what happened? They had to jump down from the trees, I believe, and then they had to walk on their feet, yeah? And so gradually they became human, you know, verbal symbols and all that. Uh, that is not the Marxist view. Because once you start, these men were not with themselves. They were not even human. Yeah? And therefore, therefore, you can at least try to understand the process in purely progressive terms. From these mon half monkeys to Charles Darwin. Ever better and better. Then, of course, then you have also an infinite process. There is, you know, there is no end, no such incision possible as Marx has in mind. And Marx, as a mere, I'm not concerned with this passage, the very term alienation implies that man was originally not alienated. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Don't uh, see that. It seems to me that all implies that man has a basic human nature and he is alienated from that basic human nature answers what it has to do with whether he ever was not alienated. I don't understand what history has to do with it. I mean, all alienation means that man has a basic human nature and is in some sense alienated from that basic human nature. It doesn't have to mean that at some point. It's really misleading. Marx, I mean, there is a certain basic human nature like the digestive system and the five senses, of course, Marx should admit. But it is a misleading term for Marx. Because when you speak of the basic human nature, you imply that this basic human nature is a key to everything you And that marks absolutely enough. The history, the changes are much more important than the basic human nature. Therefore, psychology, in the ordinary sense of the term, is uninteresting. You can say there is a basic human situation. Men living together with other men. Uh, from nature, yeah? I mean, in the mass of yeah? from nature, produce, produce. This is a fundamental situation which always exists. Out of this, and that is the key to everything, 
But as a key, it is not sufficient. You have to make some further steps. You have to understand how this basic phenomenon, men in society producing what they need for a living, produces law, produces God, produces religion, produces philosophy, and goes this particular course, which is called the history of the world, culminating in a return on a much higher level to the same situation where men as social beings commonly produce their means of living. But we must, uh, there were some others who had difficulties, yes? The first one. as humility in relativism. Yes, we I'll, know better. Well, uh, then I'll, I'll use another term. He recognized his theory was, a, was, was merely a, uh, a product of a given historical state. No. You know? then, no. They, 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 I mean, there was one man who was clever enough to try it. Clever enough, I mean, he was exposed to Western thought. I don't believe there is another Marxist writing in a Western language who comes within hailing distance of that thing. And his things are not accessible in English, as far as I'm concerned. Comes from Hungary. Look at He did that in a very interesting book called History and Class Consciousness, 1922. And what happened? He was thrown out. Nah. <laughs> and he had to leave it down, he had to eat his words, and as you will come to most abominable, uh, how do you call this? Blacker? Uh, how do you say? No. Sick of the Of style. What? Yes. Uh, in order to it And I must confess that purely theoretically speaking, Stalin was of course right, because no touch interpretation would mean an effect that Marxism will prove to be, in the end, a true and untrue doctrine, which was social immensely powerful. In other words, a comprehensive definition, Marxism is as true today as the idea of the French Revolution here in the 1770s. Now, of these theories, Marx has found that they were eminently useful in order to prepare the French Revolution. But of course, they're not true. They proved to be wrong. And so Marxism will bring about, will be excellent for bringing about the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat. But once these changes take place, we will away and see something wholly unexpected. Stalin is from well, uh, along, right on this point, though, uh, I can't produce the documentation, but uh, I recall that there are a number of instances that Marx chided his followers near the end of his life and said that they should not become Marxists. And the auspicism of this person yeah, here is probably a product of what Marx no, wanted to he, no, he, he meant by Marxists, stupid people who memorized without understanding certain things he and not, uh, he did not reject his doctrine. Not Marx was a very tough fellow in this event. But I, yeah. There's further evidence, though, even in uh, uh, the introduction by Engel to uh, this manifesto, which he points out that certain of Marx's values were not just the relation of the Communist Party and other parties, 
of man. There is no question about that. I mean, the, the tactical changes, and, even, uh, uh, and because fundamentally this is our only uh, part of the tactical change, that the bourgeoisie is was cleverer and more inventive than anyone believed, or at least than Marx believed. Yeah? And therefore, the development of, uh, of imperialism first, and then the more recent enormous rises in productivity, which were enormously foreseen by Marx. Yeah? So that the capitalist society is no longer dependent on a literally understood world market, in the way in which Marx took it for granted that it would be. All this kind of thing, that belongs to uh, the secondary things, does not affect the overall prospect by virtue of which communism is what it is. Yeah, you read the other one. When you use the word cyclical view of history, are you using that term in a fairly limited sense, in a non, uh, non usual sense. It seems to me Marx has a very linear view of history uh, in comparison to the, the Greek mystic view of. Oh, God. But I, 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 excuse me, these uh, simple formulas which you use are known to me, and I did it with my eyes open. I used it as, a, as something which sounded to begin with as a paradoxy. Surely not cyclical in, this, in, the, in that old sense. 
But nor is Marx's view simply linear progressive. That's the point. And if I use the term cyclical, I am on very good terms because that is a Hegelian term from which the Marxian notion stems. It's a cycle. The cycle alone, when you arrive at the end, where, at the point from which you started, then you know you have finished the way. And uh, for Hegel to the end, is infinitely richer than the beginning. But only the fact that you return to the end and you return to the beginning without thinking of the beginning, a comparison to it, gives you a guarantee of the end. As I say, the very term alienation proves that this is an essential part of the Marxist teaching. Since man is originally by himself or with himself, i.e. not alienated, he is primarily a being which produces in society things for use. Now, what does this mean? If you start from a simple common sense view of man, Man begins, no traditions, no inheritance, no alienation in any form. He is a productive element, all right. But surely he does not produce merely uh, turnips or, or, or acorns or whatever it is. He also produces thoughts about the holy in which he lives. Th lightning and thunder. He, can, he doesn't limit himself to run away. He thinks somehow about it. Foolish thoughts. Unscientific thoughts, surely, but he produces myths in the same moment in which he produces tools. Now, if that were so, and they could think of the common sense, then man is in a strict sense alienated from the very beginning because he is given over to these products of his mind, which I call it now myths. That the myths come later and reflect the primary production, the turnips or the tools, yeah, is guaranteed. That is only another formulation of the fact that man is originally not alienated. Because if these people uh, catch a hare or collect acres, whatever they do, they know what they are doing. They are fully at home in their world. Yeah. But when they say that is some ancestor whom they haven't buried, about, who is sending the thunder, that they are alienated. Now, do you see that if men were, uh, uh, there is an essential connection between the concept of alienation and the primacy of material production. The intellectual production is the already the alienation. And the end of the process will be that you have an a an intellectual production which destroys the alienated intellectual production, i.e. All myths, religions, philosophies must. There is an essential connection between these two points. But now I come to the question with which I must conclude this argument. How can we know that man is originally by himself and with himself, i.e., a being which is, so to speak, fully enlightened? Knows, I mean, doesn't say anything about things which he doesn't uh, understand, and uh, knows on fear, hunger, food, uh, need of food, and so testing by trial and error, he finds acorns are good and certain kinds of mushrooms are bad, and so on, and then and he produces. But he is not basically in error, that's the point. That man is not alienated means also knows that he's not basically in error. How do we know that this is man's original state? Or in other words, how do we know that the production of things 
for food, shelter and so on, is prior to the production of myths. The whole Marxian doctrine depends on that. Because if the production of myths is called evil with the production of things, then the production of myths might affect the production of things. And uh, then it is impossible to give a materialistic philosophy of history. Then you must proceed uh, in, in a much more cautious way. More simply stated, but I think that the more simple statement is less clear than the one which I have chosen. Why is the so-called economic activity the fundamental activity? That question we must answer. Because that was always the post. But I hope you, in other words, it is, we have first an idea of man. This idea of man is opposed to the great, exposed to the great difficulty that all ideas are historically conditioned. And therefore, Marx's idea of man may be provisional and to be superseded by an entirely opposite idea which no one can now imagine. Marx disposed of that by conceiving of the historical process as a fundamentally cyclical process, and that is implied in the notion the historical process is one of alienation and abolition of the alienation. Man alienates himself first, into products, and then he recovers control of these products, takes them back. That is the abolition of alienation. But alienation implies that man is originally with them by himself, originally. And that means more concretely that the production of things is prior to the production of thoughts, of myths. This, in its turn, presupposes that the so-called economic activity is man's fundamental activity. What is the basis for this assertion? If, well, that is, it, is it, what would you say if you have, what, what is the reason underlying the, the seemingly plausible reason? The seemingly plausible reason is that we must first eat before we can sing. Yes, that's true. But that, of course, is based on a very grave error if one regards this as sufficient. Because what comes first in time is not necessarily the decisive thing. The condition is not the essence. In other words, this beast called man, which must eat before it thinks, yet has the capacity to think already. Before it eats, it belongs to it, and that it must first, uh, in order to fully act, in order fully to activate the power of thinking, it must first eat. Does not mean that you can explain what man does afterward, after he is no longer starving, in terms of the food or the productive of activity preceding the thinking activity. That therefore, Marx must give as an account of why he can nevertheless say, as though this food-producing being is from the very beginning a stinking being, and he must give us an account why nevertheless the food-producing activity, or the productive activity, generally speaking, the, the production of things is more basic, and not merely prior in time, than the production of thoughts. Yes. Yeah, in the statement that man was originally not alienated, I'm not sure what does the word original refer to. What is meant by the word original? Well, we cannot obviously we cannot have any empirical knowledge of that. Of course, we are saying no documents can possibly lead us back. Yeah, and if we find. Uh, uh, stones or, or instruments, and so they don't tell us enough about, they don't tell us anything about men's thoughts. So that is a construction, and, and, and that is wholly legitimate. Because if man has come into being, and there was not yet any tradition, any accumulation of experience or else. Yeah. We can't help thinking of that, and though we cannot never get a scientific answer to it. There is, 
there are two alternatives, at least of interest to so us here. One is to say, man was from the outset an animal capable of thinking in a way in which no other living being on earth is capable of it. And this must have played a role from the very beginning in ways which we cannot find out in detail. In other words, man at the beginning uh, must have been as much open to the strangenesses, thunders, earthquakes, whatever have you, wholly unknown animal, strange animals and whatever, strange diseases, whatever, and must have tried to give an account of that. This account could not for reasons which I believe will be universally admitted, but have been mythical accounts, yeah? not scientific accounts. You would admit that. So in other words, from this point of view, the myth production is coeval with the material production. That would seem to be the most natural suggestion. But Marx says, no, the material production is more fundamental than the myth production. Now, if he means to say the material production be, must precede in time the myth production, because you cannot think, however crazily, be, if you are starving, that is an irrelevant consideration, as I tried to show, because what is prior in time, if we want to speak of that way, is the human constitution. Because that food producing, thing, which being, uh, uh, was had already a human stomach and human constitution also in other respects. And uh, Marx uh, is always a reasoning why the thing production uh, is essentially more fundamental or the fundamental compared with the myth production or thought production. To the honor of Marx, we must say, he did not shirk that responsibility and tried to show why economics is metaphysics. That is only an other expression yeah, for what I said. Be, be, uh, economics, let us say, has to do with things production, not with thoughts production. And the, and the economics is a science of, of, thought, of thing production in its various stages. This science of thing production is, according to Marx, as though Marx does not use the term, the fundamental science, metaphysics. That sounds a very fantastic assertion, but it is, also, and it is a fantastic assertion. But on the other hand, I believe it does more honor to Marx than to make from out, out of Marx a positivist, you know, a man who refuses to think about the fundamental issues. You know, in the writer, in the later form, of course, it is so. There is, of course, no metaphysics that goes without saying, and not even in the young Marx, but what he proposes, in fact, in some of this useful writing, is such an equation. And I will try to explain this next time. We don't have the time now for that. But do you see, do we agree as to the problem? Do we agree as to the problem? Rabbi Weiss. What is the uh, idea of man as a uh, person who can develop his potentialities, his capacities, uh, a man's man? This isn't at the beginning of the process. Okay, I mean, I will mean, answer the question as I have stood, although I know that I did not understand. Now, the idea of the development of the human faculty is at least as old as ours. But the question is, of course, in Aristotle it was understood, these faculties are very different in different human beings. There is a hierarchy of these faculties, yeah? and that there could be a full development of the faculties of the was from Aristotle's point of view both undesirable and impossible. So we are concerned then with a more precise formulation that a just society is a society in which each 
develops all his faculties, and where perhaps as, uh, man has become equal as regards his faculties. In this form, I do not know the doctrine earlier than Fichte. And in German philosophy, I can mention for Marx and Marx Rudy. And then also Plato. What, what I uh, meant was uh, if at the end of the historical process, the, the goal is the development of each person's faculties, uh, and, and this is in some sense a return to the beginning. In and, some sense. And at the same time, the beginning, uh, in the beginning, man is basically just a creature who produces things. Well, then, how does. Uh, oh, I mean, surely uh, these men who are supposed to develop their faculties in the classless societies are altogether the product of that process. These savages at the beginning who lived in caves yeah, and ate, ate raw meat and uh, I don't know, and, and uh, all this kind of thing, they of course could not possibly develop any faculties except those of uh, running, hitting, and, uh, you know, and, and cutting and this kind of thing. Surely not, because of scarcity. It was a return only in one point. These first men, yeah, these first men were not alienated. They were not under the spell of their own creations in all history. Man has been under the spell of his own creations. Now, I'm sorry, I, I, I must tell you what Marx means by that. I mean, although it must hurt your feelings. God, for example, is, of course, from Marx's point of view, such a creation. And all gods, all mythical beings, but not only that, man, the human institutions, the state, the society, government, law, these are all human creation, and man regarded them not as his products, but as somehow above him. And finally, the thing ends in the rule of money, or the economic laws, whichever side you will think, which, according to Marx, are ultimately, but only ultimately, Man's creations, insofar as they depend, there would be no economic laws without capital, and capital itself is a human creation. And only by taking it back, by reappropriating what man had originally put out of himself, that's the, that's the image. Man exteriorates something, externalizes it. That first step. And then, the second step, he regards this external as his gods, as his ideas, his standards, whatever, whatever. Yeah? That is the alienation. Man regards himself as a creature of alien powers, whereas he, these powers are his creation. And that is not abolished, according to Marx, by the scientific consciousness, which to some extent takes these things away, but because the most subtle and refined form of alienation is that of capitalist society, where money on capital rule and uh, uh, apparently with, uh, as a kind of eternal laws. And the end of the process is a reappropriation. Man recognizes himself to be the creator of gods. By this very fact, he takes them back. Now, this notion of, and that will be become clear in Mr. Benjamin's paper, when he left, so I can say that. <laughs> this is Hegel. Only Hegel did not mean, he did not speak of man. Hegel speak of, spoke of the mind not simply the human mind. But the fundamental notion is there is the fundamental phenomenon of the beginning is mind. Mind alienates itself. And the key alienation, 
for Hegel is nature. Here, this is alienated mind. But then there is also a kind of alienation on the human level. That's, and the end of the process in Marx in Hegel too is that man recognizes mind, uh, that everything is mind or the work of the mind. There is nothing outside of mind. That is the Hegelian schema which Marx takes over, replacing mind with a capital M, which Hegel can also call God, therefore. Replacing mind by man. That makes it in many respects more commonsensical, because every one of us knows human beings, and no one has seen mind with a capital M. Because therefore, Marx is very, you know, therefore also the crude language which he frequently uses, a man of business talking about these absurd German speculators. And yet, as Marx recognized all the time in very uh, powerful passages, so he, he, the, he says he took care of the self alienation, but still in an alienated form. He even saw the, that the fundamental phenomenon is alienation. But he did not see it sufficiently because of his erroneous beginning, not with a true beginning, man, but with the, uh, uh, but with a fantastic beginning, capital, man with a capital M. Now, the key problem in Hegel, if I may mention this in passing, that, that must be the end of what I said today, is nature. That that man, the characteristically human, has a mind character, consciousness character. That is not too really difficult to grasp. But what about nature? What about nature? Oh, this problem. Hegel must say, in order to maintain his quote monistic thesis, that this is alienated mind. What's the downfall of Hegel, historically speaking, this philosophy of nature? And Marx replaces mind by man. You can see trees are men, the rocks, the mountains are men. And yet, Marx ascribes to man what Hegel ascribes to mind dash God. You see, in a certain sense, it still makes sense to say nature is mind, and using the traditional form, just because it's a creature of God, of mind. Yeah. Does that make sense to make sense? But when you replace mind by man, and what, uh, what, what do trees, mountains, uh, elements, and of course we say that it's alienated man, you see the alienated in the French sense, uh, man. And if you say that, but Marx must say this in a way, not so stupid, it is, but he must say it in a way. How, how can he prove that this is in a way? Because it is by its nature susceptible of being conquered by man. It becomes in this sense human. It becomes material for man, and there is the man stamps it is as human. And in this sense, and I believe I, I, believe I can show this more clearly next time, it is so that man, as a conqueror of nature, is a God, takes the place of God. Yeah, but if this is so, the science of man is, is metaphysics. But in what capacity, may I ask, does man conquer nature? Not a speculator. There he leaves nature alone. But as worker, as industrialist, as engineer, as in, quote, economic being. So the, it is the economic activity of man, the material production of man, which establishes the unity of man and non-man. 
And since that is a key division of things, man and non-man, and the, the unifying thought is the highest thought, and that highest thought is material production, economics is metaphysics. That it is still a fantastic thought, naturally, but given the premises which Marx has, and which so many today would accept without any difficulty, that there are only men and non-human things, the question of their unity, I mean, either you reduce men to non-men, but by this simplistic formula, man is only, there's only quantitative difference between man and beast, and then you come into great absurdities, which Marx always avoids. And then you have the question of their unity. And then Marx is at least respectable that he tried. And whether his, uh, I don't believe his solution is terrible. Now, is that Mr. Propsy, I was very unjust to you. Now, is this a supposed to teach justice? Do we have to teach it by example? The only thing is. Now, when you said at the beginning a new philosophy, I thought that this showed a basic fallacy. Because, uh, but, uh, but later on, I saw that you said this deliberately. In other words, you are aware of the fact that Marx did not regard his his thoughts as philosophic, and yet you said criticizing Marx. They are philosophic, right or wrong, is not a matter. The philosophy cannot be avoided. But I did not, you gave three arguments why philosophy cannot be avoided at a certain part of your argument. And you spoke so quickly that I couldn't follow. Well, that part I wasn't talking about the impossibility. I said that I thought Marx had tried to prove three things. All right. The of the and that the three were compatible. I don't think this is going to be your argument. Yeah, but we should get these three points. Yeah. I think that you try to prove first that philosophy is impossible, that it can't be pursued. The reason being that uh, men are determined in a certain way, and therefore thought is not free. But could one not say the conclusion is, uh, from the fact that philosophy was actual? So it follows that it was possible. I think you would deny that, because I think you would say. Well, philosophy was not actual in the sense that philosophy was thought of as actual. But still, in the sense, it was actual. Otherwise, Marx couldn't criticize it. Well, in the trivial sense, it existed. Yeah, that is not so simple. But what were the two other points? Um, I, I thought the second um, way he tried to prove philosophy um, he tried to prevent philosophy was to prove it trivial. That is, by saying, it didn't really matter in that it didn't change the course of this reason. Okay. All right. Yes. And the third argument was that it was difficult because men's view of reality was conditioned by their particular economic situation. And therefore, men differently situated had a different view of reality and therefore couldn't communicate with each other. Because that's what we're talking about different things. Yeah, but strictly speaking, that would be a kind of proof of impossibility of philosophy, the last point, not only difficult. Yeah. Yes, but uh, would not uh, would one not also have to consider this point that according to Marx, the philosophic possibilities have been exhausted by Hegel. I mean, in other words, whenever you try to philosophize, you will either be a Hegelian or a free Hegelian, and therefore you come into a dialectical whirlpool which leads you eventually to Hegel, and Hegel is the monster we wrong. Now, therefore, the critique of Hegel is so crucially important. You remember that there were at least two remarks uh, which we read last time to this effect, that Hegel, Marx accepts Hegel's own view. The Hegelian philosophy is the end of the peak of philosophy. There were two points where I uh, am not sure that you are right. Is consciousness, according to Marx here, Essentially alienation, as you presented it? No, I think he had said that consciousness, um, the appearance of consciousness um, signaled the appearance of alienation. But the 
natural inequality and there I uh, did a, uh, what percentage does Marx teach on that subject? Um, I don't think there's very much mention of it at all in terms of ideology but I think that when it treats of property it comes out it's implied that the natural inequalities have been on some way. The reason being that it describes all inequalities in property to um, inequalities um, that derive from social relations and therefore, um, he doesn't describe any inequality of property to men's talents, or to the inequality of men's talents. Yeah, well, is this not a defensible thesis? I mean, must one be really very bright to be very rich? Well, I mean, it takes a certain talent. I'm not sure. I yeah, sure, it's a talent to, I to, to, I get to acquire property of which Madison speaks. But in, in the famous passage in Federalist No. 10, that you, from time to time you hear big businessmen talk and they write and so the do they strike you as the most intelligent members of society? I think that it, with all due respect to big business, I would not go so far. So, but still, there are differences of intelligence, differences of talents without any question. How do they arise according to Marx? Well, I, I said I don't think he feels uh, All right. But uh, to be consistent, I think we have to argue that um, in some way or another, society is responsible to do this. Well, let us come to that when we, when we read the passages. Now, there is only one purely historical point on our information. We have read, uh, discussed last time, Marxist criticism of Hegel. And here he deals with the post Hegelian journey. The most famous among them is, of course, Feuerbach, of whom, uh, who is also the primary target here. But the situation was generally this. The Hegelian school split after Hegel's death into two schools, so-called old Hegelians and the young Hegelians. The old Hegelians were those who stuck to the letter of Hegel's teaching and gave it even a more conservative interpretation than it had in Hegel himself. So, uh, more emphatically monarchistic, more emphatically religious than Hegel himself was. And the young Hegelians brought out the revolutionary implications of Hegel, and therefore they turned away from the letter of Hegel by um, asserting that Hegel had deliberately accommodated himself to the Prussian state of his time, and this was not the true Hegel, it was only the appearance of Hegel. What does Marx say on this subject? Or is this not, or does he not discuss it in the first part? I really don't remember that. Well, it touches on the both possibilities. Yeah. Well, it criticizes both. Yeah, but Hegel, Marx denies that Hegel accommodated himself. He takes him, he takes him literally. In this respect, he agrees with the old Hegel. But the, still, since Hegel was uh, finished, according to Marx, and especially by Feuerbach, the old Hegelians were of no interest. The interesting people were the young Hegelians. And there are two uh, individuals whom he discusses in the German ideology. Uh, 
Bruno Bauer and uh, Stirner, S-T-I-R-N-E-R. Unfortunately, these parts are not translated in this easily accessible translation, and so we can't read them here. The, uh, the critique of Stirner is of a certain interest, and I may speak of it when we come to the third part of the German ideology. Um, but before I turn to a, a, co a somewhat coherent discussion of the first part of the German ideology, I would first like to find out what Mr. Kropsky thinks about Mr. Kettleman's paper. Uh, I was wondering if uh, you know, Mr. Kessler could have some opinion about how Marx disposes or fails to dispose of the question of nature. Because he deals, he speaks of it as just not a systematic treatment of the problem of man in respect of nature in this first part. But he does talk about it a bit. And I was wondering if you had any notion of how that fits with the rest of what he has said in our book. I think there's uh, a somewhat of the view. On the one hand, I think uh, he shows that society must develop because of the needs of men. And their dependence on nature. And therefore, the implication would be that nature isn't all bountiful or all good. And then on the other hand, he seems to look to this as um, the original condition of man as, the, as uh, to some extent the goal of the future development of society, too. So um, I don't think he treats it coherently, but I think that the goal of the future development That is a problem here. And it, I think it will become intensified when we get to uh, the economic writings of what I thought it might be worth mentioning here, because in, in one passage late in the first part of the German ideology, Marx speaks of the need for man, so to speak, to get on top of nature and, strictly speaking, to, uh, as appropriate as re, in fact, reform it in a way, control it fully. And that, it, but in another respect, what he seems to drive at is a kind of return to a natural condition, although admittedly on a, on a higher level. And that, that's still another complication is added by the economic doctrine, where it turns out that the whole economic apparatus has to be formed in the light of a strictly natural relation between men and the non-human things around them. Natural relation is the essence of the productive act, and that act of production is a kind of uh, return, when properly analyzed, to the most fundamental facts of nature, i.e., uh, atomism of well, matter and motion. And so I, I really wonder if Marx ever got himself pulled together uh, straightened out with respect to that question. But I thought that it might be useful to point out that it has a place in the well, I think what uh, Marx indicated the, the general answer to that question in what we discussed last time, especially the thesis on Feuerbach. The thesis of, on Feuerbach are a critique of Feuerbach as a materialist. And this implies already Marx is not simply materialist. He agrees in crucial points with the idealists. That, that means to say chiefly the German idealists. And the difference is this. Idealism stands for activity, for labor, for production, for the conquest of nature. So the materialist, so to speak, see only the power of nature and man as one natural being among others. Marx, that is his return to nature. Against the Germans, he says, the German idealists, he says, man is a sensual being, a natural being, and not a mere self-consciousness in his essence. But this particular natural being, which is man, is distinguished from all other natural beings by the fact that he can revolt against nature. This unity of the two is characteristic of Marx, and as will, become, as will become gradually clearer, not today, I think, that is the, is the essence of communism as much in this sense. We only have to consider the moral equivalence of the two things to see that the moral equivalence being for materialism, 
pleasure, for idealism duty, the unity of both. Uh, that is the Marxian moral doctrine, but I cannot develop this now because it would at the moment be only confusing. Now, to repeat, man is that part of nature which alone can revolt against the whole of nature. Marx is not the first to have this thought, but Marx has it probably clearer than any of his predecessors. And so, part of nature, to repeat, that is a materialist heritage, as Marx understands it. The conquest of nature is an idealistic heritage, again, in his interpretation. As the German philosopher is also called the philosophy of freedom versus nature. Yeah, this freedom means the freedom of man to revolt against nature, to say no to nature, to conquer nature. That is an essential part of the modern story. But for Ma uh, but the S, uh, according to the German doctrine, this is made possible by a fundamental ontological difference between man and non-man. The difference between freedom and nature. Freedom and nature. So between the consciousness and nature. Is this difference uh, is no longer stated in these terms by Marx. Yeah. And therefore he can sometimes use very crude materialistic formulas, but he doesn't mean them quite as crudely as the ordinary materialists of the 18th and 19th century. Now there is one point I think I should add in connection, which is important regarding this fight against the German ideologists. There is one simple formula which characterizes these German ideologists, i.e. the people left of Hegel. The right is absolutely uninteresting to Marx. Atheism. Conscious open atheism is characteristic of all these men starting with Feuerwehr. And that means, in other words, Hegel, to say nothing of the earlier philosophers, idealistic philosophers, are disguised theologians, even disguised Christian theologians. And the whole controversy partly takes on this form that everyone tries to discover the secret theologian in his opponent. And uh, Marx finds that Stirner is a disguised Christian theologian, and uh, Stirner replies in kind. And then it becomes, of course, a sheer play at this point. Uh, but still, the atheism is a common basis. And the question is only, uh, one can almost say, who is the most, what, which uh, atheism is the most consistent one? For example, Stirner, uh, who Marx discusses in the third part, the third part is not what is called the third part in the translation. So that is the fourth or fifth part. Uh, Stirner simply says, as long as you have to do with any universals, you are still a theist, for example. Uh, well, Feuerbach had said, God or gods are creations of man. Of man. And task consists now, after this delusion has been uh, seen through, to take back these delusions to man, into man, and no longer love a product of man. In which man has, into which man has alienated himself, but will of man, philanthropy, instead of theanthropy. Yeah, but what is man? There are only individuals, but every demand, every imperative, every notion of man's destiny speaks in terms of universals, and according to Stirner, it it is therefore disguised theology. Strictly speaking, you can't say more than be thyself. Not, do not assimilate yourself to some universal ideal as only a disguised God, to some universal concept. All such ideals transcend the real man and are therefore crypto-theological. The only thing possible to say is be thyself, which of course suffers from the, the fact that it is again a universal, as Marx doesn't fail to point out.
But we must now turn to the details of the German ideology. Let's read. Mr. Reinken, do you have the copy? You are such a superb reader. Take the first sentence. I'm No, no, before the preface. The preface? Yeah. Hitherto men. Uh, Hitherto men have constantly made up for themselves false conceptions about themselves, about what they are, what they ought to be. They have arranged their relations. Hitherto always. From now on, no longer. But from now on, it is possible for men to have true conceptions of themselves. Yeah, that's in blood. Yes, go on. They have arranged their relationships according to their ideas of God, of normal man, etc. The phantoms of their brains have gained the mastery over them. They, the creators, have bowed down, bowed down before their creatures. Let us liberate them from their chimeras, the ideas, dogmas, imaginary beings under the yoke of which they are pining away. Let us revolt against the rule of thoughts. Let us teach men, says one, to exchange these imaginations with thoughts which correspond to the essence of man. Says the second, to take up a crit critical attitude with them. Says the third, to knock them out of their heads, and existing reality will collapse. Yeah, that is Marx's brief description of the spirit of Germany after him, yeah? not his own view. Hitherto men had wrong thoughts. Now they can have true thoughts. And the exchange of the true thoughts for the wrong thoughts, that is the revolution, the greatest revolution of all time. What does Marx say? These innocent and childlike fancies of eternal and modern young Hegelian philosophy, which not only is received by the German public in horror and awe, but is announced by our philosophic heroes with a solemn consciousness of their cataclysmic dangerousness and criminal ruthlessness. Okay, let us stop there. So, in other words, the absurdity of the German ideology, i.e. of this left Hegelian, post hegelian movement, is this, that they believe substituting one kind of thought for another kind of thought is the salvation of mankind. These people, and that is what Marx says, these, so what they do is merely to substitute one kind of thoughts, idea, one ideology, for another ideology. These people, far from being revolutionary, Bach, Bruno, Bauer, and the others, in fact, only reproduce the thoughts of the German petty bourgeois. Of course, the petty bourgeois would not recognize these thoughts in this terrific formula. But Marx proves it as follows. The practical consequence of these new thoughts is a legitimation of those institutions and of those political aspirations which are, in fact, the political aspirations of the petty bourgeois. It is a tempest in a teapot, in other words, as appears immediately once one looks at those German things, say, from France or England. And then one sees how parochial this whole affair is. And let us turn to page four of the translation at the beginning of the fourth paragraph. And we have three paragraphs. Well, at the beginning of the, the German criticism, yeah. German criticism has, right up to its latest efforts, never quitted the realm of philosophy. Far from examining its general philosophic premises, the whole body of its inquiries has actually sprung from the soil of a definite philosophical system. That of Hegel. Yes, stop, yeah. In other words, not only have they not questioned philosophy as such, they have not even questioned Hegelian philosophy. They took philosophy for granted. The relation of the old Hegelians and the young Hegelians, as Marx makes clear in the sequel, is that whether you accept the reigning thoughts, the thoughts accepted by the ruling part of society, or whether you criticize these accepted thoughts. They remain within the realms of thought. Philosophy is a realm within itself. That's the whole implication. 
and the other realm is reality. But reality is, of course, the only real realm, and therefore that's a real delusion. Reality is something radically different than thoughts. Well, but this is presented as a thought, as obvious difficulty. Now let me see. Let us turn to Marx's own beginning on page, at the bottom of page six. The way in which men produce their means of subsistence depends, first of all, on the nature of the actual needs they find in existence and have to reproduce. This mode of production must not be considered simply as being the reproduction of the physical existence of the individuals. Rather, it is a definite form of activity of these individuals, a definite form of expressing their life, a definite mode of life in their part. As individuals express their life, so they are. What they are, therefore, coincides with their production, both with what they produce and with how they produce. The nature of individuals thus depends on the material conditions that determine their production. Now, let us stop here for a moment. Um, Marx begins the whole argument, uh, we can't read that. It's a German philosophy, the Hegelian philosophy, claim to be presuppositionless to translate the German word literally. That word played a very great role in the whole 19th century. It was applied also to science. Science is presuppositionless. It, uh, it approaches uh, the things without any previous presuppositions. All presuppositions are to emerge through the analysis of thinking. Marx says, no, we must start with, 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 uh, with presuppositions. Otherwise, we can never arrive at any content. But the presuppositions must be non-arbitrary. The presuppositions must be necessary. And if we question the existence of human beings, and then we can close shop immediately. We will never find out anything about human relations which is sensible as far as it goes. What we find is human individuals and their condition, and their conditions. You see, this formula is important. What is not man is a condition of man. Now, Marx speaks here only of the uh, terrestrial conditions, but obviously the sun and the stars too uh, are, and which Marx is very far from denying. Why does Marx disregard them here? Also, uh, the heavenly bodies and their motions, which are at least as much a part of the whole as minerals on Earth. Well, because he wants to give a doctrine of history. And history takes place on Earth, therefore we do not have to go into that. That is not uh, legitimate. So, what is man? What then is man? What is the nature of man? Marx gives here only a brief indication the beginning of man's specification, the beginning of man becomes distinguished from the brutes by producing their means of life. The brutes do not produce them according to Marx. He doesn't go into the question of bees, for example. That's unimportant for him. Even if man shares a brute, Marx implies, a, a rabbit, as something different from a dog chasing a rabbit, as will appear. But what is the condition for the fact that man produces his, his means of living? What's the condition for that? What does he say? It is conditioned by their bodily organization. By their bodily organization. Not about the mental organization. Marx does not regard this as worth mentioning here. And later on we will see that this, this dogmatism, this, this disregard of the non-bodily uh, is essential to Marx's position. Now what he develops in the sequel is this, a, a, a subject to which we will return on another occasion, Production leads to a division of labor. Think of what is going on on a chase of, yeah, uh, they don't have fire, firearms. 
some have, have to, uh, the, the different uh, members of the chase have to take a different function. And also uh, the difference of the sexes is alluded to in this connection. And the division of labor in its turn leads to property. Then he gives a very rapid survey of history. He mentions three forms of organization, the tribe, the police, and the feudal society. No attempt is made, and I believe Mr. Kesselman has become aware of it, at proving a necessary progress there. A necessary progress there. And we must come back to that later. That is, that is very important, because if there is no necessary progress, there is no necessity for the emergence of communism. And that Marx would admit. He would only say we have a wrong notion of necessity. By a non teleological necessity, certain changes took place which led to feudal society and then from feudal society to bourgeois society. Here we are now in a bourgeois society, in this situation. Given this state of affairs, communism is necessary. It is a purely academic question, and a, in, a, even a meaningless question for Marx ultimately, whether it could not have been different. It happened, and therefore there were necessary causes for its taking place. We will take this up on another occasion. Now let us turn to page 10 in the translation. The paragraph beginning, this whole view of history, seems this whole interpretation of history appears to be contradicted by the fact of conquest. Yeah, and, now, and then he develops the ordinary vulgar view of history, according to which history is political history and not economic history. Uh, he does not uh, answer this question in the immediate secret. The, the book is not finished. It was never printed, as you know, by Marx. It was published after his death. And one must assume that he would have uh, changed that. He gives the answer much later in the translation on page 62. Uh, then if you would be so good to turn to that. Nothing is more common than the yeah. notion that the mystery up to now it has only been a question of hate. Taking many yeah. conquering. Yeah. The barbarians hate the Roman Empire. And this fact of hate is made to explain the transition from the old world to the feudal system. In this taking by barbarians, however, the question is whether the nation which is conquered has evolved industrial productive forces as is the case with modern peoples, or whether their productive forces are based for the most part merely on their association and on the community. Taking is further determined by the object taken. A banker's fortune consisting of paper cannot be taken at all without the taker submitting to the conditions of production and intercourse of the country taken. Similarly, the total industrial capital of a modern industrial country and finally, everywhere, there is very soon an end to taking. And when there is nothing more to take, you have to set about producing. So in other words, that is an attempt to prove that production is always the basic fact and not such things as conquest. But I only refer to that so that you see that Marx did not leave it at this very inadequate remark on page 10. Now, this notion, this cleavage, between political history and economic history is, has an important prehistory in Hegel himself. For what is the moment of history according to Hegel? Yeah, surely, the mind, the intellect, reason, that's clear. But Hegel was very far from being abstract. He had very concrete notions of what happened. In his phenomenology of the mind, which, Hegel, uh, which Marx justly regarded as his greatest writing, the beginning of the historical process is as follows. The beginning is political. A hobby. The war of everybody against everybody. And, but it is even much more political than in Hobbes because the objective is recognition, as Hegel calls it. 
takes the simple case of two individuals, they fight for the sake of admitted to be superior by the other. It is also what Hobbes meant by pride, is implied. That's the basic point. Now, there are two possibilities. The one, one of the fighters is killed. History is at hand. The other is, however, that one loses his nerves, as we would say, and submits. It is absolutely unpredictable who will lose his nerves, or, and, or whether someone will lose his nerves. The submitter becomes the slave of the fellow who has shown courage. That is a master-slave relation, according to him. You see, the crucial implication, they are now natural slaves. Whether you are a slave or a freeman depends on an act of the will, basically. But that is always the beginning. So with no history, without a distinction of masters and slaves. But what is a further history? I cannot give you only the bare sketch. The master forces the slave to work for him. And what does the master do? He enjoys the fruit of the labors of the slave. And well, he fights also on occasion, but his, his life consists chiefly in enjoyment, i.e., that is an end. There is no further development there. How does the further development come? Entirely from the part of the slave. And what is the slave doing? Working. Transforming nature. And out of this basic labor of the slave, the higher forms of labor, intellectual production, emerge dialectically. So you see, uh, he did to, uh, himself to some extent prepared Marx's notion by putting a greater emphasis on the work, on the activity of the slave, the worker, than on the work of the Lord, the political rule. Now that is, in Hegel himself, that is infinitely more complex, but that is an important point which we cannot uh, completely disregard. Now we must look at a few passages on the trans uh, translation page 14, the second paragraph. In direct contrast to German philosophy, which descends from heaven to earth, here we have the earth to heaven. Yeah, that's a clear formulation. Yeah? The idealistic philosophers, starting from the highest and trying to understand the lower in the light of the highest, and Marx starts from the lowest and tries to understand the high and the light of the law. Yes? That is to say, we do not set out for what men say, imagine, to see, nor for men as narrated, thought of, imagine, to see, in order to arrive at men in flesh. We set out for real, active men, and on the basis of their real life process, we demonstrate the development of the ideological reflexes and echoes of this life process. The phantoms formed in the human brain are also necessarily sublimates of their material life process, which is empirically verifiable and bound to material premises. Morality, religion, metaphysics, all the rest of ideology and their corresponding forms of consciousness, thus no longer retain the semblance of independence. They have no history. You, no, let's stop here. That is, of course, an extreme overstatement which is contradicted by Marx later on. You know, they have a history, but they have no independent history, that's what it means, yeah. No development. But then, developing their material production and their material intercourse alter, along with this, this, their real existence, their thinking, and the good products of their thinking. Life is not determined by consciousness, but consciousness by life. That's a crucial sentence. Well, uh, Marx sometimes also says, Consciousness doesn't determine being, but being determines consciousness. It mean, has the same meaning. Yes? In the first method of the approach, the starting point is consciousness taken as a living individual. 
In the second, it is the real living individuals themselves, as they are in actual life. And consciousness is considered solely as their consciousness. Yeah. Now that is a return from, not only from German idealism, but also from its predecessors like Descartes. In a way, even the British philosophers, Locke and Hume, to the common sense view, to the older view. The consciousness is only a part of man, however important it may be. It is not man. Now, how does he go on? He must give uh, some reason, because what he said up to now is insufficient. This method of approach is not devoid of premises. It starts out with the real premises and does not abandon them for a moment. Its premises are men, not in any fantastic isolation or abstract definition, but in their actual, empirically perceptible process of development under definite conditions. As soon as this active life process is described, this continues to be a collection of dead facts, as it is with the empiricists themselves in abstract, or an imagined activity of imagined subjects with the idealists. Where speculation ends in real life, their real positive science begins. The representation of the practical activity of the practical process of development of men. Empty talk about consciousness ceases, and real knowledge has to take its place. When reality is depicted, philosophy as an independent branch of activity loses its medium of existence. Well, we may stop here. Um, so it, here we have another reference to this positivism of Marx, which we discussed last time. The rejection of philosophy, only positive empirical science can give us revelation about what is. But we have discussed last time at some length that this positivism it is fundamentally different from present-day positivism. And the chief difference, to repeat this point, is that present-day positivism denies holds, H-O-R-E-S. It, 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 it tries to understand what presents itself as a whole, say, capitalist society, liberal democracy, communism, as a product of fa more fundamental elements which are present everywhere. So that the differences between such holes come out only as quantitative differences. Whereas Marx is guided by the Hegelian view that quantity necessarily transforms itself into quality. There are essential differences according to Marx, not according to the positivists. But still, we cannot leave it at that, because, as I mentioned last time, because one cannot begin to study facts without having, without looking for something. We need, in other words, empirical research needs organizing principles. Now, the principles with which Marx approaches the facts, namely the fundamental character of the economic relations, if we may say so, are already results of empirical research, according to Marx. But of what kind of research? Yes. Just, you said that you went back to an older view, and that you mean, uh, one might say he rejects Descartes' autonomous reasoning, reason perceiving self-evident truth without reference to opinions. Now, on the other hand, he doesn't go back to the old review in the sense of yeah, sure. accepting uh, opinions. Yeah, sure. No, yeah, he brushed them aside. Yeah, sure. And that is a famous short shortcoming, as is shown in all historical studies of the Marxists. Perhaps not in economic history, I don't know that. But surely whenever they try to understand intellectual history, yeah. they do not take seriously what these authors say, because they know better in advance. Sure. But the question for us now here is granting that empirical research is the only way in which we can find out anything about empirical facts. Where do we get the principles, the criteria of relevance, without which no empirical study is possible? Let us look at the bottom of page 15. 
the, the difficulty begins in the, uh, on the contrary there. No, no, before, the sentence before. The difficulty. Our difficulties begin only when we set about the observation and the arrangement to build the fiction of our historical material, whether of the past epoch or of the present. The removal of these difficulties is governed by premises, which it is quite impossible to stay here, but which only the study of the actual life process and the activities of the individuals of each epoch will make evident. Yeah. Now let us see. That is very obscure. In the immediate sequel, we will find a more precise state, the statement uh, after the heading history. Yeah. We shall select here some of these abstractions which we use to refute the ideology which we shall illustrate in the next time. Yes. Hey, yes. Since we are dealing with the Germans, we do not talk with the enemy. We must begin by stating the first premise of all human existence, and therefore of all history. The premise namely that men must be in a position to live in order to be able to make history. The life involves before everything else, eating, drinking, a habitation, clothing, and many other things. The first historical act is thus the production of the means to satisfy these needs, the production of the material life itself. Indeed, this is a historical act, a fundamental condition of all history, which today is thousands of years ago and is daily and hourly being fulfilled merely in order to sustain human life. Now let us stop here. That is the whole argument. Why is the economic interpretation of history manifestly true that only people fooled by theological or philosophical illusions fail to see it. Why it is so? We must eat before we can do anything. Then eat and some other things which Marx wrote. The satisfaction of our bodily needs precedes everything else. What comes first in time is therefore the fundamental condition out of which everything else must be understood. Yes? Mark says that man differs from all other animals as being able to produce his means of subsistence. But what is it about man that enables him to do that? Yeah, it's a very pleasant question. Sure, because there are other things food applies to elements as well. Sure, that's wrong. But let us see whether Marx, or shall I say, whether we cannot give him a role with which he hangs himself. That is, generally speaking, a more convincing form of criticism than merely say, you have forgotten that. Now let us turn to page 19, as a second paragraph. Only now, after having considered four moments, four aspects of the fundamental historical relationships, do we find that man also possesses consciousness. Yeah, which were the other elements? I mean, he has to live, he has to live with others. Yeah, yeah. all right. So now consciousness comes up in the first place. Yes? Yeah. Well, that we find now, but that man also possesses consciousness. Yes. But even so, not the not pure consciousness. For the start, the spirit is afflicted with the curse of being with matter, which here makes its appearance in the form of agitated layers of air, sounds, and short of language. Language is as old as consciousness. Language is practical consciousness, as it exists for other men, and for that reason is really beginning to exist for me personally as well. For language, my consciousness only arises from the need, the necessity of intercourse with other men. When there exists a relation, it exists for me. The animal has no relations with anything. Now let us stop here for a moment first. What is Marx's argument? Consciousness presupposes language. And language presupposes society. And therefore consciousness is logically added right after society. And this society is of course a society of production. That is no longer taken up. 
The question, of course, is, which was raised by you before, do not the individuals working together already possess consciousness from the beginning, so that you cannot possibly say the production precedes in any sense language? Let us see what Marx says in the secret. The consciousness, the yeah. Well, consciousness is there more from the very beginning the social product. Product, means. product, yeah. I mean, in other words, society is first, and then the product, language. Yes? A product that remains so as long as men exist. No. Consciousness is at first, of course, merely consciousness concerned with the immediate sensuous environment. Consciousness of the limited connection with other persons who think outside the individual who's growing self-consciousness. At the same time... Now listen, at the same time, if man from the very beginning does not merely have a consciousness of this mountain as the end of the world, yeah, let's assume the high mountain, and of the sun, moon, and stars in the evening, and animals, trees, and other human beings, and so on. At the same time, he has what? This consciousness of nature, which first appears to men as a completely alien, all-powerful, and unassailable force, with which men's relations are purely animal, and by which they are overhauled like beasts. It is thus a purely animal consciousness of nature, natural religion. Yeah. No, but what religion is like nature religion? And, and distinguish from Kodadin religion or uh, any higher religion. Now, is this not amazing? It's not fantastic. Men are overawed by nature as the brutes, and then he has a brutish consciousness of nature, nature religion. Who has ever heard of brutes possessing a religion? Do you see that? It's absurd. Now, what is behind that? Pardon? Yeah, sure he means something of this kind. It doesn't make uh, any difference. Fetishism he probably thought of. It doesn't make any difference. But the point is, the original man has not only a consciousness of, of cats and uh, whatever may be around the trees, he is also uh, at the same time the consciousness of nature. And here nature is, of course, not understood as something to which man belongs or of which he is a product. But nature is here understood as a wholly alien, omnipotent, and unassailable power toward which men uh, take a purely brutish position. They are impressed by it like the brutes, <coughs> and hence they have a purely brutish consciousness of nature. Parenthesis, nature, religion, close parenthesis. There is no question. I mean, whether Marx would have kept it if he had published it, I don't know. But people are quite clever in, in uh, deleting giveaway sentences, but that would only mean that we would have to reconstruct that sentence in our own minds as having the impressions of it. And that was a point I made a few minutes ago when I did not remember the present point. Uh, Marx it does not take the present day view of a gradual, yeah, a gradual difference between men and the brutes, you know. Uh, Marx assumes an essential difference. And that uh, implies a certain superiority of, of the Marxist doctrine and also of Marxist uh, ideology over the positivistic ideology, which is compelled to regard it as a grave problem whether we must not give human rights to robots. Do you remember that famous problem of present-day political science? Is that Marxists are not such fools to worry about that because they know that there is an essential difference between men and brutes. The essential difference between men and brutes is that man is a productive animal and not a non-productive, like the brutes. Now you can say that bees are also productive animals. And Marx has disposed of that in a passage of Das Kapital, which I've read to you and which we will read again. 
the bee does not have a conceit, an image of the hive before it builds the hive or whatever it does in the hive, as an architect has a conceit, an image of the house before it builds it. And teleological production, if you want uh, this expression, that is characteristic of man. But let us leave it at Marx's expression, production. But why on earth should the production be limited to so-called material production? The urgency of the need, you must eat before you can do anything else, is uh, surely an important consideration. But Marx says without good reason, at the same time in which men were some tries to catch a hair or by some uh, primitive methods, or, or uh, uh, pick an apple. He has some awareness of the whole, which no brute has. There is an enigma for him there. And he responds to that enigma. That is primitive religion. Myth. You can use any derogatory term you please. That doesn't do away with the fact that there is no good reason for doubting that man's misproduction is coeval with his tool production or his production of, of a means of living. To which Marx will draw the answer. Yes, after this, he must admit that. But he will say, yeah, but the myth, this is all bunk. That are imaginations. Whereas the tool which he makes out of the flint, that's real. Yeah, but the question is then this, are men not influenced and deeply influenced by their imaginations, especially if these imaginations are so collective imaginations? And you know also the trouble which Max Weber took in his sociology of religion to show that there may very well be an influence of religious notions on economic matters was absolutely sensible. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Engels himself has said in some, on some occasions, uh, he, he, they, the Marxists don't deny that the superstructure is an infrastructure, yeah, relation production, superstructure, the ideologies, that they have an effect on the infrastructure. So, yeah, but, they, but ultimately, Ultimately, the infrastructure is a cause. How do they know that? Except on the basis of the dogmatic assertion. And the, and the, the dogmatic assertion has, of course, a great possibility because it is not limited to the Marxists, but is shared by many others. And is uh, a, perhaps a principle of the modern scientific mind that what is prior as a condition of the higher or later is a sufficient cause of the higher. In other words, Marx derives a very powerful support from the anti-teleological character of modern science. So that is not a peculiarity to Marx, of Marx, you know. It's his basic principle. That what is the primary, what is primary in time, but it, to repeat, Marx does not in any way prove that it's primary in time. He says, at the same time, the natural religion, as, as a nature religion, say some primitive notions, I don't care how... By the way, in the meantime, the, as the students of comparative religion have found out that these primitive religions are by no means primitive, those of which we know. That these are all elaborated cosmological schemes and not just elements of a primitive imagination. I mean, the, if there was such a truly primitive religion consisting only of isolated elements, it has not yet been discovered. But uh, the main point is, uh, as I said, this is a mark about the simultaneity. simultaneity. Yes? Uh, in Germany, does that same time have the same ambiguity that it does in English? Yes, sure. Uh, the phrase. English, you could read that not to be simultaneous. But what? Uh, you could read it to be a, a phrase that means uh, such as uh, 
Yeah, but in German it means at the same time. Literally translate. Is that? Yeah, it, it uh, does not always mean, you know, but uh, yeah, there is. Super like that. A time occurs there, you know, uh, sure. No, I think even if he would have said, which is possible also in German to say, a simultan, yes, yeah, simultaneously, it would not have, because that would simply push it back to the Latin, because simul is also primarily temporal. <coughs> no, that is, um, that uh, I think that uh, truth compelled Marx to write that. <laughs> but as I say, his argument would probably be this, the tool, yeah? They say for polishing or whatever they do, or for cutting. For cutting. And that is real, it really cuts. Whereas the sacrifice they bring to some demon has no effect except in the imagination. Yeah, that he would say. Therefore, it's not real. I'm just wondering if he isn't at an even earlier stage of religion than that, uh, where all religion is is a, is a dog's fear of light. And or a beast's fear of uh, something strange and unknown. When man is not introduced, he... Uh, yeah, but the question is really for Marx. No more, except some simple-minded religious people who believe that the elephant is a pious animal, or even a hen is a, You must have heard that, a kind of folklore. Yeah? You know that a hen always looks to heaven after having... Uh, taking some water, you know. Uh, but no man in his senses has ever credited an approach with religion. And Marx, in a way, is compelled to do so, to do so uh, uh, because of the, uh, uh, the dogmatic position he takes. Yes, but he does that by making a specific definition or inferring a definition of religion which is different from those who would normally speak of it would use. By religion, he means the sphere of nature. Now, for those who are willing to concede that the yeah, nature is religion. Look, let us take a simple example. A man is slain, yeah, or even a, an animal is slain. It is it lying there. Some animals run away, horses, for example, don't like them. But men have all kinds of reactions. Some can look dispassionately at the corpse, others feel there's something uncanny. Well, at any rate, a human being is as such, in any stage of the development, capable of thinking about this thing. And then all notions, all kinds of notions about afterlife, very crude notions, emerge. Crudes don't. They forget. They forget. So, uh, as Nietzsche says, on a, you remember that occasion, uh, it begins to think what is it, but then it has already forgotten what it wanted to think about. Now, man uh, doesn't forget in this way, and therefore is coherent or at all, however crude they may be. But from this kind of argument, the normal position is that man also forgets, like the beast, until he has produced the life of the beast. Yeah. So that, like the beast, he would react without consciously thinking. Yeah, but it is absolutely impossible to speak uh, empirically or even quasi empirically without assuming men to possess language. That is, well, one can't go back behind that, and for, that is a literally insoluble problem, as you know, because we will never find anything in any cave, in any geological stratum, which will make intelligible to us the genesis of language. A man is that being characterized by language how the first man uh, came at the process is an unanswerable question. We cannot go back there. Um, let us look at a few other passages uh, which are relevant to that here. And now, uh, let me see. There is another point, I think, which we should consider on page... Yeah, in a relevant passage on uh, page 31... Line 11 for them. This concept yeah, of certain uh, young Hegelians, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> this conception is truly religious. It postulates a religious man as a primitive man 
and in its imagination puts the religious production of fancies in the place of the real production and the means of subsistence in the life itself. Yeah. So, but one can only say this view in its one-sidedness is as true and as false as much. I mean, if we want to proceed empirically, we have no right to say that thing production is a reflection of misproduction, as we have to say that a misproduction is a reflection of thing production. We must be open-minded, empirical. Now let us turn to page 20 at the end of the first paragraph. Pure and mere herd consciousness, the, relative at this yeah. point, man is only distinguished from sheep by the fact that with him consciousness takes the place of instinct, or that his instinct is a conscious one. Yeah, now that is again only the essential difference between men and brutes. Consciousness. And hence, consciousness is not a product. It's coeval with man. Now, from all this, it follows that world history, strictly speaking, exists only. You know, I'm sorry. Uh, that is a summary of uh, the intervening remarks, which which we cannot read. It's too long. Now, Marx gives a survey of world history, and contrary to Hegel's teleological philosophy of history which conceives of the whole history of the world, of, of all history, as world history. For example, what was done in Africa, originally, tended to what all later developed, to what China, Mesopotamia, <coughs> the, uh, West, uh, Western Europe, and so on and so on. From Marx's point of view, world history exists only since there is a world market meaning an actual relation of all in human inhabitants of the globe. Prior to that, there was no world history. Hegel's philosophy of history is pure ideology. Now, there are a few more passages which we should read before we can make a discussion. On page 20... Yeah, but what is it in fact? It's a reflection of the productive forces of the way he lives. A historical product, I guess. So there is no, ex, no essence of man to begin with, but what, we, what different generations call the essence of man is simply man and human relations as they have developed up to him. It's all that. But the question arises still, is there not an essential difference between men and the brutes presupposed by Marx? Yes. So when he, in, in the beginning uh, of philosophy, when he speaks of species essence, isn't he adopting a belief in the species essence of man? No, you see, that is a very bad translation. And that is due to a great ambiguity of the German word, uh, which is translated by essence. Now, the German word which he uses is this. I write it in two words, lest it is too long for your use. The Germans write that in one word, and you can easily see that how many letters. Gatton's uh, Now, Gatton is speaking. Yeah, but this is not simply essence. It has the same ambiguity which the Greek word has from which it is derived and which the Latin word does not have. The Greek word is pousia. Now what is a pousia according to Aristotle in the first place? This. Or a dog or a tree. The essence as a species is in pousia only derivative. It's the second Second Greek. A reason means that in ordinary German usage, a living being, especially a human being, but really a reason. And the mentions in Gattung's reason means he is a social being. A social being. But you mean to say this is the statement of the essence of man? Sure. 
but that I'm, I'm not responsible for that. I, I only want to point out that Marx uh, must assume an essential difference between men and brutes, and must therefore assume that there is an essence of man. But for him, his justification is this. What man originally is, his basic constitution, let us say, mental as well as bodily, is uninteresting. The interesting thing is, are always individual men, or, or, or masses of individual men. Yeah? And they are always, have made some, something out of themselves, or have been molded in a specific way, and that is a man with, with, with whom we have to deal in all social science and in all social thought. Uh, but that is, of course, theoretically a very unsatisfactory answer. A few more uh, passages. On page 35 of the translation, line 9 following. He does not say how the centralist world around him. Feuerbach, yeah, Feuerbach. He means Feuerbach. And Feuerbach does not say how the centralist world around him is, not a thing given direct from all eternity, ever the same, but the product of industry and of the state of society. And indeed, in the sense that it is an historical product, the result of the activity of a whole succession of generations, each standing on the shoulders of the preceding one, developing its industry and its intercourse, modifying its social organization according to the changed needs. Even the objects of the simplest sensuous certainty are only given in through social development, industry, and commercial intercourse. The cherry tree left almost all through the trees was, as is well known, only a few centuries ago, transplanted by commerce into our zone. And therefore, only by this action of the definite society in a definite age provide the evidence of Feuerbach's senses. Yeah, that is not clear. And let us read a parallel on page 113, paragraph 2 of your translation. The socialist is here some uh, fool, yeah, uh, who marks the tax. I mean, uh, left you on the stage. Yeah, sure. The socialist opposes to present society, which is based upon external compulsion, the ideal of true society, which is based upon the consciousness of man's inward nature, i.e., upon reason. It is based, that is, upon the consciousness of consciousness, upon the law of thought. The true socialist does not differ from the philosophers, even in his choice of terms. He forgets that the inward nature of men, as well as their consciousness of it, i.e. their reason, has at all times been a historical product, and that even when, as he believes, the society of men has been based upon external compulsion, their inward nature corresponded to this external compulsion. Let me stop there, yeah. As it, you see, the same thought. One can also present uh, Marx's thought as follows. All philosophic thought, or almost all philosophic thought, Hegel would be a conspicuous uh, uh, exception, what is radically unhistoric. Therefore, they speak of the essence of man and think that the essence of man can give us crucial information. But man and the world are historic. They are in a process of change. By historical change uh, of the world, Marx means such things as our environment, that the nature as we observe it now, is as we observe it now, it's a product of human activity. It's an example of the cherry tree. In other words, there is, when we speak sometimes of the common sense world, uh, in contradistinction, say, to the world as presented by theoretical physics, the common sense world does not exist. The common sense world differs in, uh, in uh, different historical situations. Um, to repeat, Marx admits that there is an essence of men, but he says that is very uninteresting. All, uh, if you if um, the essence of man doesn't tell us anything as to what we could, should, or should do now, nothing whatever, that can be found, nothing whatever, 
that it would not in itself give us sufficient information was always granted. But that it gives us no information whatever is a crucial point. We have to act in this world as we have it now and all possible reasonable tasks are tasks of men living now. And only by understanding this situation now are we, and only by that, and not by any reflections on the essence of man or the moral law or anything of this kind which is trans-historical can be of any significance. And that is an absolutely crucial part of Marx, and Marx has played probably a greater role than any other individual in, quote, liberating, unquote, uh, modern men from the old-fashioned notions of the importance of uh, the essence of man and any other, quote, abstractions of this kind. What do you say to this proposition of Marx? I believe that is crucial. Is it possible? Uh, uh, is it, um, how does it work in practice? Let us uh, give Marx all possible benefit of the doubt. How does it work in practice? That by understanding our situation, we will know what we have to do. But this knowledge of our situation includes, of course, also historical knowledge. We have to know the genesis of our situation, naturally. And to that extent, uh, uh, the analysis of the present situation is inseparable from an intelligent uh, uh, knowledge of the past, out of which the present group. Then if this is, look at, uh, remember the Communist Manifesto. If this is the situation of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, the progressive proletarization of the intermediate classes and of a substantial part of the proletariat and the ever-increasing degradation of the proletariat and simultaneously with it the ever-increasing re revolt of the proletariat against it, well, you can have a selfish interest as a kind of parasite and because you don't like to fight uh, to continue your life if it lasts long enough uh, as a parasite of the bourgeoisie or as a bourgeois. But as an honest man, with, his, with your eyes open, you have no choice. So given this analysis, there seems to be no alternative. But and if there is no alternative, you do not need criteria in which direction to change. You see, when Marx says philosophy has hitherto only interpreted the world, we, uh, but what matters is to change the world. So common sense reaction would be, yes, but in what direction? Then you must have principles justifying this or that direction. That is philosophy. So you come back from a philosophy which looks at what is, which is contemplative, and which is not changing, giving you the standard. But Marx says, we don't need, that is absolutely, uh, either, uh, both it doesn't exist, such standards don't exist, and second, they are not necessary. Yes. When he talks of degradation, doesn't this already imply that there's a use of the time? Yeah, but uh, how would he argue? Yes, very true. How would he argue? Well, this is, he would argue that this is not degradation that he is imposing on people. This, this is, they see themselves as yeah. degraded. And all parts see it. According to the standards, yeah. it, it, it appears as degradation in the light of the standards of the Bourbon society. Whether that is sufficient is another matter, but where does the difficulty come in uh, first? Yes. In long, long term prediction, I suppose. Because one would want to predict when and which people would feel degraded in the future. I suppose perhaps you might say that would be impossible. Yeah, as a given mark, I mean, there is, of course, a famous difficulty that this increasing corporatization did not take place. Yeah. And quite a few other things 
did in fact not take place, that crazy gray is complication. There are situations which are simple, where, where one has really no choice. We know that in private life, it they might also exist in public life. And of course, that uh, Lenin was sure in 1917, the revolution of the Western workers was just around the corner, you remember? And he was, uh, he was very disappointed. And there were similar expectations at the end of the Second World War that in France and Italy and so the communists would take over, you know? Again, disappointed. Uh, but then they would simply say, oh, well, Marx uh, underestimated the, the resilience of bourgeois society. Uh, that uh, Marx thought perhaps in terms of 100 years, and we may have to think in terms of 200 years. That is not terribly important. But where does the difficulty come in? I believe in the first place because, as at least Engels already admitted, and is, as today is rather obvious for other reasons, uh, there is an alternative, which they admit. The alternative is the destruction of civilization, maybe even the destruction of the human race in terms of the super weapons which you have now. There is a people may detest the prospect of a communist world society so much that they would use every means against us and would uh, use things which would bury both sides and not only one side as crucial. So that, uh, that alone as it shows, you know, the question of choice uh, it cannot be disposed of. There are, even in the case of an extreme, what we regard when we say he has no choice, that is not literally true. He always has a choice, for example, of committing suicide. Or he has no choice, he must undergo this operation. Or he can prefer to die, and so on. So uh, the, the simply choice the situation doesn't exist for men. We speak of it ordinarily, but we always make some tacit presuppositions when we say that. Otherwise. Uh, well, why can't one also choose to act in one's uh, self-interest as a member of the bourgeoisie? Oh, sure one can, but the Marx had no doubt that they are going to do that. But they will be licked, because they will be ever less, you know. And the, if you have that at the end, Senator Kennedy's family and Governor Rockefeller's family and some other families and 178 million Americans in a state of ever increasing, ever hope, more hopeless misery, uh, that uh, sure they may hold on to their millions, but that will be a very simple process. It's a matter of victory. Yeah, sure, sure. You're, you're really choosing to think that. Yeah, but they are uh, about Marx, uh, well, Marx would uh, yeah, uh, the, the people who are so much benefited by a given social order would, in almost all cases, love that order, is Marx's premise. Yeah? He, he would admit that there are some individuals, uh, some sons of millionaires and milliardaires, millionaires, who, who might even then become traitors to their class. That, of course, he has admitted that. But generally speaking, the men who are benefited by a certain state of affairs like that state of affairs. I think that is not a particularly Marxist thesis. Yeah? People believe, love or believe to love what is profitable to them. That, I think, is, was an old uh, insight. And, uh, what I meant was that knowledge of the situation doesn't necessarily lead to action on the part of the proletariat. No, no, but the proletariat would I mean, be... I mean, action is, uh, by identifying If the situation is as Marx described, objectively so, could an honest and intelligent man fail to be a communist if it is so clearly drawn that it is only... Uh, a selfish interest of a small part of the society which is responsible for this immense misery. I mean, if that is an analysis, a true analysis, there would be no question. The question is whether it's a true analysis. But even that, even granting that, I say, 
there is no human situation in which one can say there is no alternative, and therefore the question of choice comes up. I believe that a part of the reasoning behind fascism uh, in some so-called uh, gentleman fascists, I believe had this character, rather the destruction of the world than the victory of communism. Uh, that showed at least that the possibility of such a choice. It failed in this form. But uh, um, and there is no, uh, I can only repeat that both Engels and Lenin as I, as I'm sure, Lenin, I'm almost sure, say that the victory of communism is the only alternative to the destruction of civilization. Yeah, but the destruction of civilization is an alternative. So even the destruction of the human race is an alternative. And t today, clearer than ever, uh, for well-known reasons. Yeah, but, but this raises another theoretical question the passage we read. Is it true that man and the world is simply historical? Are there not certain basic phenomena apart from digestion and so on, which are not affected by change? Basic facts, empirical facts, that we live on the, on the earth, we are terrestrial beings, that there are various species of animals as well as of plants, however they, some might have become extinct and so on, but that man is surrounded by them, lives from them and through them to some extent, the heaven above him. Are these not crucial points? which and is, is not the phenomenon of human love, the love of the two sexes, fundamentally the same in spite of the historical variation which exists there in externals. In other words, that what poetry is about, this permanent core of man, which shows in spite of the infinite historical variety, that would be one consideration. Now we have to consider another point which uh, has very much to do with the point raised by Mr. Krops before in the translation on page 51, line 7. Page 51, yes. Perhaps we can begin. The first advance beyond natural, the state capital, was provided by the rise of merchants whose capital was from the beginning movable. Capital in the modern sense, as far as one can speak of it, given the circumstances of those countries. The second advance came with manufacturing, which again made mobile a mass of natural capital, and altogether increased the mass of movable capital as against that of natural capital. Now let, us, now let us let us stop here. So what I have in mind <coughs> is this term which he translates by natural. Uh, Pascal, the translator, has a note there on the translation of this word. The German word is Naturwüchsig. You could say grown. Grown in opposition to made. That is a part of it. Uh, books to wachsen is to grow. grow na, na, what, what has naturally grown? Now, this, the whole historical process is, according to Marx, a victory of that which has not naturally grown over what has naturally grown. That is very much to do that problem. What does that mean? What does natural growth mean? Yeah. Fruitful soil without any particular no, not necessary, without consciousness of that growth. And I think it's a decisive point. For, take a similar example. The people speak, uh, have different languages, different dialects. No one made these dialects. They just develop and are there, and perhaps from time to time someone notes to surprise that people talk now differently than they talked 
200 years ago. But that, that's all. And then someone, say a king, wants to have a unified language for the court and for the country. Such things as happened in Italy, in uh, France, in England. Here, the process by which King's English develops, or should it be French of the Academy, uh, is no longer an unsupervised process. As there are people who sit there and purify the language consciously. Now, in, in other things, that's uh, still more obvious. A certain social institutions come into being, no one knows how they are there, they are convenient, Inconveniences are felt at a given point. One makes a change. In the course of decades, other changes. Unconsciously, the social organization has changed. Entirely different uh, matter. People establish a social order, for example, a constitution. Now, generally speaking, what, the, what is natural, what has grown without human supervision, is from Marx's point of view the lower. And the, for example, the difference between the countryside and the city is very much to do with that. The countryside is a more natural, the city is a more conscious, the more reflexive and reflective. So the whole process, uh, historical process, consists in ever more, in pushing back ever more the limits set by nature and by natural developments. And, and that goes together, as uh, Mr. Robson has pointed out, uh, with the fact that Marx's whole doctrine presupposes in another sense a return to nature, a return from all ideologies, from all abstractions to men's sensual, sensual uh, reality and activity. Yeah, I think these were the most important passages which I found in the in uh, this part. Mr. Boxes, would you bring up your part? Well, uh, I was wondering, is there any place where Marx denies the uh, sociality of Not explicitly, yeah. which I remember, but uh, but perhaps he would say there are gregarious elements, but not strictly speaking social elements, something of this kind. I was wondering if there was a question that uh, there is nothing on the other side with respect to that uh, German great guy on space. Yes. Which he took uh, over from Feuerbach. But uh, one, when he speaks about the means and the man, he makes a distinction between them. Yeah. But uh, the distinction isn't uh, sociality. No, no. It's with respect to the philosophy of the end. Yeah. Before the end is real. Yeah. Uh, so that the question of any peculiar human essence becomes even more complicated in its own way. And the question is, indeed, one could even say, why is there not? Yeah, but I think Marx would say there is, a, 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 the terms which he uses are production, as we have seen here, and a production means conscious production, yeah. and therefore conscious <laughs> is, 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 is uh, the difference between men and fools. And only such conscious beings which can learn from experience and transmit this experience to the next generation so that the next generation lives different from the first generation can be historical. I think that is probably what we say. Yeah. Uh, it must have something to do with the doctrines of genetics that have become a political question in uh, societies that call themselves Marxist. Translation of a change in one generation, and maybe not in a massive form to the next generation, but maybe cumulatively. I believe it's 
it is no direct relation. I think the Lysenko question has this meaning. If Lysenko, I mean, if the Western geneticists are right, the natural inequality of men will be as perpetual with men. Yeah? The genes will take care of that. Now, in other words, the equalization of men, so the equalization of living conditions, education and what have you, will be only skin deep. You have to begin again from scratch in the next generation because of the heritage of the biological genetic heritage. And therefore, we must postulate as good egalitarians that Lysenko is right that acquired qualities can be transmitted. This is not the point. I think that's the issue. Yeah, I think directly that is, of course, a political question, but uh, I don't think it's right. Uh, no, because the fact of, I mean, say that we live in different dwellings than men 50 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, whereas storks and other birds uh, and other uh, the, the, the same kind of parents, the period identical in every generation, as an undeniable fact, admitted by everyone, and which shows, if one wants to express it specifically, man has a history, whereas uh, his species, and uh, the, uh, the other animal species do not have a That I think is really, uh, has nothing directly to do with these things. Well, in my mind, the speculation is that the body essence, which leads to the growing egalitarianism among human beings, is if sufficiently extended, it's true, it would take very long time points in the direction of the egalitarianism of all living things in a way. Uh, given sufficient time, I mean, it's got nothing whatever to do with the political question, it's true. But when he denies the peculiarity of the human beings, on the traditional ground, then the species themselves begin to break down. Yeah, but Marx never drew. I mean, yeah, but Marx never drew this conclusion. No, no. And I think communists are not vegetarians. To put it very simply, they do not assert an equality of the various animal species with men. I, I think that uh, I really believe there's a different issue which leads to the same. Thing. No, no, no. Marx still uh, no. Uh, uh, Marx is not a positivist, and he would simply say, uh, taking the evolutionist scheme, that the change in the qu quantitative change, say in certain species of monkeys or apes, uh, from, uh, is a quantitative change uh, from a certain moment on became a qualitative change, and at a leap, a leap. So, a favorite phrase of Marx as it was of Hegel. And therefore, men cannot be reduced to the truth. And we be, uh, misunderstand everything, a uh, small or large, if we do not uh, admit that. Um, we, what our task will be in the next meetings is to understand what we have only touched upon hitherto. Uh, why Marxism, communism, according to its own interpretation, is a synthesis of materialism and idealism. Materialism and idealism understood in the way in which Marx himself understood them in his early writings. And that requires Indeed, that we consider also uh, Marx's uh, moral philosophy, because he, he had to develop a moral philosophy if only in order to criticize the ideologists of his time. And he believed that they, well, the general situation was this, as it still exists for common sense problems, criteria for distinguishing between good and bad, and everyone preaching that what he regards as good. Exhortation of some sort. Marx rejects it altogether. Prediction, yes. Exhortation or preaching, no. 
But he is old nevertheless, since his moral issues are issues. He is compelled to meet them on their own ground and show the, concre- the hypocrisy or the alleged hypocrisy of his opponents by the proof that this is a misunderstanding of what they mean, of what one would have to mean by morality. And the crucial issue, as I said before, was that between an idealistic morality of duty and a materialistic morality of pleasure. And the swindle, according to Marx, consists in this, that the people, that the pleasure is good for those who have things, who can have pleasures. And duty is preached to those who have nothing to enjoy. That's a practical, hypocritical use. But the theoretical solution is that one must transcend this whole uh, distinction, this whole antagonism of duty and pleasure, and uh, that is what Marx uh, develops, and that is an important part of his uh, indications regarding the communist society. We will take that up next week. to begin our discussion as if he were not and see whether he can in a paper. Now, the assignment which was given to Rabbi Weiss was the fourth and fifth part of the German ideology. It is in the translation uh, simply the second part called True Social. It is the least interesting part of the book but we, since we have to depend on what is available in English, we, we had to uh, assign this part. Now, I, I suggest that we discuss a few passages in these sections which are of some interest. Uh, I remind you only of the German ideology, of the character of the German ideology as a whole. This was written um, by Marx fairly early, around 1845, when he was about 27 years old. And it was not published uh, during his lifetime. It was published uh, um, long after his death. I do not know at the moment whether it was published. No, it was not published by Engels, I believe. It was published only by Mehring or so, in other words, our century. And it um, the fragment is uh, Marx took the great trouble of discussing a few doctrines in, in Germany at that time. And it was very characteristic which kind of doctrines he discussed. Only those left Hegelian developments. In other words, he was not interested in the conservative reactionaries that he thought had been disposed of. And the question was only, is what he tried to show was that, that the radical liberal or radical democratic doctrines which were developed by some people from the Hegelian school, they, that even they would not do, measured by the standard of freedom, and therefore communism alone was a solution. Now, Rabbi Weiss, are you prepared now? Am I prepared now? Yeah. I have a paper. Is yeah, that, that is what I mean, yeah. And then, please, uh, we cannot permit you to take breath. I didn't know that I was supposed to. Yeah, yeah, you're supposed to. Now, Ben, I will uh, take up the points which, I, which you made, but first one point regarding the reliability of Marx's criticism of, uh, say, Mr. Grün, yeah? the chief, and, and a certain Dr. Kuhlmann, who are representatives of that German socialism. I would say I would have no doubt that in such matters Marx is absolutely reliable. And, uh, I mean, he, he was not compelled to make such uh, uh, cheap tricks, you know, and uh, denigrate a man merely in order to win a uh, victory. Uh, and I would say what he quotes is uh, sufficiently proved that Green must have been a very superficial and arrogant individual. And that is what, what it amounts to. But then, of course, one could say, who cares for us? There are so many around at all times. Why should we bother about Mr. Green in particular? That's perfectly true. But why did Marx think it worthwhile? If you turn to page 97 in your translation, in the third paragraph, 
if one considers the uh, opposition of communism to the world of private property in its crudest form, do you have it? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, let me start and read it. He's really very trained in that. If one imagines the antithesis of communism to the world of private property in its crudest form, that is, in an abstract form in which the real conditions of that antithesis are ignored, then one is faced with the antithesis of property and lack of property. The abolition of this antithesis can be viewed as the abolition of either the one side or the other. Either property can be abolished, in which case universal lack of property or destitution results, or else the lack of property may be abolished, which means the establishment of true property. In reality, the actual property owners stand at one side, and the propertyless communist proletarians on the other. This opposition becomes keener day by day and is rapidly driving to a crisis. If then, the theoretical representatives of the proletariat wish their literary activity to have any practical result whatsoever, they must first and foremost insist that all phrases be swept aside which obscure the real sharpness of the opposition and which hush it up. Such phrases actually give the bourgeois a chance to safeguard their interests by insinuating themselves among the communists on the strength of their philanthropic enthusiasms. All these rotten qualities are, however, to be found in the catchwords of the true socialists, and particularly in true property. Of course, we realize that the communist movement cannot be destroyed by a few German phrase marks. Nevertheless, it is essential to resist all phrases which obscure and dilute still further the realization that communism is totally opposed to the existing world order. It is particularly necessary in a country like Germany where philosophic phrases have for centuries exerted a certain power, and where, moreover, class divisions are not so clearly marked as in other countries, with the result that the German communists are less keenly and decisively aware of the real issues. Well, that's all you do. That's the justification. In other words, in order, Marx did not believe that the fight would be won or lost in Germany. He thought much more of England and France. But still, Germany plays, of course, a certain role. And uh, therefore, it is necessary to awaken the German proletariat. And this awakening is prevented by those true socialist place makers. That's the reason, the practical reason. And therefore, Marx goes out of his way to criticize these uh, German socialists, but also the German radical liberals, because he felt that they the subtle, the true issue, by making the Germans believe that the liberal democratic state can be the last, can be the end of the movement. You know, I would say I have no doubt that Marx, in his criticism of Grün as a, a scholar, is absolutely right. And uh, also what he says about the arrogance of these people, you know, superficial readers of Hegel, believing that they are the top of the world because they know Hegel, and then want to teach the French, who know much better what is going on in the field of the social struggles. That I think is, is a point which is makes on me the impression of, of, absolutely, of being absolutely sound. That doesn't mean, of course, that Marx's position itself is uh, true. You mentioned a few points uh, which we have to take up later coherently. Uh, for example, that Marx's rejection of the essence of man and cannot be literally true, otherwise Marx's own position would not make sense. And we have to see with what right does he attack these Germans for having a head recourse to the essence of man. One part of your criticism, if I understood you correctly, was this, that Marx is, quote, a naturalist, unquote. And then on the other hand, he rejects as you made clear by your very tough examples, is that he, he rejects nature as a standard. Uh, well, what he says, uh, Marx says, is today, of course, trivial. I mean, people wouldn't use such examples, whereas but, uh, nature is not a standard because an urge of a, of a young juvenile delinquent to kill his mother is as natural yeah. as his desire to be kind. You know, this kind of thing is trivial. 
Now, uh, today it is of course clear. Today they say there are no standards. There are no standards. All values are subjective. How does Marx get out of that fix? Was this not a question which you at least implied in what you said? But how does he get out of that? differences within nature. Yeah. Yeah, but still, even that, uh, and are not there are all kinds of human actions, uh, natural in this sense, and, and yet uh, some are preferable to others? Where, where is the standard? Is he using the greatest good and the greatest number? Are you he's talking, to, talking to men? I mean, you can say what men really want is, uh, is relevant freedom. That we are working to the possibility of. Yeah, however that may be, one could perhaps say the full development of each man's faculties. So that's one point. And he would have to show why the human equivalent to what you said about the apes is a defective form of developing one's faculties. Yeah? You know? So Marx, that is not the difficulty in Marx. But then, at the end, you made this point, the determination of, you found the difficulty in the fact that Marx says human thought is determined by social conditions. And yet Marx says, or implies, that it is possible to know the truth. How could one defend Marx against this criticism as far as stated? Well, it's, it's possible, as I mentioned earlier, to have uh, truth as a standard and yet for, the, yeah, but for this was, truth to be determined at a given stage of history. Yeah, but, but what does it mean, truth as a standard? It is the determination of the consciousness by social condition in itself incompatible with human knowledge. implies is there is always some knowledge of truth. I think we could not possibly live for a day, I don't say for an hour, without having some true knowledge. We would constantly jump into one other. If we are not aware, as this is a solid thing, a human being, you can't walk through in here. So, yeah. And we couldn't possibly eat without having some awareness of the fact that this is a a thing fit to be eaten, and so on. So there is always knowledge of truth to some extent, and there is always also error. Now the question is, what Marx means to say is regarding the most urgent things. A man always has sufficient knowledge, otherwise he could never have lived. But regarding the most comprehensive things, men have hitherto been absolutely in, in error. I mean, the hitherto men have always had false notions about the whole of society and what is really the ground of it. Now, at a certain moment, Marx says, men can understand this materialistic basis of society. You can see that. 
And this, however, is not merely a venture of thought. This is itself socially conditioned, as he makes clear. If there had not been a capitalist society, Adam Smith could never have developed his doctrine of labor. The fact that everything had become an object of basically the same kind of production. So there's a difference, for example, between agricultural and industrial production had become less important. Only that enabled Smith to develop his general notion of a labor of labor as the origin of all wealth. Similarly, why? Because this was somehow affected all European countries. And the backward countries like Germany included. But in Germany, that became visible only in the most abstract way. The Germans didn't develop economics, but they had the clearest reflection of that in, on the ideological level, meaning Hegel. Hegel realized, and Hegel realized more clearly than any other philosopher, that thought itself is essentially production. Hegel did not see that this was only a reflection of the basic form of production, of material production, and he did not. But he approached it. In other words, capitalist society is accompanied by a certain awareness by a certain dim awareness of what is the true reality. Capitalism can never have more than a dim awareness because the capitalists as capitalists are sold on capitalist society. In the moment they are sold would endanger the, the further existence, the survival of capitalist society, they would stop it. But there are some men who have no interest in capitalist society because they are only its victims. And these are the proletarians. Therefore, the proletarians, so in a, again in a dim way, go further than the brightest representatives of bourgeois society. But there can be some men uh, uh, some men induced either by the theoretical difficulties presented by Hegel or by the practical problem because they see that the liberal democratic state does not bring freedom and they are concerned with freedom. Some individuals can be induced by either or both of these difficulties to take a further step, to step out of capitalist thought. And these are yeah, Marx and Engels. Well, to some extent, the earlier socialists, but Marx and Engels, according to their claims, they, did, they took the decisive step. They were, surely what determines them is the crisis of capitalism. And the crisis of capitalism, which they are able to see from the point of view of the proletariat, this possibility exists. You see, they were, after all, marginal capitalists. I mean, Engels could live as a businessman quite well, but Marx was so-called intellectual, you know, and he was very poor throughout his life, you know, and uh, uh, he had all kinds of experience. So that's easy. But some people even are rich and can nevertheless be sufficiently public-spirited to be induced either by theoretical or practical difficulties to see what corresponds, what demands, what outlook corresponds to the proletariat. That has happened. Then you raise the question about the proletariat. The proletariat may be able to see something against which the bourgeois is constitutionally blind. In other words, the proletarian position may still be a relative position. That was your point. What's, yeah, sure, but what is Marx? And Marx has considered that. What is Marx to apply to that? What is the peculiarity of the proletarian class compared with all other classes, past or present? 
Well, for one thing, uh, it represents the vast majority of mankind. Yeah, but that you could universal. say the presence, the presence presented the vast majority of mankind for many, many centuries. And that is no guarantee of truth. I think there is only one formula possible. The proletariat is the absolute class. And therefore, the proletarian consciousness, which doesn't have to be present in each proletarian individual, but that consciousness, by virtue of which a proletarian can only understand himself consistently as a proletarian, is therefore the truth. That is, of course, the burden of Marx's point, that the proletariat is an absolutely unique class. That class, the only class which ever was and is, which cannot liberate itself without liberating man as man. And that is a point which one has to question. But Marx has, of course, seen this difficulty very clearly. I will take it up uh, later. Would that, uh, wouldn't the proletariat still be a class, even though... Yeah, but the class, a class in which, and in which and through which class disappears. But it, ha but it hasn't disappeared yet. But it, yeah, way. but it has, but since it, its activity, its revolutionary activity, is the transcending of class. Therefore, for the first time, relativism is about to be transcended. Therefore, that is the basis for Marx's claim that the, the historical materialism or electric materialism, whatever you call its position, is true. That was a criticism of Marx. I think the formula stands from Marx Weber, if I remember that that one must apply Marxism to itself, i.e. to understand the Marxists in the light of their class situation, and so on and so on. Yeah, but that is, uh, Marx would say that he did from the very beginning. The fact that Marx was not technically a proletarian, I mean, in, in the literal sociological sense, is not important because the French nobleman who took the side of the bourgeoisie and ran away the leaders of the bourgeoisie in the French Revolution, at least in the early part, uh, of course they are also noblemen, and yet they had become traitors to their class. They, and by this very fact they, they became, they could become the spokesman of the other class. One could even say, if one wants to do this kind of thing, that there is a particular probability, high probability, that these switching men should be in the best position to understand, in the better position than the proletarian who is completely wrapped up in the immediate tasks of his class, you know, strikes, what have you. Whereas this man who had had the leisure, the non-proletarian leisure to acquire a broad horizon would be in a much better position to spell out to the proletarian, on behalf of the proletarian, what the proletarian intends. Yes? Well, until the, until the final stage of history is reached, the proletarian is not yet the absolute class. No, it is the absolute class. It is because it is destined by its situation. But you can say one thing. One thing is to call men to revolution and prepare the revolution. And another thing is to achieve the revolution and to live after the revolution. I mean, a revolution would not be a revolution if it did not have surprises. As a surprise, just as a war would not be a war if there were no surprises. And then it is simply a war, or war, not a war or a revolution. And now, what men will do and think after the revolution cannot be, at least not be fully known in advance. Marx admitted that, and that is a part of the communist law, as you know. Therefore, it is impossible to describe in detail the post revolutionary society. You know, that's axiomatic with communists. But still, they say a lot.
about the post-revolutionary society in advance. And, uh, and they are forced to say it because one wants to know a little bit whether the outcome of the revolution is not likely to be in other form of the old mess. Yeah? You know? Marx has to prove that the revolution is not the substitution of one form of tyranny for another form of tyranny. But that this is really the resurrection, the, the regeneration of man, terms which he used. That is, that is the difficulty. But in other words, Marx avoids the, the relativistic difficulty by um, a modification of Hegel's view, namely that there is a peak in the historical development. And at that peak, not necessarily full knowledge, but knowledge of the decisive truth is for the first time possible. We don't need more. And who wants to have all the details filled up? Uh, but if he knows the decisive thing, that's all we need. And Marx claims to give that. And one must look into that, of course. But Marx has considered that. There was one Marxist, and I must say, I think the most intelligent Marxist in the Western world, outside of Soviet Russia, I mean, and that was Lukács, whose name I mentioned before, who felt for this criticism of Marx Weber and said, yes, we must apply Marx to him, Marxism to, its, add it to itself. And he came to this conclusion that Marxism has, is about, let's say, the doctrine of Marx is related to the proletarian revolution as the doctrine, say, of Rousseau, yeah, or, or any of these, uh, to the French revolution. Now, this is a beauty, because Rousseau believed, or let us assume, or some of his disciples believe, as this revolution will mean, will be the emancipation of man from all tyranny. <coughs> what came out? Bourgeois oppression. Here. How can he know that the Marxist revolution will not lead to Stalinist oppression? Yeah? We know perhaps that he was writer than he should have been. Uh, so in other words, you cannot apply Marxism to itself without abandoning Marxism. Marxism is an absolute position which cannot be relativized or it is nothing. That I think is okay. Now let us turn to a few uh, special points. Uh, Marx begins with a critique of the ideological character of this uh, true socialism. I.e., they what does it mean? As he puts it, one formula is this. These people separate the consciousness of certain historically conditioned spheres of life from this sphere of life and measure it by looking at the true absolute consciousness, i.e. the German philosophic consciousness. In other words, they believe that thought can be understood in and by itself, and not by transcending it in the direction of social reality. They take the theories as something independent, yeah. and not as something radically derivative. Let us see a few more passages on page 87, line 7 from bottom. All epic-making systems, rather, all epic-making systems have as their real content the needs of the time in which they arose. Each one of them is based on the whole of the antecedent development of a nation, on the historical growth of its class relations with their political, moral, philosophical, and other countries. Yeah, let us stop here. So, the, you know, every system, by some Spinoza, writes a book, The Ethics in which he tries to teach man, man, how he can achieve felicity. Yeah? That it was written in the 17th century is absolutely uninteresting to Spinoza. From his point of view, it could have written at any time. It so happened that it was written for the first time in his age. Marx says, no, the true content of that book 
are the needs of the time in which they emerged. I.e., we would have to understand Spinoza as the first man who openly did not belong to any religious community. He was a Jew by origin but was communicated and did not become a Christian. Who lived in Holland the first, the, the first capitalist society. That's the key to the ethics. Now, I think if you would try to do it, you would see that it won't help. It won't help. That it would perhaps explain to some extent his political writing, but it wouldn't do. But still, that is, of course, the assertion of Marx. Then the point which you refer to, what is the characteristic of these Germans, the unhistorical character, they speak of the essence of man. Uh, they sp in other words, they disregard the crucial importance of the specific, of the historical, and therefore they talk also about nature, a certain sentimental view of nature, you know, to which they have no longer any right, that is what Marx implies, is to give the solution. Nature is harmonious and beneficent, and if men would only follow nature, there would be any, uh, not any conflicts. That is, of course, an infinitely old story. Yeah? It is only, how shall I say, outlandish in the 19th century, after what has been done to nature and to the concept of nature in the modern century. And Marxism is here, of course, absolutely victorious, uh, but it is in no way peculiar to Marx, Hegel, and many, many others would have said the same thing. There are a few points which we might perhaps read on page 100. He uh, gives now an invitation to a walk. Yeah? He addresses now an invitation to a walk to man. Uh, he now invites man to accompany him on a journey, an invitation which man readily accepts. Man enters the realm of free nature and indulges, among other things, in the following intimate confessions of the true social. Yeah, so, good. Now, I, I, we don't have to read that because I would like to paralyze Mr. Rabbi Weiss's example by Mosamoa Pernodons. Yes? The man can see a whole lot of other things in nature. Do you have that? Well, it skips the next paragraph. So man could observe the quantity of other things in nature. For example, the bitterest competition among plants and animals. He could see, for example, in the plant world, in his forest of tall and stately oaks, how these tall and stately capitalists consumed the nutriment of the tiny shrubs, which might well complain, terra, aqua, either, and igni, and evicti sumis, we are, uh, we are forbidden from land, earth, sorry, from earth, water, air, and fire. He could observe the parasites the ideologists of the vegetable world. He could further observe that there is open warfare between the forest birds and the infinite multitude of tiny creatures, between the grass of his meadows and the metals of troops of young horses. Yeah, in other words, this notion of nature as a sheer a paradise of peace and benevolence and magnificence is just nonsense. If there were no beasts of prey and poisonous snakes, you know? That is surely true. The question is how far it's sparing us. But this simpleton seems to have left, uh, Green seems to have left it. Now let us turn to page 102, the third paragraph. The first fact is certain. No, no, when he says, see the, li see the lilies on the field. Yeah. I consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin, and thy heavenly Father feedeth them. Go thou and do likewise. No, no, before, before. Yes, consider the lilies in the field. How they are eaten by goats, transplanted by man into his bottom home. How they are crushed beneath the immodest embraces of the tail of the child. But it's very funny, but it is, of course, a very old story, going back to the Maggiore, uh, uh, at least. In other words, uh, it's, yeah. Uh, there is no providence, no providence of nature or of God in any sense. That is, uh, and he quotes as a counterpoison against his sentimental view on uh, a little bit later, the paragraph, this whole prologue is a model of so naive... philosophic mystification. The true socialist proceeds from the thought that the dichotomy of life and happiness must be... <coughs> 
To prove his statement, he summons the aid of nature and assumes that in it this dichotomy does not exist. From this he deduces that since man too is a natural body and possesses all the general properties of such a body, no dichotomy could exist for him either. Hobbes, also by invoking nature, produced a, a proof of his war of all against all. With much greater right, yeah, he said. Is this a translation? With much greater right could Hobbes demonstrate his war yes. of everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Go on and say something. That is much more conclusive than Harry Grimm's attempt to prove a contrary hypothesis. Yeah. So you see, he refers to the prehistory, and of course one would even have to go back behind Hobbes. Yeah. So that I think that Marx is here easily victorious. It's not doubtful to me, but the question is, uh, whether it is not one of those victories which one ought to be ashamed of, you know? Yeah, because it's so, so simple. And we, uh, there are, is an other point, uh, a problem touched upon, uh, which uh, you have not mentioned in your paper, Rabbi Weiss, and that refers to the problem of equality, a problem which we have to discuss coherently after. Now turn to page 186. It's the second paragraph from the bottom. Mr. Well, Mr. Yeah, the difference between Mr. Kuhlmann and... Yes. Yeah. Herr Kuhlmann differs here from the socialists and the communists only by reason of a misunderstanding, the cause of which must be sought in his pursuit of practical aims and doubtless in his limitations. He confuses the diversity of faculties and capacities with the inequality of possessions and enjoyment conditioned by possession. And it means, therefore, against communism. Yeah, do you understand that point? What he has to say? Perhaps we read the other relevant passage and then we take it together. On page 188, the fourth paragraph. The whole of this topological... No, he's, he says this. Both. Oh. Possession and enjoyment. Yes. Yeah. Both. That is, possession and enjoyment conform to his labor. That is, demands. This is the measure of his means. In this way, Kuhlmann distorts the claim that a communist society has in the whole always as many natural faculties and ever uses his needs. Yeah. And, For labor, no, fi and finally, on page 189, line 10 from bottom. So far, everything had gone well. No, but one of the most vital principles of communism, a principle which distinguishes it from all reactionary socialism, is its empiric view, based on a knowledge of men, that differences of rank, of intellectual capacity, do not imply any difference whatsoever in the nature of the stomach and of physical needs. Therefore, the false tenet, based upon existing circumstances, to each according to his capacity, must be changed, insofar as it relates to enjoyment in its narrower sense, into the tenet, to each according to his needs. In other words, a different form of activity of labor confers no privileges in respect of possession and enjoyment. Yeah, no, that is a crucial point. What does Marx then teach regarding justice? Because it is, of course, a question of justice which is involved. It's the relation of equality and inequality. What does Marx then say, if we limit ourselves to these passages? Are men equal or unequal? They are uh, equal in their rights, but unequal in their capacities. They are unequal in their capacities. Now, yeah, he doesn't speak of rights. He speaks of possessions or enjoyments. Now, what is the crucial point? What is the thesis? I mean, that men are, have unequal faculties was generally admitted. What is the problem? Where, where is the disagreement? What follows from the inequality of capacities according to the accepted view which Marx attacks? In order to society. Yeah, in terms of possession, both the relation of capacities and, yeah? And, and inequality of happiness. Or so, in other words, he who has higher capacities should have higher possession or enjoyment. Yes, because he gets it. Yeah, now let us illustrate it a bit to understand it because it's a crucial issue. 
that you, you all remember, I hope better than I do, Federalist number 10. What, what is taught there? Unequal ability to acquire property. Yeah. Um, should be justly awarded by allowing the groups of that. They should be protected. But that means, of course, that the unequal capacity to acquire will lead to inequality of possession and hence to inequality of enjoyment. Yeah? And that is, that is a natural and just relation. Yeah? He who earns more, has the capacity to earn more, uh, should, uh, should enjoy more. And that is, of course, based on the premise that uh, people good at earning are the industrious and rational part of society. If we accept this premise, that the lazy and irrational are those in need, one could say, from a tough point of view, but one could say that would be still just to say, well, if they are too lazy and too irrational, they have only themselves to blame. And the others get their just reward by living in, in fine houses, having beautiful gardens, and many servants, and so on and so on. That is just as it should be. Now, what does Marx say to this position? There are variations of that sort, but we don't have to go. But generally speaking, one can say mankind have, uh, at least the political thinkers have uh, thought there should be some proportion between faculties, not necessarily the acquisitive faculties in particular, but faculties and possessions or enjoyment. What does Marx say? The, the, the very person has uh, the same basic physical needs, and therefore... Yeah, that is obvious, but what's the relevance of that? Oh, well, there's not quite relevant. Huh? Well... No. But uh, the problem concerns the relation between these two things, uh, faculties or capacities and enjoyment. Yeah? And we have here a hierarchy of capacities. The just solution would be the strict correspondence of enjoyment to capacity. So the most capable man would enjoy most, and the least capable man would enjoy least. What's wrong with that, according to Marx? Because capacities for production. And that, is here not, any that is here not specified. That is here not specified. As a matter of fact, he speaks also of the intellectual capacity, so it has nothing to do with that. For example, uh, um, yes. Um, first, what, first, we must try to understand what Marx means. Yeah. 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 Um, the stupid man who has little capacity still exerts himself to the utmost. Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a sense that he exerts himself just as much as a brilliant man, and therefore has a right to equal enjoyment of things as the brilliant man. One could say that, but this is a point which Marx makes here. Um, um, yes? Do they enjoy it? This is, but first let us see what Marx means here. Yes? They must all have be given equal enjoyment according to their needs rather than... That he implies, although the famous formula does not occur here. But Marx's conclusion, I think, a Marx's point which he makes is this. The difference, the inequality of capacities does not justify inequality of enjoyment. This subtle question of subtle choices or doesn't enter. He speaks of the stomach. There is no sensible connection between the fact that this is a first-rate nuclear physicist and that he should eat five pounds steak a day and the other who is not capable to do more than to carry burdens should only have a quarter of a steak today and perhaps even a, a quarter of a steak in the week. That's the point which Marx makes here in the first place. Yeah? From everyone to, he doesn't say it, but he alludes to that. Uh, there is no direct co connection between capacities and needs. Uh, you, we have to recognize the inequality of capacities. 
as this does not mean yeah this does not mean equality of needs for example the nuclear the, the top nuclear physics may be a man who needs only a, a, a room with a table yeah so and, and a bed and a curtain bed there are such people who, who detest everything superfluous he's very happy with that and he's a bachelor in addition and then you have another man who is very dumb but has a family of 10 yeah and they have all kinds of they want they must have flowers on the table and they must have all kinds of other ornaments of life needs needs need they need it if they want to be happy so it is perfectly possible that this one man, you know, they, they are unequal, uh, unequal capacities. They are in, unequal needs, but there is no proportion to them. And uh, the assignment, the just assignment, would be with a view to the needs, not with a view to the capacities. What society demands, it demands more, higher things from the most gifted members, because they can give, give more. But it assigns not with a view to capacities, but with a view to needs. That is, I think, that's the Marxist thesis. Yeah, one would have to go into all kinds of details to, to see uh, what and uh, to what extent it is true. And the crucial question, for practical purposes, you all know, is that of incentives. Yeah. You know that it is possible that there are nuclear physicists who would not work so hard if they would not be properly compensated, but properly compensated, you know? And the question, therefore, is whether the need of incentives will disappear in a communist society. That is what Marx, of course, implies, and that is the moral regeneration of man. Nothing short of that. Yes. No, no, there could be badges, badges, yeah, you know, that could do. But still, from the point of view of moral regeneration, badges are as bad as free trips to the Bahamas. Yeah? Do you know what I mean? Because it is extraneous to the genuine needs as well as to the capacities. I will not go into the question which is, I believe, a major subject of present economics, namely that how to determine needs, you know? Yeah, for example, whether the needs, <laughs> you know, sometimes people have very funny uh, desires which are, they also call their needs, and whether we would not have to have some body of wise men who determine what a need is, yeah? Oh, I mean, one can, for example, say there's a need for some time in Arizona for someone suffering from TB it can be more clearly established than the need of honeymooners, for example, to go to Arizona or maybe even to places further west. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't want to make a joke. Mr. Cropsey, uh, you, have, you have not had your say on today's problem. Yeah. 
Yes, sure, but it is not Marx tries, of course. That is true. One could state it as follows. Marx says morality is bunk. Morality is, is nonsense. As soon as man has become free, there is no place for morality, for any ought. Men will do as a matter of course, say human thing to them. And that's the point. That is, however, what one could also call the fantastic thing in Marx. And we must uh, get, try to get a more precise formulation for this very general among fantastic. In other words, whether men really given the conditions, will have no other desire than to develop all their faculties. That is, that would be a bit closer to what Marx himself said. We come to that. Yes, Mr. Fogman? Is, is uh, Professor Krafts' question is very interesting. Is, is Marx uh, rebelling against the notion, the notion of duty Absolutely. He also, as he is rebelling against pleasure, that you must, uh, well, I can only anticipate that both the hedonistic and the moralistic morality are wrong and hypocritical. Both Kant huh, and utilitarianism. Yeah, and Epicurus and any, uh, anyone. Uh, the only one who would perhaps at first glance survive, but only at first glance, would be Aristotle. But only at first parts. Uh, I will uh, discuss this coherently, but I have to, I believe then, I will now begin, if Mr. Ropsy and the class don't mind, uh, with a kind of coherent discussion, because we won't have a paper next time. And uh, I think we should devote this uh, time at our disposal, the last time, uh, to somewhat to a coherent And so one, one has to understand both steps of Marx. A is a philosophically based turn to economics and the economic teaching. If the economic teaching should prove to be wrong, that would surely be fatal to Marx, that's clear. But on the other hand, one must also, you know, since a merely negative criticism is not very helpful, it is necessary to understand the foundations. And the foundations are not economic, but they are philosophic. So reasons inducing Marx to find the base in economics. Now, let me therefore devote, uh, devote the rest of today's meeting as well as next meeting to a coherent discussion of Marx's philosophic premises. This cannot be done without some repetitions of points made before, but uh, you understand that. Now, what's the starting point? Hegel. Philosophy has been completed, and by this very fact, history has been completed. Marx agrees with Hegel half. Philosophy has been completed. Hegel is a culmination of philosophy as philosophy. But history has not been completed. The practical problems have not been solved. Hegel's constitutional monarchy, so-called, is not a solution to men's political problems. Nor have the theoretical problems all been solved, as Hegel claims. Therefore, a new theoretical effort is necessary. But this effort can no longer be philosophical. The thought required for the solution of the problems, both theoretical and practical, is trans-philosophic. I say trans-philosophic because it presupposes the great development of philosophy. It presupposes that and transcends that. It is not, as in present-day positivism, a simple oblivion of philosophy. And this trans-philosophic study has a character of an empirical study, especially of social reality. So in other words, the same what our social science claims to do. But what is the difference? The empirical study of social reality means for Marx the empirical study of the contradictions inherent in social reality and therewith a criticism of social reality. We do not discover a harmony. 
From this we can infer that according to Marx, and I believe according to the truth, what is now called social science is an attempt to discover the harmony in social reality by hook and by crook. And the best way, of course, is to abolish value judgment. Don't get any contradictions. So the uh, study, the study of uh, the empirical study of social uh, reality necessarily turns into criticism of social re reality, and thus it produces indignation, revolution. There is a unity of theory and practice which does not mean a coincidence of theory and practice. They must be distinguished. And it is rather this way that in Marxian social science, social reality criticizes itself. No, no, in, in, in more precisely, social reality criticizes itself. It has this conflict and antagonism within itself. But in social reality becomes fully conscious of this in inherent criticism in and through the scientific analysis. And therefore, without Marxism, no revolution. Only through the medium of this consciousness can the revolution take its proper place. That is to say, and that is partly an answer to points which may have made by Rabbi Weiss, the task, what we have to do, is prescribed by the present conditions. To understand the present conditions means to reveal what we have to do as intelligent and honest men. And not everyone is intelligent and honest, that's not a matter. I read to you a few passages. So that in other words, there is no ought. There is no, uh, here, here is the ought, and here is social reality. We do not have to look there in order to find out what we ought to do. We only have to look, uh, go look here. Here we find our task defined in concrete terms, because even if there were an odd, it would be too universal to be applicable to what we here now have to do. But Marx denies that there is no odd. There is no odd. Here in this reality, there are, there is a tendency, antagonistic tendency, and the more concrete we are, the more we enter into it and try to understand it, we see our task is crime. So, analysis is criticism, and criticism is an imperative. They are inseparable. I read to you a passage from Marx, uh, which uh, is important, and uh, not only for this question, but it illustrates it very well. And that is from his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, which was not available to us in the translation. Quote, the critique of religion a purely cognitive critique of religion, ends with the teaching that man is the highest being for man, and hence with a categoric imperative, mind you, to revolutionize all relationships in which man is a degraded being, unquote. Now, to repeat, this categoric imperative is not here. It reveals itself here. But that, of course, has great convenience, is what Marx says, because it answers one question, which Kant could not properly answer. Why was the categorical imperative discovered by Kant around 1785 and not uh, 500 years before, 2000 years before? Marx can answer it. This categorical imperative to regard man as a highest being could not have been discovered before. For instance, man is a highest being, not simply, but the highest being for man. And that, I think, shows both the difference between Marx and positivism and uh, quite a few other things. Now I make a second point. The first point I made was this, 
to understand the trans-philosophic character of Marx's thought. Marx's thought claims to be trans-philosophic, and that means to involve a break with philosophy as such. But it presupposes philosophy, as is indicated by the word trans-philosophy. Marx's position is more precisely a synthesis of two philosophic positions. The synthesis of the intra-philosophic alternative of materialism and spiritualism or idealism. Briefly this, looking at the history of philosophy back, we can say there was a tug of war at all times between something which we may call materialism and something which we may call spiritualism or idealism. This conflict was never solved. Marx says it could not be solved because the solution would have been a philosophic solution. That's impossible. The solution can be found only by leaping out of philosophy. Now, what is that? What is the issue? Marx states it naturally in terms of the most recent forms <coughs> which this alternative has taken, the most recent forms being Feuerbach, materialism, Hegel, idealism. Now, what does Feuerbach say? In a nutshell, there is always something given. Man cannot, the human mind cannot construct the whole. The thinking being is man, not a mere mind lodged in the human body. The idealist position of Hegel, what is that crucial point? The fundamental phenomenon is production. To understand means to produce, to construct, not to contemplate. And this production necessarily leads, according to Hegel, to the historical process. Every product calling for becoming <coughs> objectified calling forth a new productive action, and so on, the historical process. Hegel is understood as a philosophic counterpart to Adam Smith, who had taught in the, in the clearest form that wealth is a product of labor and not a gift of nature, product of human activity. Hegel says the same thing philosophically. I remind you of one or two passages in Marx's National Economy and Philosophy. Philosophy. Why now we must raise this question? The synthesis of the basic philosophic alternative, materialism, idealism, is transphilosophic. Why is that so? Why can philosophy not solve it? Now, what is the synthesis of materialism and uh, idealism? Answer, communism. And communism is not a theory, but a, an order of life, a way of life. Why is it so? Now, philosophy means, as Hegel understood, in its highest form, full self-consciousness of the consciousness. But the consciousness is only a part of man. Philosophy presupposes that, the division of labor. Philosophy is the activity of a part of man or of some men. It is not the activity of man as man. Is a transcending philosophy it means transcending the division of labor, and that's communism. In other words, divided labor is always social labor. 
There is a tacit working of society in my private working. Divided labor is always social labor. Applied to philosophy, philosophy, the philosophic labor, belongs to society without knowing it. Philosophy claiming to give man the highest self-consciousness does not give it to him because philosophy does not reflect on its own derivative character. The restoration of man's holiness includes the aufhebel, the removal, transcending of philosophy. Yes, that occurs in this writing on national economics and philosophy, which we considered here. One sees, Marx says, how subjectivism and objectivism, spiritualism and materialism, only find in the social condition its opposite, and therewith lose their existence as such opposites. One sees how the solution of the theoretical opposites is possible only in a practical way. It is a, a real task of life or a task of real life, which philosophy could not solve precisely because it regarded it as a merely theoretical task. Now, I turn to a third. This transcending philosophy presents itself as a return from philosophy to common sense, we can say. Do you remember the tough expressions which Marx used all the time? Common sense. But we must correct this immediately. It is a, a turn towards present-day common sense. So common sense of any earlier age wouldn't be of any help. Social science, the transphilosophic social science, leads, therefore, because it is a turn to present-day common sense, necessarily to revolution. One formula which Marx uses in order to describe the difference between his view and philosophy is this, that philosophy has tried to interpret the world, to contemplate the world understand the world as it is, but what matters is to change the world. Now we would raise the question, all right, in what direction do we want to change it? For Marx, this, the question is no question once you enter into the analysis of present day society. There is no alternative. There is no alternative. You know? I mean, either you side, after you have understood the situation, either you side with a manifestly rotten and dishonest. And some people would say, yes, I side it. it uh, après moi, le déluge. The deluge comes after me, and I don't care. But, but you cannot do this with self-respect. So there is no alternative. Is that is is this so? I read to you the end, uh, at least in this edition, of an early writing of Marx and his critique of Proudhon, the misery of philosophy. Proudhon's book was called the philosophy of misery. And Marx turned it around and called it the misery of philosophy, in any of Proudhon's philosophy, and in a way of philosophy as well. This ends as follows. A quotation from, from Georges Sand, a famous author, French authoress of the 19th century. Struggle or death? Bloody war or nothing? Thus is the question posed in an Unerbittlich. Yeah. Inescapable? Yeah, that is not strong enough, but it will do now. Inescapable, all right. <coughs> Struggle or death? Bloody war or nothing? 
That is one that's of course the revolution. All or nothing. Concretely, communism or the destruction of civilization. Communism or the destruction of the human race, perhaps. Is communism preferable to destruction of civilization? A question which we must raise. The very necessity of raising the question proves the need for philosophy because that cannot be settled by social analysis as Marx understands it. To say nothing of the fact that Marx shows in effect that this is so by his setting forth a moral philosophy. And we got a specimen of it in this statement from everyone to his capacity to everyone according to his needs. For the time being, I repeat again the statement I read before. The critique of religion ends with the teaching that man is the highest being for man, and hence with a categoric imperative to revolutionize all relationships in which man is a degraded being. A categoric imperative implies the possibility of not living up to it. And that man is the highest being for man uh, is such a normative teaching. In furthermore, in proportion as the social situation lacks the simplicity which Marx ascribes to it, here the perfectly just cause of the proletariat, there the perfectly unjust cause of the bourgeoisie, the necessity of philosophy becomes still more evident. In situations of extreme simplicity, we don't have to appeal to deeper reflection. But if the situation is not extremely simple, the necessity arises. Now, let us consider the other side of the matter. That's the fourth point I wanted to make. We turn from philosophy to the empirical study of society. Yeah, but we turn to that on the basis of a presupposition which precedes the study of empir the empirical study of society. Namely, that the basis of all social phenomena are the relations of production. Why are the relations of production the most fundamental? Marx suggests, first you have to eat before you can think. But that is, of course, a very inadequate argument because the condition of something is never the sufficient cause of it. We have seen last time that in a passage of the first part of the German ideology, Marx admits in passing, but unfortunately only in passing, the simultaneity of thin production and misproduction. The earliest man, uh, savage, however he might be, uh, cannot but think about the whole while seeking food, shelter, and so on. Perhaps Marx meant it this way. Thin production, or tool production, is a production of something real. The stone is now fit for being used for cutting the throat of a deer. It, it cuts, so it works, it is real. In order to think production is, affects a change in the world and a change of the world. But misproduction produces merely something imaginary and therefore ineffective. Zeus does not become an effective force by being thought to exist. But of course, that would seem to be a great fallacy, because uh, are the myths, while they may not affect real things by miracles, but they may very well be effective on man. To say nothing of the Marxist admission and emphasis even that the so-called supra-suprastructure affects the economic infrastructure. Perhaps the following passage is of some help, which occurs in the German ideology. Earlier such philosophic delusions could have currency in Germany. 
But today, they have become completely ridiculous, since international trade has proven sufficiently that a bourgeois acquisition is wholly independent of politics, while politics is wholly dependent on bourgeois acquisition. In other words, we look at today, today, and there we see the root of everything is other relations of the economic relations of production. But what Marx in effect it was only to show, at least to his satisfaction, that the political issues of the time can only be understood as reflections of the class struggle. He did not really show it regarding the intellectual life of his time. But what would follow from that? That would not justify a universal theory of history that this was so at all times. That to the very fact that he says today would seem to show that there was a change. Already in the 18th century, politics had become so much dependent on trade that, for example, when the French state wanted to make a loan, a private man had to vouch for the state to the Dutch. Yeah. In other words, we have in modern times a very great power of the economic considerations and of the economic needs, of the economic relations. Does this prove that this was always so? Is the fact that the economic historians have to dig up the, hist the history of economics uh, from most out of the way places, not from the great productions of the past. That truly proves that these people didn't believe that economics was so important. The most famous example, the greatest and most realistic historian of pre-modern times, Thucydides, is absolutely silent about any economic background of the Peloponnesian War. The present-day economic historians try to find that because they cannot imagine that people are so foolish to fight if they don't fight for markets and things like that. Well, we don't know, we don't know. But the, the, the certainty that it must have been so is of course a pure dogmatic certainty. I mean, when they fought as the Greeks, and they, we find these examples, they were very much concerned with the physical possession of the field of battle, so that the enemy had to come cap in hand, or whatever they had on and their, and their heads, uh, to ask for the corpses, for proper burial. It was a major consideration. You can say that was crazy, superstition, I don't care. But it was a great fact. And uh, the ascription to all earlier men of uh, uh, the, the assertions, not to the earlier men, but the assertion that even then, the contrary with the struggle was always economic and is, uh, is unfounded, of course. In other words, the relative justification of Marx is, of Marxism is this, that in modern times, the economic considerations manifestly play a much greater role than they have played in earlier times. Political economy as a science is a product of the 17th and 18th century. This alone shows the uh, set of this, and Mr. Proxy can tell you much more about that than I can. Now, Marx would perhaps also argue as follows. Let us look at the most important phenomenon because it has a much greater popular bearing than philosophy can have had, religion. What is religion? Well, here Marx depends on forever. Now, religion is a supplement, let us say, an illusory satisfaction for what cannot be satisfied in reality. Therefore, it, I'm, I'm trying to give the sort of value in the Marxian form, and not in the Feuerbachian form. Therefore, religion depends ultimately on the real dissatisfaction and its specific character. If people are dissatisfied in one way, they will produce religion A. If they are dissatisfied in another way, they will produce religion B. 
religion means always this or that religion can only be explained in terms of society, i.e. of this or that society. But this, of course, presupposes everything. Grant, and even if we grant Marx's basic premise, which is a, it's a very clear question itself, that religion is essentially a delusion, are all ills for which men try to find a solution by religion or myth, are all ills social ills, for example, the death of the individual is not as such a social ill. And how much did it preoccupy the human imagination? I suggest this conclusion. The basis of Marx's social science is a dogmatic decision in favor of the basic character of the relations of production. Even if it, uh, that Marx were, uh, doctrine were true, would have to be proven by empirical analysis of religion, of philosophy and so on, a proof which has never been given, and whenever it was attempted, it was done in a very superficial way, except in certain stretches of modern thought. Uh, that it, uh, for example, the thing which is called sociology of knowledge, which is a decay form of Marxism, no, honestly, that one can show historically, because Mannheim, who made this sociology of knowledge so famous, uh, his work is based on Lukács' uh, previous work on history and class culture. Yeah, but what, what can this, uh, do these people prove? That a program, a, a, par, a, a part of the plank of the Republican or Democratic Party program for the election is regarding agriculture influenced by the uh, various organizations of farmers, well, which child did not expect it from the outset. The question would be, is an entirely different proposition, would be really to show, which they, really to show, for example, a connection between uh, present-day theoretical physics and uh, our society as it exists now, or, or a, a genuine work of art and that. It's a much tougher for this decision. It has never been shown in concrete or in any way. The next point I would like to make is this. I do not know whether I still have time because of a certain unreliability of my voice. Yeah, no, I think I have to stop. Well, uh, let, uh, next time I will uh, develop, uh, will raise this question to which Rabbi Weiss has referred in the first place, and it's the question of the essence of man. And this is very much connected with the question of Marx's moral philosophy in the fullest sense of the term. And perhaps I can then, will find time to say a few words which by now may be a bit clearer than they could have been at the beginning. To what extent was this right in saying, not metaphorically, or is it kind of... Uh, a joke, but seriously, said for Marx, economics is metaphysics, or metaphysics is economics. And this is not, not a, a cliche, but literally true. And that all the problems are concentrated in that. But there is, the, the, that is, however, only one side of the problem. The other side of the problem is the very to understand, I mean, you have economic materialism. Let us assume that this is proven true. That in itself does not necessarily lead to the notion that the economic changes will bring about a state of man which is the redemption of man, the moral regeneration of man. What is the connect? How, by what uh, means, not to say by what trick, does Marx succeed in linking up the economic de de teaching with this expectation from the future? How these two ultimate problems, i.e., economics is a metaphysics. 
the connection between economic materialism and the expectation of the regeneration brought about by the final class struggle is related. That would be, I think, the ultimate task of an understanding of Marx. Whether I shall be able to give a clear answer to that question, I doubt, but I will try. I will try.